Ouais, mais attends, inattendu. 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 Non. Mais euh, si je ne sais pas faire, euh, on va demander. Ça pas l'air connecté. Connect. Ça serait suffisant de faire ça, mais on n'a pas le. Ouais, je vais aller demander là-haut. Avant de tout. Ah, ok, je crois que j'ai compris. Il y a dedans caché un petit don de USB. Ah, bah oui, voilà. Et figurez-vous, je devrais aller mieux. Si je le mets dans l'ordinateur. Je devrais aller mieux. D'un lien de cause à effet assez évident. Alors, ouais. là, c'est ouais. une souris ouais, ouais. télécommandée. Oui, oui, oui. Clique gauche, clique droit. On va voir une souris sur l'écran. Ah, sur l'écran ouais. Là, on voit le. La, la, vous télécommandez. Oui, voilà. Ouais, bon, ok, on passe les, là, on passe les diapos. Passer les diapos avec ça, ça va, c'est déjà pas mal, oui. Voilà. Euh, euh, et ensuite, vous voulez faire quoi Vous voulez bah, faire un pointeur laser pointe, Si ça faisait pointeur, je ne sais pas. Je pense que la pile est morte. Je vais aller voir ça. Bon, pour, pour, pour le début, il y a ce bouton-là. Oui, d'accord. Ce bouton-là. Oui, d'accord. Ah oui. Et ça, c'est encore autre chose. Oui, 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 s'il vous plaît. Hein, merci. Oui, non, non, mais j'ai appelé le... Je vais chercher le gars là hein? mais qui ne savait pas trop me répondre. Euh, C'est pas évident, le, le, la télécommande. Bon. Euh, je sais faire avancer, mais je ne sais pas reculer. Et puis, il n'y a pas de pointeur laser. Donc, il m'a dit, je vais voir le régisseur. C'est des petites 3A. Ouais. Tu vas pour faire le film non, non, mais là, il est allé chercher surtout le régisseur pour... Là, 
je peux avancer Même pas. Si. Merci beaucoup. Alors. Dear friends, let me first tell you how pleased I am to welcome you this morning at the 30th scientific meeting of the ARCEP Foundation. It's a pleasure to see our foundation giving more and more importance to the development of international partnership. I am delighted, after these two difficult years, that MD and researchers from Europe, Canada, the US, and Israel are present in this room or by video conference to discuss subjects whose texts are so important for the MS patients. Aware of the hopes that you bring to them, I am the spoken person for MS patients and their families to express their gratitude and admiration for the work carried out in your research laboratories in France and abroad. Thanks to your expertise recognized throughout the world, our medical scientific committee, under the chairmanship of Jean Pelletier and Pierre-Olivier Courreau, can favor the most promising research areas and hope one day to overcome the disease. For its part, The ASEP Foundation is developing its action in order to have a better supporting you. On average, we grant more than 2 million euros per year to the research, enabling the establishment of major partnership and funding scholarship for deserving young researchers. Because you are the actors of the ASEP's main mission, I wanted to inform you of the progress of the merging projects between the different French entities which are working to make MS better known and to mobilize even more the public generosity on this fine cause of ours. As you know, for many years in France, we have between thinking with the NICEP members and the League against multiple sclerosis on the interest of joining the goodwill of all those who are fighting against MS, whether it be by funding research on multiple sclerosis, by supporting the patients, or by raising public awareness of this cause. When I became chairwoman of the ASEP Foundation, I continued these exchanges throughout 2021 and the first quarter of 2022 with the support of the board of directors and the Medical Scientific Committee chaired by Jean Pelletier. On last April 26, we signed a letter of intent between ARCEP, the League, and UNICEF. 
I would like to present to you the outlines of MSS MS project. The ASEP Foundation will remain the central entity of the system and will naturally take the name of Fondation France Sclérose en Plaque. Our purpose and our mission remain the same. Our five major social missions will be be at the side and support the people with multiple sclerosis to their loved ones and to courage givers, to finance, encourage, and facilitate research, to inform and train on the disease and treatment and on helps, to gather and raise public awareness to call the media, to mobilize French authorities. The France Clérose en Plaque, as a recognized public utility foundation, will remain in charge of raising the funds necessary for the missions. I would like to assure you that they will not change our missions. This should allow us to join our force and synergy in order to raise more funds for medical and scientific research and support for patients. One again, I want to thank all of you for your loyalty to the ASEP Foundation. I look forward to welcome you in our future within France Clérose en Plaque because the hope of MS patients lies in you. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Brigitte. So we are in time, and uh, the first session will be dedicated to ultra high field MRI. And the first speaker is Bruno Stankov from Paris. Bruno. Thank you very much, Jean. It's a very Great pleasure to be here again and to uh, discuss with you to make an overview about what can bring uh, ultra high field uh, MRI in the field of MS. I have to acknowledge first that I am not the most famous expert on this field, and uh, this is a collegial presentation that has been performed by uh, Céline Loi, for Benedetta Bodini, and myself. So this is a team work. So I, I don't know. Sorry, just to check it. No, it's not going to Ah, okay, sorry, à gauche. Sorry. Uh, mm -hmm. Seems to be blocked. Okay, I will try again this. Sorry for this. You can see here my uh, disclosures. So what we know and what we are doing currently uh, for monitoring and diagnosis MS is to uh, apply uh, 1.5 or 3 Tesla imaging. And what we are seeing using uh, this uh, MRI technique is this white matter hypernance density that you can see here, which are the MS plaques. 
Um, by counting the number of those plaques or measuring their volume, we know that we cannot fully predict how the disease will evolve and why uh, the disability uh, increase. And this may be explained by several reasons. Uh, one of them may be that we cannot uh, see whether uh, in one lesion is active or uh, not active in terms of inflammatory component using uh, classical MRI. Also, we cannot discriminate between the level of demyination and remyination within the lesion. Another point is that we cannot have full, ac full access to what happened in the normal appearing tissue in terms of metabolic or uh, structural injury. And finally, we know from pathologies that there are many cortical lesion and demyination, but we cannot access to this using classical MRI, and this is the same for uh, the inflammation within meninges. This is why uh, high field uh, MRI can help us to um, identify and quantify those mechanisms, especially to uh, decipher the heterogeneity of lesion, the extent of cortical demyination, whether uh, there is some inflammation in the meninges, and what are the uh, mechanisms in terms of structural and metabolic uh, meta mechanism underlying tissue damage in the disease. So one of the uh, big success of high field MRI, when we say high field in human, it's seven Tesla MRI, which has uh, a better signal to noise ratio and a higher resolution than a classical MRI, it was a demonstration that most of the lesion in uh, the MS brain was characterized by a central venule. We know that lesion uh, uh, appear around post capillary capillary venules in uh, the disease, and using high field MRI, it's more easy to, 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 to see and to, to qualify these venules, and most of the MS lesions are centered by a venule. This is what we call now the central vein sign. Uh, contrasting with some other diseases, such as small vessel diseases, migraine, and other uh, inflammatory diseases, which uh, are also characterized by hypersignal in the white matter. So this helped to diagnose MS uh, with more uh, success and more specificity. Uh, a second uh, key uh, result obtained by this ultra-high field MRI is to help to uh, detect and to stage lesion. And one interesting work that has been performed by the team of the NIH uh, with uh, uh, absentine colleagues was to show this uh, small enhancement just around the venules that may precede the lesion appearance on a T2 scan. So this means that it might be one of the earliest events uh, of lesion onset. And you can see here, it's very small, I have not the pointer, but let me try to. Okay, so we can see before uh, the hyper signal appearing in the white matter that there is a small contrast, uh, contrast enhancement just around the venule, and this may reflect uh, the uh, entrapment of the contrast agent in the perivascular space during the first event of uh, inflammation in the disease. So this is an interesting result that helps to understand how a lesion uh, will onset. A second uh, interesting result that could be uh, obtained by a seven Tesla uh, MRI and that has been therefore reproduced with three Tesla MRI but with less sensitivity is a natural history of the lesion and uh, the team uh, of Danny Reich has been able to, to discriminate between two stages and the first stage of lesion appearance, so just after this first contrast announcement around the venules, was this uh, what we can call uh, gadolinium leakage that start from the venules and that come across the lesion uh, in a centrifuge manner. This is the earliest stage of the lesion, and this is followed a few days or a few uh, weeks after by another kind of contrast enhancement that begin at the periphery of the lesion and therefore evolve in a centripetal manner. So there is two stages of the lesion that may reflect two um, uh, maybe a stage of the lesion in terms of inflammation, and this raises the point of the natural history of the, of the lesion. 
And when we look at this natural history, looking at uh, later stages, we know from pathologies that those white matter lesions are characterized by, uh, in some cases, a chronic activation uh, within the lesion. And uh, you, we know this by pathology, but using classical MRI, it's very hard to qualify a lesion and to say, okay, there is a pre uh, lesional inflammation, as you can see on this pathological imaging here, uh, with a microglial activation, uh, just using uh, clinical MRI. And using high field MRI, it has been uh, possible to detect some of these chronic active lesions that appear with a rim uh, that uh, is. Uh, with different signals, you can see on the left uh, above that the lesion has a rim uh, that appears as a hypo intensity uh, on those lesions, and this uh, translates the chronic activation of microglial cells, uh, contrasting with other lesions that do not have these rims. And those chronic active lesions are known to have a prognosis value as they are associated with a more progressive phase of the disease uh, and uh, a more disability accrual. And this is a very important point now in terms of staging of lesion. I will go quite quickly on this, but by combining sequences using ultra high field MRI that may reflect distant pathological mechanism, it might be possible to make the distinction between the inflammatory component and the demyelinating or reminating component. And this can be achieved by combining sequences uh, uh, assessing the susceptibility. And if, if, for instance, you, are, you have a signal called R2 star that evolved in a different way. Uh, than the one uh, uh, of susceptibility and then qualify differently uh, myelin and inflammation, but I think we will discuss this later on during this session. A very interesting uh, uh, result obtained by high field MRI was also to assess the cortical demyelination. And this has been a work that has been mainly performed by Céline Loipre uh, in Harvard. Uh, and we know that in the cortex of patients with MS, there are different subtypes uh, of lesions that you can see here. The type 1 is leucocortical lesion. The type 2 is intracortical lesion. The type 3 is the subpile, very extended lesion. And the type 4 is a lesion that cross all the area of the cortex. And using classical MRI uh, with 3T, we are only to, able to detect less than, uh, let's say, 10% of those lesions. However, using 70 images, either by uh, using flare sequences or T1 sequences or T2 star sequences, you can see we can uh, visualize those lesions and quantify them. And you have several examples on the left using uh, flare images and on the right using uh, T1 uh, anatomical uh, acquisition. So it has been shown by assessing those cortical lesions that they, they were linked to the prognosis of patient and that leucocortical lesions so at the junction of the cortex and the white matter may uh, be uh, linked to more uh, cognitive disorder with their subpile, which are uh, very characteristic uh, of uh, MS pathology, may uh, be associated with neurodegeneration uh, measured by cortical atrophy uh, or, or by, dis uh, by disability accrual. Céline Loap also showed that beyond uh, the demyelinating lesion in the cortex, there was, by using uh, T2 star imaging, there was a kind of gradient uh, of tissue damage around the lesion. And she showed that uh, near from the lesion, there was more damage. And when you were going far from the lesion, there was still some damage, as you can see uh, on the uh, bottom here. And that the lesion in the cortex of patients with MS were mostly localized at the outer surface uh, of the cortex, as we can see. You can see here, she has investigated the outer surface uh, you can see above and deeper uh, uh, just below. And early in the disease, the first lesions that appear in the cortex are mostly detected in the outer uh, uh, layer uh, of the cortex. So <clears throat> this is another view about what can bring in terms of lesion detection uh, ultra high field MRI. <clears throat> For cortical lesion, clearly, compared to uh, three Tesla imaging, it improves the sensitivity to detect those cortical lesions, and this uh, allows to improve our prognostication of the disease. In white matter in the brain, this has not helped a lot to detect lesions, but this helped to stage lesions and to identify the central vein sign and the chronic active lesion with a perilesional rim. 
and I have not discussed this, but in cerebellar uh, area or spinal cord lesion, it improves a lot the sensitivity also to detect the lesion. So it brings a lot uh, to uh, the evaluation of lesion in uh, uh, the brain of patients with MS. Coming to the content of uh, lesion in terms of myelin, applying ultra-high field MRI would also help to uh, stage lesion in terms of extent of demyelination and probably also extent of remyelination. This is a quite old observation that has been done uh, using a nine Tesla Im imaging and combining on the left uh, what we can see uh, with nine Tesla imaging and on the right <coughs> what is seen on pathology. And in the lesion on the pathology, you can see the lesion at the right. You can see in the center, there is a full demyelination, whereas at the edge of the lesion, there is an area which we can call a shadow plaque, so probably remyelination. And looking at the contrast uh, with this high field MRI, you can see that the lesion provides the same heterogeneity. So this does not quantify directly the myelin content of the lesion, but it can help to decipher and to visualize the areas that can be reminded within this lesion. And recently, the group of Danny Reich has confirmed this result by using seven Tesla imaging uh, and MP2 rage sequence. And you can see the result on the right there obtained. This is the same approach you see below the pathology with some lesions that are fully demyelinated on the Luxol fast uh, blue staining uh, uh, and some lesions that are uh, shadow plaque areas that are pointed by arrows. And looking at what you obtain with seven Tesla MRI, you have the same contrast that may help to decipher within each lesion which area can be repaired and which area is fully demyelinated. So this cannot dynamically quantify myelin, but this may help to <coughs> assess the extent of repair in a given lesion. Finally, ultra-high field MRI could also help to visualize meningeal inflammation. It's still a hypothesis today, but what we can see using this high field MRI is uh, that you can have on post-gadolinium flare imaging, so you inject a contrast uh, gadolinium uh, product and you wait at least 20 minutes before making the acquisition. And in the meninges, using this flare technique, you can see some nodules in the image on the top here, or some uh, spread field uh, contrast enhancement that both may translate either uh, the follicles that you can find in the meninges that uh, has been described as associated with neurodegeneration, or some uh, blood, uh, blood to uh, CSF barrier breakdown in the meninges uh, when you uh, look at those spread field uh, contrast enhancement. Thank you very much here. And lastly, uh, okay, uh, a last uh, possibility, very important, and that will be discussed later, so I will not insist too much, is that ultra high field MRI also provide uh, uh, information about uh, the, the energetic dysregulation and metabolic dysregulation within the brain. And this can be provided either by using sodium imaging, uh, which is uh, reflecting either the total sodium concentration in each brain area, or even uh, the compartmental uh, sodium accumulation. And Wafa will discuss this uh, later on, so I will not insist too much, but you can have an idea about how much sodium you have within neurons and outside neurons in the extracellular uh, medium. And <clears throat> this reflects some uh, metabolic abnormality in the brain and energetic dysregulation. And in combination with this, uh, phosphorus spectroscopy can provide a quantification of um, <clears throat> phosphate-derived uh, metabolic supplies, such as uh, ATP, but also uh, other inorganic uh, phosphate derivative. And it has been shown during very preliminary studies in the MS field that uh, there was a dysregulation uh, of uh, energy in the brain of patients with MS and using phosphate, uh, phosphorus spectroscopy. Uh, it is a, a, a great insight into metabolic dysfunction in the brain. Sorry, not being very easily able to, sp to pass the slide, but this was a general overview. You will have more detail uh, during the, the next talk. So just to, to summarize, uh, we 
applying ultra high field MRI uh, will help to stage white matter lesion and to unmask chronic active lesion, to detect cortical demyelination and its extent, to approach, but this is still a matter of an investigation, meningeal inflammation, and to uh, quantify energetic dysregulation. Of course, many other uh, perspectives are open uh, by applying ultra high field MRI. Uh, this can be uh, applied to animals, uh, and Francoise and Hélène will discuss this, I, I think, about <coughs> imaging demyination and remyination in experimental models. Uh, there is also perspective to uh, investigate at a very high resolution functional and structural connectivity in the brain, and also to make some uh, anatomical and structural parcellation of the brain. So I will thank again uh, the team and Céline Loap and Benedetta Bodini who helped to uh, prepare this talk. And sorry for the little problem about the slides. And you can see all the... Thank you very much, uh, Bruno, for this very nice uh, review. Is there any question? Catherine? Microphone, please. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much, Bruno. I have a question on the uh, meningeal uh, follicles that uh, are now visible with the 70. Do you have if there is Do you know if there is any longitudinal study showing the evolution of those lymphomenial follicles in a given patient? Yes, yeah, there are a few data, but it's coming. Um, they are mostly persisting. We don't know how long they are persisting. Uh, they are associated with uh, more uh, disability and more atrophy. So th there is some meaning about this. The point, uh, uh, maybe I, I went a little bit quick about this, is the specificity. It's not fully specific of MS pathology. You can have similar enhancement in the meninges uh, in other diseases and probably also in healthy control. So the pathological correlates still remain a little bit elusive, I think, um, but they are probably interesting. More you have, uh, more active or more disabling is the disease. These are the first uh, data that we uh, have in hand. But, um, and the other point I think is, whatever uh, the pathological correlate, this may translate, especially those uh, diffuse linear uh, enhancement, this may be associated with a kind of rupture of the barrier uh, from the blood to the CSF in the meningitis. And it's interesting to investigate this. J'ai une question en fait euh, euh, par rapport au, aux études en fait en gros qui se font voilà avec l'imagerie. In euh, English, please. Ah, oh, sorry. Um, um, so I have a question actually concerning, in general, all the imaging studies that are done, um, and it's specifically about the, um, the classifications of patients. Are they done always on the basis of the um, symptoms and the output in terms of biochemical analysis, or are the studies actually that uh, segregate patients according to genetic factors which are less biased by environment? So for example, um, are there any um, uh, plans or, or, or ongoing projects where all the patients are um, sequenced entirely, for example, to look yeah. at the SNPs and, and call This is a very large question. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, of course, uh, imaging studies and imaging metrics are used to stratify patients, and this, in, this is the first goal. And the example of ultra-high field uh, imaging is one example that could help to stratify patients. For instance, for instance, those patients who had a lot of chronic active lesion compared to the other one, and this may help to pronostic. How we correlate this with biomarkers first? Uh, we have a few biomarkers in hand, not a lot, such as neurofilaments and so on, that may help to stratify patients together with imaging. And there are also, what you are saying, some initiative about the combination of imaging and genetics. For this, we need large samples, 
and systematic approach. Uh, there are some approach like this uh, in US, in uh, San Francisco, for instance, and several uh, other approaches are ongoing. What is interesting is that in MS, you have genes of susceptibility, so the genes that have been identified to confer a higher probability to develop the disease, which are main, mainly linked to the immune system. And what is emerging now is that you have prob probably a, a set of genes that are associated mostly with the neurodegenerative component of the disease. And there are currently work being performed trying to combine uh, those you know, uh, genes or those SNPs in uh, those genes, which are many genes, and some uh, imaging markers that may reflect uh, chronic neuroinflammatory component or neurodegeneration. So, of course, this is a very promising and important approach which need time and large samples of subjects. Very, very naive question. What are the technical limits of MRI and tolerability of MRI? We have seen 0.5 Tesla, 1.5 Tesla, 3 Tesla, 7 Tesla. What is the limit of that? Uh, up to 7 Tesla. We have no major limitation. You have sometimes some dizziness, some, uh, you have to be more careful about the devices, about all the contraindications uh, of MRI, uh, even tattoos and so on. You have more precaution to, 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 to take when you are using a 7 Tesla compared to a 3 or a 1.5 Tesla. But uh, there is no safety issue currently, but it has been less studied uh, with, or, um, you know, reproduction of examine with time with, uh, of examination with time for a long time. Uh, but if your question was about safety, the possibility to apply in human in a clinical setting, there is no major issue to that. But we have to be careful if you want to use more, because we will have probably uh, an 11 Tesla machine uh, in uh, neurospin. Uh, studies are ongoing, so, you know, safety studies should be performed because it may become a little bit, you know, tricky and dangerous in some extent. Are you okay, Jean, with this? <laughs> <laughs> A second talk will be presented by uh, Françoise durand dubief and Hélène Ratinet from Lyon and uh, will be dedicated to uh, IFI MRI to evaluate uh, demyelination and remyelination processes. Mesdames. So good morning, everybody. Uh, we would like to thank the organizer to uh, invite us to talk about uh, our project, which is about uh, ultra high field uh, MRI for evaluation of demyelination and remyelination processes. And um, this work uh, involves uh, many uh, expertise from neurobiology uh, to uh, MRI sequences analysis. And Hélène Ratinen and I will present you uh, this project, um, which is collaborative uh, with several people. And so uh, we have first, and especially uh, Fabien Chauveau, which is in the audience, Yankel grimbert blayer Thomas Grenier, and Eric Van Rett. So as you all know, multiple sclerosis combines inflammatory and neurodegenerative pathological processes. And uh, inflammation uh, underlies um, uh, demyelinated lesion uh, on MRI and uh, path uh, pathophysiological uh, mechanism of demyelination and remyelination are largely unknown. And uh, maybe uh, the failure of remyelination participates in certain degree of neuroaxonal degeneration. Uh, demyelination and remyelination seems to be dynamic. It changes over time. It is variable between patients, and it seems to be variable within a given patient. 
and those dynamics uh, of those processes in MS um, over the course uh, of the disease needs to be more explored and currently we have no available MRI biomarkers to evaluate the neurodegeneration processes and particularly uh, remyelination. Uh, to explore demyelination and remyelination processes in preclinical study, we have different models. And uh, the more used and study models is the EAE model. Um, and uh, in this model, we, uh, we can, uh, can create, initiate uh, different uh, features of the uh, multiple sclerosis uh, in the histopathological and immunological point of view. And uh, there are as well uh, toxic-induced um, models with caprizone and uh, lysolecithin, which have the properties uh, to uh, remyelinate. And uh, this is uh, a not exhaustive list of uh, all the animal models uh, available. Uh, you have as well um, genetic modified um, uh, transgenic uh, mice as well can be used. We will focus on lysolecithin model, which is the one uh, we have used. And so it is a model with uh, intracerebral injection of lysolecithin that produces focal demyelination in the corpus callosum, in uh, our case. And um, you have a remyelination initiate uh, uh, 15 days after the demyelination and over one month. And uh, it mice, it has been de demonstrated as well that uh, there is a highly variable level of spontaneous remyelination uh, over uh, three months. And uh, the advantage of this model is that we have a control lateral hemisphere uh, that serves as an internal control in a given animal. And so for that, it's a good animal model for the development of MRI biomarker. So, um, good morning here. I want to give you a few words about why we have to work at very high field when uh, uh, doing a, a preclinical small animal MR imaging. Um, I have to remind that uh, MR imaging is a very low sensitive uh, imaging technique and anyone working on, in this field has to look for signal to nose ratio. And so signal to nose ratio is directly related to the nominal volume of interest. And if you realize that, that a mouse is 2,500 times smaller than a human, or a rat is uh, 250 times smaller than a human, you have to find a way to retrieve some signal uh, because of the, the, to compensate for the, the, the decrease in the volume. And how to increase the signal-to-noise ratio, there is a good property in MR, is that the signal is directly related to the visual uh, static magnetic field. And there are also two other the leverages uh, on which you can play is to uh, increase the sensitivity of the coil by decreasing the coil sizes and then to cover the whole organ you will uh, have a, a coil, coil arrays and an, another leverage is to reduce the noise uh, by uh, reducing the loss resistance and you can do that uh, on preclinical scanner by cooling the, the, the coil and we, we, we call that uh, cryo coil or cryo probe. Um, in Lyon, we had uh, the chance to install a high-field uh, high uh, preclinical scanner at 11.7 Tesla in uh, 2019 now. Um, and with this high-field, uh, strong magnetic gradients and radio frequency, high-performance radio frequency coils, we, were able, we are able to study brain anatomy with uh, anatomical images, uh, brain structure with diffusion tensor imaging, we can have a cardiac, uh, study cardiac function. Um, we can ha have uh, access to um, histology by uh, ex vivo uh, imaging, and also access to the um, uh, metabolism thanks to MR spectroscopy. And I want also to clarify what we call uh, high-resolution MRI. Uh, we are not 
yet at the microscopic scale. We speak more about mesoscopic scale, that is uh, um, 50 to 60 micrometer in plane, which is already a very good and interesting uh, resolution. For example, here on this ex vivo acquisition with a 62 micrometer uh, isotropic resolution, you are able to see, for example, the, the, the numerous fiber bundles in the striatum that uh, give this uh, striated appearance. And you can, in vivo, also reach some interesting resolution in plane, uh, but in, in the slice you um, have a, a thicker slice, like some five to, five to uh, 400 uh, micrometer. Uh, another point I want to, to quote here is uh, that very high field, uh, very benefit, uh, 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 MR spectroscopy benefits from high field, uh, and it's uh, one of the main uh, interests here, is the, this uh, uh, proton spectroscopy is a real non-invasive virtual biopsy uh, that give access to a lot of uh, uh, information about uh, biochemistry on, on the tissue. So the objective of our, works was, uh, of our work um, was to uh, explore the LPC model uh, RAT uh, to determine the longitudinal changes in demyelinating lesion over a long period of six month follow up and to explore it at 11.7 Tesla MRI with short and ultra short T2 components of, of the myelin and spectroscopy and then to compare MRI data with anatomopathological markers and to try uh, to identify a possible biomarker of demyelination and or remyelination. And for this, uh, we uh, used uh, 30 rats LPC model. We did a stereotaxic injection of LPC at 1% in the right corpus callosum. We had the first control of the demyelination at seven Tesla at one, two weeks after the surgery. And then uh, we proposed an MRI acquisition plan on um, horizontal uh, 11 point tesla, uh, seven Tesla every month. And you can see the, the flow chart for the, the rats. Uh, we wanted to, uh, to do it uh, every month. And uh, then every mo month we wanted to uh, sacrifice uh, five rats uh, to do immunohistochemical uh, analysis. And we uh, did first uh, histological myelin quantification that we will present to you. And um, we wanted to say that uh, the study started in July uh, 2021 and ended at the end of December 2021. So the acquisition protocol was composed of, of uh, three types of information. First, uh, contrast imaging with uh, standard T2 weighted acquisition and two other contrasts that are homemade contrast based on what we call optimal control MP rage. Uh, basically, we optimize the magnetization preparation to control the contrast and make the, the, the short T2 component in a hyper signal, like here the corpus callosum is a, in a hyper signal, or the, on the contrary to have it in a hypo signal also based Based on an MP rage detection. And we have also acquired localized uh, MR spectroscopy on the lesion side and the contralateral side and fast uh, DTI acquisition. Uh, here are the results of the measurement campaign. We have uh, at least tw 23 rats with at least uh, three time points. Everything has been acquired on the pilot platform of the laboratory Creatis, and all the data were transferred and stored on, um, on a data warehouse uh, in, um, in um, so, so that uh, uh, the database will be uh, used in the future or open uh, in an open uh, science uh, uh, spirit uh, approach. Once the data were acquired, we've developed uh, uh, automatic segmentation of the corpus callosum. So based on a deep learning uh, uh, unit uh, network, um, all the data were pre-processed uh, very uh, with a standard pre-processing such as uh, signal intensity uh, normalization, registration, 
uh, this, this corpus callosum was segmented and uh, characteristics um, were extracted. Especially, we uh, concentrated on our analysis on the volume evolution over time uh, and um, on signal variation inside the corpus callosum. Uh, here are the very preliminary results we've got. Um, uh, we've observed very small volume variation over the time um, uh, within plus minus 5%. Uh, but what is striking here is that uh, on the lesion side, the very few rats show a corpus callosum volume increased compared to the contralateral, uh, lesion, uh, contralateral side. And on the lesion side, you see there are more red curves, that is a more decrease, uh, relative decrease of the corpus callosum volume. Um, but if you go from case to case, uh, you can see some uh, rats that uh, show some kind of remyelination with the volume measurement. Here is a, it's a remarkable uh, case. Uh, um, and, and you can have also uh, some case here uh, where you have a small volume decrease uh, on, on the lesion side, but Inside the corpus callosum, you, you can analyze the signal variation and see some kind of um, modification and normalization of the signal on the optimal control uh, acquisition, which is uh, interesting for us. And these are uh, preliminary results uh, with, uh, for example, two rats. Uh, uh, and we did the comparison between MRI data and uh, histological staining with a uh, sudden black. And what we can see in those two rats at uh, day uh, 19 and day uh, 63 is that uh, in the um, T2-weighted uh, images, we have still uh, the, um, the demyelinated uh, lesion. And uh, in the control optimal uh, to see myelin, we see that there is a, a kind of a better signal uh, that would um, evoke that there is maybe a, a kind of a remyelination. Uh, however, unfortunately, the histopathological showed uh, no clear remyelination, so it was uh, disappointing <laughs> on that time. And so uh, this is the, the first results uh, we have, and we have to analyze and to quantify what we found in uh, MRI and in uh, histopathological uh, data. So to conclude, uh, this is preliminary results of the first exploration of uh, the LPC model RAT uh, to determine longitudinal changes in demyelinating lesion over a long time, six month follow-up period, uh, explored at 11.7 Tesla. And uh, what we found mainly is that corpus callosum volume reduction within 5% uh, on the lesion uh, side versus non-lesion side. Um, only few rats showed a corpus callosum volume increase in long term. And what we highlight as well is that corpus callosum signal highlight a few rats with mild degree of remunination, but considerably lower than the original myelin of the control lateral corpus callosum. Uh, over six months of follow-up. And uh, this is confirmed, it seems to be confirmed by the preliminary results of uh, anatomopathological analysis. So um, uh, we have no major uh, remunination on long-term follow-up. And uh, what could be discussed, it would be that uh, LPC model with high dose of LPC could be too aggressive uh, to allow a remunination phase. And um, in the MRI point of view, we could um, um, answer uh, if myelin remodeling visible uh, from texture analysis of imaging data enhancing short to T2 components could be a marker of uh, remyelination. And uh, we have still works in, uh, work in progress. And so um, on this uh, study, we have to quantify, as I said, uh, the anatomical data, uh, MRI and histopathological. We have to quantify uh, spectroscopy data and analyze uh, DTI data. And uh, there is a second study that just uh, started with the support of uh, RCEP Foundation. 
and it's on mice model this time. It's a LPC model and a MOG-induced EAE model uh, on 11.7 Tesla acquisition with cryoprobe. And over uh, three months uh, follow-up, he, and here you have the first uh, uh, images we have uh, performed. And to uh, finish, I we would like to acknowledge all the people who uh, work on this project and to acknowledge as well uh, ARCEP Foundation, Neurodis Foundation and LabEx uh, Prime uh, for their uh, financial support. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Francoise and Hélène. Is there any question in the audience? Yes. Thank you. <coughs> Very interesting data. Um, I, I was particularly um, puzzled, and at the same time, I found this very interesting this, this concordance between the MRI detection of the presence of remyelination and absence in histological studies. Um, because perhaps the myelin is there, it's just not the same. Did you try to use other techniques actually to detect myelin and different characteristics of this remyelinating new myelin? Yes, uh, we, uh, we just uh, for the start uh, used a sudden black to see uh, the myelin uh, contain. But uh, Fabien Chauveau, which is in the audience, could uh, uh, tell uh, that he will use uh, other myelin markers in uh, immunochemical uh, analysis to see the real content uh, of what it is uh, we see on the optimal, uh, con uh, contro optimal control, what is this signal we can detect. Uh, at the beginning, when uh, Hélène had uh, the results of the MRI, we were very um, hopeful <laughs> uh, to see what we will be in the histopathology, but uh, we were, uh, well, there is no clear remyelination, so uh, it, it it, uh, it's very interesting to see at what this corresponds in the optimal control uh, model. Yeah, you're... Mm. Uh, I'm Baron from ICM. Uh, to continue on, on this question, I would actually even advise to go to electron microscopy because I don't think that any immunohistochemical or sta staining would actually tell you if there is remyelination or not. There is a big debate on shadow plaques, what they are and all that, and the animal model really gives you the opportunity to go with the, the right way to analyze myelination, remyelination. Okay. I would like to comment as well on the LPC because from batch to batch, it can change a lot. And even though they say it's the same, we've had batches where it hasn't worked at all and batches where it seems to be very aggressive. So it might be worth just buying a batch, sorting out the concentration you need and then only using that batch. That's what we've done is have a freezer full of a batch with the same number, because it can vary massively. And you may just have got a batch which either didn't work or worked too well. So uh, Sigma say it's the same, but it's not. So it's worth being careful with that one. I'm not, uh, there is one point that is really or original, I'm not, I don't know if you think it's a strong point, is that you see in some time an increase in the volume of the control lateral corpus callosum. So is it a reproducible result? And have you any plan to explore this? Because I think it's new, and maybe you have some kind of reactive myelin, or I don't know what happens in the control lateral part of the corpus callosum that might be of interest to explore. Yeah, for the moment we... we we take these results with a lot of uh, caution <laughs> because, uh, yeah, it's plus minus 5%, so we have to reanalyze and be sure that uh, 
this variability or this this uh, phenomenon on the contralateral side is real uh, a real thing or, or we are, we really have to to take that uh, with caution but uh, yeah it, it, it could be interesting to see to correlate uh, what what uh, if what happened on the contralateral side compared to the yeah we will do that <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. So, to conclude this uh, MRI session, the last talk will be uh, presented by uh, Wafa Zarawi on the uh, homeostasis and structural dysfunction in brain injuries. Wafa? Good morning. And uh, thank you for the introduction. I just have to find my presentation, sorry. Here it is. Okay, thanks. I'm very, very pleased to be here and to uh, provide a brief overview of the work that we are performing in Marseille at 70 in MS patients with a um, special uh, focus on homeostasis and structural dysfunction uh, in MS uh, at 70. I have a main interest, as um, Bruno uh, mentioned, in studying sodium homeostasis in MS by uh, sodium MRI. Uh, indeed, uh, in MS, demyelination causes a cascade of events that are responsible for uh, energy imbalance with a very high uh, demand uh, on uh, ATP. And uh, within the meantime, we do have the inflammation that uh, inhibits the uh, ATP production. This uh, causes uh, energy failure uh, provoking, uh, causing uh, intracellular uh, sodium concentration within uh, the axon. And uh, this intracellular sodium uh, influx is responsible later for um, intracellular uh, calcium influx that uh, will cause a lot of damage within the axons. So with this uh, neural uh, degeneration. So we do have uh, an interest to study this early uh, sodium homeostasis and this uh, sodium uh, accumulation within the axons. And this can be done, uh, fortunately, by sodium MRI. Fortunately, but we are as well unfortunate because we do have a very, very low uh, sensitivity of uh, the signal, which is like around 20,000 times lower for uh, sodium uh, compared to the proton. But we can challenge all this uh, by, we can challenge all this, it should come back, okay, uh, by using uh, several uh, approach, dedicated um, sequence uh, for MRI, uh, dedicated post-processing. And we will be able to uh, measure this uh, total sodium concentration, which will be uh, an average of uh, the sodium concentration within the cell and outside the cell. Our group in Marseille for the last uh, 10 years uh, provided uh, several uh, results regarding uh, sodium uh, MRI in MS, and we were able to um, evidence that we do have an increase of uh, sodium within the lesions, MS lesions, but as well in normal appearing brain tissues, uh, in normal appearing white matter, and especially as well in uh, gray matter, in all types of MS patients. This, especially for uh, sodium within the gray matter, was uh, linked to the physical and cognitive disability. We also find a very strong uh, 
correlation between uh, the increase of total sodium concentration and the decrease of N-acetyl aspartate uh, measured by spectroscopy uh, proton MRI, which is a very uh, important and reference uh, of uh, the neuro dysfunction and neurodegeneration. And our group was like uh, the first one to uh, provide uh, uh, the protocol to be able to demonstrate the topography of sodium increases, meaning like the uh, special spatial location within the brain of this uh, damage, of this sodium accumulation that occur very early in, uh, in the disease. Nevertheless, uh, we still have uh, challenges to face as well because so far uh, these results as well as uh, uh, results from our colleagues from uh, New York and uh, London um, are uh, based on this total sodium concentration that is really the average between the intracellular and extracellular concentration. So this is an emerging field like to be able to have a specific uh, non-invasive MRI sequence that can be able to reflect more uh, what's going on on this uh, intracellular part. So far, the reference techniques are these three uh, mentioned here, like the first one, this is the use of a toxic shift reagents uh, that uh, just uh, um, create a frequency offset within the extracellular uh, space, but unfortunately, uh, we cannot use this uh, in humans. Uh, but we have to, uh, to choose uh, specific and dedicated uh, other sequences. We had as well the opportunity to have a few years ago uh, the uh, development by uh, the group of uh, Canada from uh, of Christian Beaulieu of an inversion recovery uh, sodium sequence, like it's really like the flare sequence in uh, MRI. So in this case, you do have uh, this uh, CSF that uh, is removed, but this is really um, just a part of uh, the extracellular components. That, that's not really a technique that is very uh, used. And the last uh, one is uh, the triple quantum filtering, as well mentioned by uh, Bruno earlier. This is a very uh, nice sequence. It's based on the uh, quantic, uh, physical quantics of uh, the sodium nuclei. Uh, with the coherencies that we can play with. Unfortunately, this is very uh, demanding and this uh, technique uses very a uh, large voxel, around one centimeter cubic, and the uh, signal to noise ratio that we uh, obtain, as mentioned here, is like just 10% uh, of the conventional uh, total sodium concentration that usually we measure. So my group in Marseille, develop a new approach. It's like a variation of this uh, last one. It's as well based on the magnetic physical properties of the sodium nuclei. And by acquiring a multi-echo quantitative uh, 3D uh, sodium sequences at seven Tesla, so we obtain 24 uh, set of images of uh, the whole brain at different echo times we are able to uh, assess very accurately the um, decrease of the signal of the sodium, which is very depending on the environment, on the, the cellular and tissue organization in which the sodium is uh, present. So we are able by uh, fitting a B exponential, as mentioned uh, briefly here, to uh, assess several uh, quantitative parameters, the T2 short and T2 long, which uh, are like the equivalent of uh, the T2 that we do have for protons. So these factors will be more related to uh, the microstructure of the environment in which the sodium is present. We'll be able as well to, um, to obtain a new uh, metric, which is called the fraction F, which is a fraction of the signal here presented uh, 
at the bottom of this uh, slide, which represents the quantity of signals that we do have in the short fraction represented here in blue, and which really reflect more uh, the cellular uh, organization of, uh, of the, the environment. We can have as well a quantification, specific quantification by using uh, dedicated uh, references, tubes, and uh, mono-exponential uh, uh, fit uh, to be able to uh, uh, obtain this uh, conventional total sodium concentration. In this case, it will not be based on only one point, like uh, at the shortest T, but we'll take all the decay, the 24 uh, points here. So with this uh, challenging technique, we are able to obtain four uh, metrics, four map, total sodium concentration, T2 short, T2 long, and this sodium signal fraction. And as you can see here, uh, this fraction F is uh, equal to uh, zero when uh, we are in the CSF. So really meaning that, uh, reflecting that this is more uh, reflecting uh, the, what's going on on the um, intracellular uh, part. And this F usually uh, varies uh, between uh, 0.5 and 0.6 and, uh, are, uh, and is altered when we do have um, uh, pathological uh, effect. Uh, I will be very uh, quick as well. We can go further in uh, methodological development. We can as well do uh, dynamic fMRI sodium. This is a work led by uh, Jean-Philippe Rangeva uh, in, uh, in the lab. And we can, uh, based on the same methods that we developed earlier, uh, we can uh, do as well a dynamic reconstruction with a um, um, time of uh, 20 uh, seconds, and uh, Jean-Philippe and his uh, postdoc were able to uh, demonstrate, for example, the sodium signal variation in regions with uh, a positive bold response uh, after right-hand motor task. Please uh, go and ask him during the, the break for uh, the, the different uh, topics of this. We were able to uh, assess first uh, preliminary results uh, at 17 MS patients. So we split the groups into two. A first one uh, called the complete recovery MS patients with a EDSS equal to zero. This is a very early stage of the disease. You can see that it's uh, around the mean of one year of disease duration. And the second group uh, of 14 uh, patients with partial recovery uh, with uh, EDSS uh, more than uh, zero compared to 25 uh, healthy uh, controls. And, uh, and you will be able to, to have more details in the poster of Munir Al-Mendili uh, who is present in this, uh, uh, in this conference. So regarding the T1 relaxometry uh, time with proton, you can see that uh, for uh, T2 lesions and normal appearing uh, white matter, uh, we do have um, differences, uh, uh, very, very strong differences uh, and alteration of these metrics uh, in uh, both groups but uh, we cannot differentiate uh, the complete recovery to the partial recovery uh, group. For total sodium concentration, we obtain uh, the same uh, value, values as we uh, uh, had uh, with uh, different studies uh, at 70, meaning that we uh, can uh, show at the early stage of the disease uh, an alteration of the sodium concentration within uh, the lesions uh, for both uh, groups, but we cannot differentiate between these two groups. And F, F is a very relevant marker in this uh, case, because as you can see here, uh, F was uh, different in the partial recovery uh, uh, group uh, 
compared to the um, LC controls, no differences between the complete recovery and the uh, LC controls. And what is very important and highlighted here in, in red is that we were able to uh, differentiate with this uh, factor the two groups uh, of patients uh, at the early stage of the disease. Uh, this is as well uh, with uh, rock analysis, we were able to demonstrate that uh, F is a relevant marker to uh, differentiate these two groups with a very high uh, sensitivity and uh, specificity. Uh, we do have many data that we are uh, collecting right now. So far, we are already uh, acquired 63 uh, early MS patients with a multi-parametric uh, exploration at 70, uh, with a quantitative sodium uh, MRI uh, that I show you to, to study the sodium homeostasis, but as well a very high result T1 and T2 weighted uh, proton MRI with a 600 uh, microns uh, isotropic, uh, DTI uh, to assess microstructure and structural connectivity, fMRI to assess functional connectivity, quantitative susceptibility mapping to assess uh, iron distribution. So far we do have uh, almost 20 MS patients that were acquired at uh, two years and just to show that we are uh, on the stage as well to uh, to process uh, this data, a lot to do, as mentioned by uh, uh, Francoise and uh, Hélène earlier. So we do have a lot of uh, data and we have to process them. Uh, I would like to uh, highlight as well uh, the work uh, led by Virginie Callot uh, on the spinal cord. 70 is very nice uh, through the development that has been uh, performed by the group of Virginie. Uh, to provide a height and very high resolution in terms of uh, T1, this is uh, T1 relaxometry, and as well uh, other uh, advanced quantitative techniques. This is very nice, uh, especially to uh, better detect the lesions in the spinal cord. You will have uh, access to two posters uh, in this uh, conference, and uh, Virginie as well is attending the conference, so please, uh, go and talk to her uh, regarding this very nice work. Uh, Jean Pelletier, uh, with his uh, clinicians as well uh, in the lab, uh, was able, uh, where they were able to uh, assess seven Tesla cortical uh, lesions in MS uh, using the very high reserved uh, T1 and as well uh, T2 uh, weighted uh, uh, images that we acquired at uh, at 70 in the lab, a first um, study uh, with 16 uh, patients uh, at the early stage of uh, the disease with six months of uh, disease duration. They were able to show that in these 16 patients, they were able to assess almost 400 uh, cortical lesions in 14 patients uh, with um, almost half intracortical lesions and half local cortical lesions, and they found a very nice uh, association, correlation between the local cortical lesions and the white matter lesions, while uh, no uh, association was found between intracortical lesions and white matter lesions, and no correlation was found between the cortical lesions and EDSS, no MSFC. Uh, this is a very uh, hard work to do and to detect all these lesions as mentioned as well by uh, Bruno earlier. And uh, in conclusion, that's very to show you that uh, ultra high field, and especially uh, 7 Tesla MRI, offers a great opportunity uh, to study multiple sclerosis, especially to study the early changes in sodium homeostasis by sodium MRI, which um, is like, uh, sound to be a very uh, relevant in vivo biomarker of the cellular function uh, integrity. This is important to better characterize uh, lesions in the spinal cord and as well to uh, detect the cortical lesions. This has to be uh, seen all together. This is, uh, all these uh, techniques are performed to characterize the focal and diffuse alteration to assess the structure, function, and metabolism in MS and the link uh, with clinical metrics and the neuro 
psychological uh, metrics as well. A lot of work uh, still uh, in progress uh, in Marseille, in, uh, in the group, with the longitudinal study that is performed and will be uh, very happy if uh, soon we can start a multicentric study as well with the French uh, center. So far, uh, two other uh, centers in France are equipped by a 70 uh, MRI in uh, Paris-Saclay and in Poitiers and uh, many colleagues uh, in Europe. It's important to combine all this multi-parametric data with clinical and neuropsychological data uh, to go further in post-processing to assess individual maps, especially for sodium uh, abnormalities. Uh, we will really need uh, more uh, effort and help, and so we need to go uh, further to artificial intelligence uh, to, for this post-processing uh, with all this data. And we keep in mind that uh, we uh, really like to better characterize uh, the, um, the disease uh, with our tools and to uh, try to predict uh, uh, the evolution of, uh, of each patient. Thank you so much. I would like to acknowledge all the lab, uh, especially uh, uh, Jean-Philippe Rangeva and Jean Pelletier and all uh, our colleagues, the RCEP Foundation uh, as well for all the support and all our colleagues. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Wafa. Is there any question? Catherine. Yeah, thank you very much. It was great. I have a very naive question. So what you show with the sodium imaging is a, a reflect of a neuronal integrity. Okay? I wanted to know, so this is the axon that are damaged. I wanted to know whether on axon which have which are demyelinated, but not yet strongly altered. You know there is a dis disappearance of the nodes of Ranvier and redistribution of the sodium channel along the naked part of the axon. Do you think that one day sodium MRI would be a way to assess this uh, diffuse re-expression of sodium channel along the denuded axon and give uh, uh, an idea of uh, the extent of neuronal vulnerability and correlated demyelination? That's our ultimate, ultimate goal, uh, indeed. This is very still challenging, so we have still to provide further developments, but for that we need uh, to achieve a technical uh, uh, challenge with, uh, to buy a, a new uh, coil, more sensitive coil, to be able to, uh, to go more uh, in deep uh, with this process. Uh, in terms of resolution, in terms of uh, spatial resolution, uh, as well as temporal resolution, and uh, to combine with uh, other, <coughs> as well, biomarkers that will be more prone to, to assess this. But that's definitely what we would like to do. You can ask cortical questions for Jean Pelletier, probably. <laughs> it's more sodium question, actually. It's here. Um, so I was puzzled, actually. It's interesting that you see dynamics, actually, in the sodium map. Because having the resolution that you have, the sodium is pumped in, pumped out, but it stays in the place. How would you explain this? And if this is perhaps related to technique, um, could this be used for functional connectivity mapping together with the, with, the, with the bolt, for example? I will start with the second part of the questions. Yes, we can, we will be able to use it for functional connectivity. Uh, and I will add like uh, the part of the answer that I just provide to Catherine. For that, we really need to, to buy this uh, very, uh, more sensitive coil, which unfortunately costs uh, 3,000, uh, 300,000 euros, uh, which is, but this will help us to uh, gain in, uh, in uh, temporal resolution, in spatial uh, resolution as well, and will 
for sure not be at the same level as the proton MRI and the functional connectivity for proton MRI. But the idea will be as well to look at this. And for the first part of the question, that's, yeah, that's a lot of uh, process going on for sure. Uh, what's, what we are looking, this was a very preliminary study with, uh, that Jean-Philippe led with uh, 10 uh, healthy control subjects. Uh, what we can say is that really uh, we were able to, to assess this uh, uh, differentiation in terms of uh, gradient, at least this big gradient, uh, but this is not just related to, it's a lot of cells uh, going on and we have really to further develop uh, the methods uh, into like to, to better characterize like after the, the process going on later. Thank you very much, Wafa. I would like to thank the presenters to, for respecting the time. So we have a coffee break, and you, you, you have to go back at uh, 11. Je voulais savoir où était la presse. Oui, 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 oui. This one, this one is a this, this is for color, color blind uh, males. <laughs> that you need a, a strong uh, nut red. That c'est bien ça, hein? Voilà, très bien.
Put it up.
Moi, je vais peut-être me mettre là pour présider les short orales parce que ça évite de trop de temps. Il, il est connecté. Non, c'est pas là, c'est bon. Faut encore pousser. Ça sera bon pour le cap la captation Tu vois, là, on a deux qui sont blessés. Et là, il y en a aussi deux prises qui sont brassées. Il est bien branché, oui. Oui. Euh, identification, il faut dans le temps. J'ai l'impression que ça cherche, non Oui, mais bon. Non connecté. Je vais chercher avec elle. Oh, C'est gentil. Hein. De lumière. Ah. Je, je connaissais les douches sonores. On peut pas mais pas les douches de lumière. À la limite, je vais plutôt le mettre là. Sinon, il y, y, y a des prix pour chercher. Oui, c'est bon. Ah, c'est bon, j'ai Internet, merci beaucoup. Hein. Bah voilà. Ouais, je, je vais le mettre par terre.
vous êtes en train de réunir, c'est pour ça Oui. Je reprends les lunettes, ça ne marche pas. Ah, je pensais que c'était euh, celle de. Merci beaucoup. Hein. très relevante, et ben, euh, et ben on vous, vous pouvez faire une modération. Pour l'instant, on n'a que deux auditeurs qui sont ici. Donc vous ne serez pas suivi même. Ouais, ouais, non. Ok. Voilà, vous voyez, il y a un léger différé qui est en fait. J'installe tout, je vous explique si vous voulez. Oui. Comme ça, ça sera plus simple. Okay. Merci beaucoup.
Hi again. Oops. Can we start now? Okay, welcome back. It's time to start the second session. Uh, so just a quick word, uh, Pascal Durbeck was supposed to um, chair this session. Unfortunately, she couldn't make it today, uh, but we are glad enough to, uh, to have Annick Baron, who kindly accepted to chair the session. So Annick, if you want to come here. <clears throat> Thank you, Annick. Thank you, Pierre-Olivier. It is my pleasure to, thus to replace Pascal. Uh, in this task, and um, my first job is to introduce uh, Anna Williams, uh, who is from the University of Edinburgh, and who will discuss why might oligodendroglia heterogeneity be important for remyelination. Anna. Thank you, Anik.
Okay. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak today. Um, it's been a real pleasure to be back in Paris and uh, to see you all in person. So, I just want to start by reminding you that in multiple sclerosis, we have had a revolution in terms of the treatment, in terms of a modul uh, immunomodulatory drugs. So these Im uh, immunomodulatory drugs are able to prevent, or at least reduce, the episodes of demyelination that give you MS lesions, at least in the white matter. Um, but we know that um, uh, people have demyelination, that's by definition how they um, are diagnosed as having multiple sclerosis. And if you have demyelination, then you can get nerve degeneration. And this is much more important in the later phases of MS, for example, in what we call progressive MS. And people have been trying to think of ways to improve the therapies for this. And so there are two options that people have been thinking of. It's not a good sign. The two options um, are to promote the nerve survival. And this happens in the other, we need to do this in the other neurodegenerative diseases as well. And there have been trials that have uh, been there for that. And also, um, we, uh, we've been talking already today about the possibility of improving remyelination by oligodendrocytes, because then they can restore both the saltatory conduction, i.e. the speed of nerve conduction, and the food, so the metabolic support, that the oligodendrocytes um, pass through the myelin sheath to the underlying axon. And there's been three trials of that as well in people. These trials have been perhaps at best moderate, mildly hopeful, but I think we can come back to why I think those trials may not have been um, uh, um, as ideal as we'd like them to be. But what we've also talked about already today is the idea that people are variable and that some people um, are quite good at remyelinating and have less neurodegeneration, and they may not be connected, but they might be, and other people have um, more. And so this is uh, Bruno and uh, Benedetta's work um, and the PET scan um, uh, study, which um, has already been introduced today, where we can see that remyelination, the amount of remyelination correlates with disability, i.e. more remyelination and less disability are correlated. But you can also see that there's a big variability. You know, some patients seem to be good at remyelinating and others poor. And if you look at this study as well, um, this is looking at brain atrophy by MR scans. So this is the amount of brain shrinkage over time in both the controls, just showing you that with age, you lose brain. But in MS, there's um, much more variability. Some people have more brain shrinkage earlier and some people are actually pretty much the same as people without MS. But there's a huge range. And I think it's interesting to, to have a look about why these differences are there. And so people over much time have been trying to say, does this associate with how old you are, whether you're male or female, what sort of MS you have, when you get it, how long you've got it for, or what drugs you're on. But actually, there's not very good association with any of those. So these metadata do not work at being able to predict who is going to repair well or who is going to degenerate less well. And so what we did, I'll just keep talking. <laughs> what we did was have a hypothesis that, uh, that different people may have different amounts of remyelination because their oligodendrocytes behave differently. Okay, and so we were able to address this hypothesis because of the advent of single cell technologies. So we can now study what single oligodendrocytes do in different people. And so at the moment, the resolution of this is probably about 3,000 RNA messages per cell that we can pick up. And of course, those RNA messages will give us a clue about what their proteins that they, those cells were making. Um, we can do this with RNA sequencing, also called, also called uh, transcriptomic analysis. And effectively, what we do is um, take these 3,000 messages in however many cells you can afford, 
And then you ask the computer to um, cluster together the, the different flavors, if you like, of cells, the different types of cells. And today we'll talk just about the oligodendrocytes. But we, you know, we can work out using the computer to put cells together that look similar and cells apart that look different to give us an idea about the different types of oligodendrocytes and what they do. And so this is what we did now a couple of years ago, and this is from Sarah Yeckel. Um, so we took 18,000 nuclei from post-mortem brain of people without MS and people with MS, okay? And some, uh, so five controls and four MS patients. So all we've done here is just take the oligodendroglia, so the oligodendrocytes from the precursor cells, and then ask the computer to cluster together the ones that are similar and put apart the ones that are different. And you can see that these are the oligodendrocytes. And I think the key thing to pick up is that there are differences. So you can see, for example, these blue, they look blue up there, oligodendrocytes, um, oligo-1, um, seem to be present in, in the controls, but not in the people with MS, mostly. But it goes the other way as well, is that people with MS have this type of oligodendrocyte, this flavor of oligodendrocyte, this pink one, and then um, that's not there in the controls. So this tells us that oligodendrocytes are behaving differently in people who have MS than for people who do not. So what are they doing? Well, this is just one example of the fact that they seem to behave a little bit oddly in people with MS. So Lida Zupi, who um, was a postdoc in my group, um, looked at post-mortem brain tissue, and she stained up the myelin here um, with PLP um, in brown, and then the nerve cell bodies here with NUN in blue. And you can see from here that this phenomenon has arisen. The myelin sheaths are wrapping around the neuronal cell bodies, and they shouldn't do that, but they're doing it. So why are they doing this, and what does that actually do to the cell? Because it clearly is not going to speed up nerve conduction by being around the nerve cell body. So these, we've detected these in the cortex of um, uh, many people with multiple sclerosis, um, and so we need to then find out what's going on. But it's really just illustrating to you that oligodendrocytes in MS are not working properly. But what I haven't done yet is to tell you that um, I think also oligodendrocytes are working differently in different people. So to address that question, um, we had to increase our numbers. So we then took um, post-mortem samples from 29 controls and 54 MS patients. And um, we actually took lots of different samples from white matter, from gray matter, from lesions, from different types of lesions, from normal appearing white and gray matter, getting to 167 samples. And then we um, isolated the cells and did single nuclear RNA sequencing. And we've taken about 750 million, uh, 750,000 750, cells, each with about 3,000 RNAs. And uh, then what we can do is um, group them together using even more computer power. And we did this very much in collaboration with Diraj Malhotra in Roche in Basel and um, Gonzalo Castillo Branco in the Karolinska in Stockholm and Charles Franz Constant in Edinburgh. And it's been a very fruitful um, collaboration. But you know, we took these numbers of samples because what we thought was that perhaps oligodendrocyte behavior may depend on whether they're in a lesion and what, which type of lesion compared to perhaps normal appearing white matter. So, please don't panic. This is a heat map, which I've tried to simplify. But what I'm showing you here is gene expression. So blue is high gene expression, red is low gene expression. And this, I'm just showing you the oligodendrocytes, just focus on the oligodendrocytes here. And um, each of these rows is a different RNA, so a different <coughs> gene that's being expressed. And then we're, what we've done is just group the data on the basis of um, the lesions. So these are the controls, and then these are the MSs. And um, I've cryptically labeled this, but this is normal appearing white matter, active lesions, chronic active lesions, uh, chronic active lesions, remyelinating lesions. But the importance here 
is just to see that there's not a pattern. Now, we thought we would have a pattern of gene expression that might be there for normal appearing white matter, and then a different one for active lesions, and a different one for chronic active lesions, and a different one, etc. But actually, what you can see is it more, more or less looks like abstract art. Okay. So what we did instead is say, well, okay, maybe the lesions are not so much determining the function of oligodendrocytes, but maybe it's the people. So in, this is the, these are the same data, but this time it's just, uh, these are the same RNAs, but they're ordered this time in terms of people. So these are all the controls, and then each person has a different color, and you can see that there are multiple samples from some people, okay? But what you can see is that the pattern is very clear, that you know, these people have a pattern that goes red to blue, and these people have a pattern that goes blue to red, and then there's some ones that are in between. Okay, but now we've got patterns that allows us to then say, okay, which genes are driving these patterns? So, because um, that might give us a clue about what's going on in terms of the pathology and perhaps the regeneration. And so what we managed to do was divide them up into four different patterns, which I'm just trying to illustrate here to give you the idea. So group one pattern just said that the gene expression looked pretty much the same as somebody who didn't have MS, which is normal. These group two had uh, uh, gene expression, so more genes were expressed that were related to oligodendrocyte maturation, which of course is important if you want to do remyelination. Group three had um, more of these extracellular matrix protein genes, which we know are important for oligodendrocyte differentiation and for regeneration generally. And group four pattern seemed to be high in these stress genes, so that gives us a, an, a way of stratifying people um, which suggests that they might have different repair responses, which is not reliant on the type of MS or the type of MS lesion. So, but I've also told you that the oligodendrocytes were different, so let's look at those. So um, what we did um, was class the oligodendrocytes um, into different types going from uh, a more immature, so less mature at this end, and more mature at this end. And they're supposed to be color-coded. So what you can see here is the proportion of these different types of oligodendrocytes that's in a control. So this is what sort of spread of oligodendrocytes you're supposed to have in your brain. And then you can see that these people who have um, uh, had MS um, had pretty similar um, idea. This is just one person and their four samples. So they're pretty similar in proportion. So we called that group standard. In this group, what we saw is that um, these are people had lots of these stressed oligodendrocytes They're ex expressing stressed genes, so we called them stressed. And this group of people had really quite a lot of these early oligodendrocytes, so they, got, they seem to have got stuck in um, oligodendrocyte maturation. So we called them stalled just so that people could remember it. And so we now can group the patients in terms of their oligodendrocyte types, and I've showed you we can group the patients in terms of their gene expression, but do those two groupings overlap? And happily they do. So this one is your RNA patterns, so your gene expression. These ones are your oligodendrocyte types that I've just shown you. And you can see that the group one pattern fits with the group A, so the standard type. The group two pattern fits with some of group B, um, which are the ones that are um, expressing the oligodendrocyte um, uh, maturity genes. Group three is the other half of that, so we split stalled into one and two. And group four are the ones that seem to have stressed oligodendrocytes. So we think this is exciting because what we've got now is a way of stratifying people on their post-mortem brains, on their pathology, but perhaps on their regenerative response or failure of regenerative response. And if we can do that in people with MS who are living, perhaps ideally with blood markers, so if we can convert our brain markers into blood markers, then we may be able to group people into these different repair types which of course means that we could start trialing different therapies for these different groups of people. And these 
the therapies may be different. So, for example, perhaps the remyelination therapies that we've tried already might work best in people with a standard gene expression, um, whereas perhaps antioxidants or anti-stress uh, therapies might work better in the stressed ones. And perhaps we need to unstick to uh, the differentiation to help the ones in the stalled group, but maybe they need different drugs. So we think this is important, and you know, clearly we don't know why it happens, why are people different. We don't know exactly what these differences mean, but I think this might be a really powerful way of stratifying patients to allow us to get better results in trials and then better therapies to people. And that's what we're trying to do in Edinburgh. So we are part of the MS Society Edinburgh Research Centre at the uh, University of Edinburgh. And we're trying to get better drugs, effective drugs for progressive MS and um, feed them into this trial platform which is going on in the UK, which is a 10-year platform um, of uh, trials throughout the UK um, uh, where drugs can go in and come out, and you can ask me about it afterwards if you're interested, but sort of a clinical trial platform that we will be able to use. And so I would just like to end by thanking my group, who you might be able to see are wearing hats, because we were celebrating the 100th birthday of the oligodendrocyte last year. So oligodendrocyte was discovered in 1921, so 2021 with its 100th birthday, and so we went out for a meal wearing oligodendrocyte hats, um, which was much fun. So I'm thanking my, my funders, my collaborators, and the group, which I couldn't do without. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna. Great. Um, first, just a, a short comment about the, the history. You're right, 1921, Pio del Rio Ortega, no question. But if you look carefully in the literature, there is a... Il y avait un français. No. No, <laughs> no justement, c'est pour ça que je dis ça. There was a Scottish guy named ah. Robertson, who I think at least 20... No, 50 years earlier, he described a sort of a staining who allowed him to describe the oligodendrocyte. Ah. But even Penfield said that this coloration staining was so complicated that he never succeeded to go outside the wall of Edinburgh. Ah. But that was so just we need another bit. party for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that was just a short. Uh, con considering your, your work, which I like very much, have you considered um, looking at the localization of uh, uh, these oligodendrocytes, or, or, or the different pattern of oligodendrocytes. You know the work that we have done, that uh, Bill Richardson has done, and that the different pattern of oligodendrocytes, not with those very sophisticated single cell RNA transcriptomic, but with different criteria, they were uh, found in different areas in the brain. And I was wondering whether this would not be another way of uh, classifying uh, this oligodendrocyte. Yes, I agree. And actually, um, Daria Odega already described there were different oligodendrocyte morphologies in different areas of the brain. Um, so yes, so the data I'm showing you here are just from the white matter and from cortical white matter. Um, but we did gray matter as well. And there are differences between the gray matter oligodendrocytes and the white matter oligodendrocytes. But also in a different project, we have compared oligodendrocytes um, from spinal cord, from cerebellum, and from motor, uh, well, just underneath the motor cortex in the white matter. And there are differences there as well, as one might expect. But those differences don't drive these changes, um, because these are all in the same sort of, the, the, uh, the uh, white matter of the cerebral um, hemispheres. And so we're not see that's not driving this difference, but there are clearly other differences. Um, I agree. And they're interesting. Yeah, Jana, thank you very much. It's really fascinating. I'm a uh, little bit uh, puzzled by, you know, the, the concept of heterogeneity according to patient and not to 
areas or lesions. And in the work from Absinta in chronic active lesion, what is really marking is that you have a huge number of stressed oligo that may be not found you know, in other lesions. So we would expect to have some heterogeneity according to the lesion stage also. So I would like to have your comment about this and how can we think about you know, a general state of oligos in the whole brain in a given subject in a disease like MS, do you think that you have wave of states and that you can capture in a given subject a wave that all oligos are stressed in a given period, but at another time, it might be another state, or would it be really a developmental or a personal feature? Yeah, so I might start with a second question. So um, uh, the idea that, that uh, are there differences even within the patient in terms of um, region, or uh, we'll start with region. So you know, there are multiple samples here from um, each patient, and it was a surprise to us that they all looked the same. So I think that comes back to, um, I think somebody that's talking this morning about, it's a global disease, and we actually saw that transcriptional differences in normal appearing white matter was pretty similar to the ones in the lesions. And so I think I have com converted my mind into a feeling that MS is a global brain disease and there are areas of focal change on top of that, but it's actually a whole brain disease. The question about whether that stays the same over time, um, we don't know that yet. And what we need for that one is a biopsy followed by a post-mortem sample and to see if things change over time, if we're doing it in the brain or a marker that we can do it from the blood. Um, your other question was, yes, is it surprising to have um, no uh, sort of no uh, signature for the, for the different types of lesions? Well, I think it perhaps is, but you know, if you look at this carefully, you can say, okay, you know, this gene here is low in normal appearing white matter, higher in active, higher in chronic inactive, lower in in chronic inactive. So you, know, you can start seeing that there are variances um, at the single gene level, but um, if you're looking at patterns overall, it's much more driven by the general idea. And this, I've just shown you the oligodendrocyte data, but actually this data is the same for all of the other cells. So the patterns of gene expression are not reliant on your cell. It's, it's a general global transcriptional change which I think is telling us that people are regenerating or not regenerating really differently. And I think it might be a really useful way of trying to stratify patients. And if you talk to patients, they're very aware, as you know, that there are huge differences between people. And so can this explain it? Well, I, that's what I'm proposing. On the very same line, you started uh, by saying that uh, age, sex, duration of disease, subtypes of MS had no impact on remyelination. Could you reassess this using your uh, yeah. 54? Uh, yeah, so we did. So we tried to map, you know, I gave you the short version, which was um, mapping it by a lesion type and then finding that the donor type was the best, but we mapped it by age, by sex, by duration, by EDSS. You know, every part of metadata we had. We didn't have ML scans, so we can't map it to those. But none of the obvious metadata um, mapped on. The best way of stratifying patients was by patient. Yeah, so, and I have a question regarding your stratification of oligodendrocytes. So, have you tried the same thing for the OPCs? Uh, Sorry, say that again. Have we tried? The, have you tried to do also the clustering for the OPCs according to the type of lesion, uh, knowing that there is this debate about the contribution of OPC in remyelination? So I was wondering if there is, if you have also data on oligodendrocyte progenitor cell. Yeah. No, honestly, Brian, we've got data for every cell. It's far too much. But actually, um, if uh, we have released this data um, on... Uh, so if you go to the bioarchive, there's a link to a shiny app where you can put in your favorite gene and then you can see which cells express it in not in the different lesions, in the different people, in the different sex, et cetera, et cetera. So that's worth looking at if you have a favorite gene. Um, we definitely did this with OPCs as well. I'm simplifying it for today. Um, what we, so 
to be able to distinguish whether the OPCs are driving the remyelination versus the oligodendrocytes are driving the, uh, the remyelination. I don't think we can do that. Um, what I think we need to be able to do for that is a spatial transcriptomics because we need to find those cells that, are, that are look like they, well, you know, I'm assuming that the ones that are being, um, that are wrapping wrongly might be the ones that uh, we need to, to target. We are doing it in zebrafish because it's much easier in zebrafish to be able to isolate the ones that are doing it from OPCs and the ones that are doing it from mature. But, you know, that's, we're trying to map the zebrafish onto the human, onto <laughs> various other things to see if we can pull out a signature for oligodendrocytes that are doing remyelination um, rather than OPCs that are becoming oligodendrocytes that are doing remyelination. So watch this space, but not yet. Thank you. Thank you for introduction. Thank you for invitation. This is the work that has been funded by RCEP, and this was this real pleasure actually to work with a patient-driven uh, association. Very motivating and rewarding as well. And I will share with you some of the data that that we that we have on the Araxar gamma retinoid X receptors um, to understand better the mechanism of oligodendrocyte uh, differentiation a work that we do at the IGBMC in, in lovely Strasbourg. So uh, just to put this in the context of oligodendrocytes, their differentiation and MS, um, a short reminder that throughout life, and this is the case of um, um, rodents, but also human throughout development and then early postnatal life, um, oligodendrocytes are generated uh, starting from neural stem cells through the oligodendrocyte progenitors to end up myelinating the uh, neuronal axons. And this is in a temporal and regional manner as, as this is described in here for rodents. And there, there is a lot of work actually going on to understand the mechanism of developmental oligodendrogenesis because it's believed that similar mechanisms can be reactivated during regenerative uh, um, oligodendrogenesis that is induced by different type of stressors um, and which which is halted at the stage of activated OPCs in, a, in multiple sclerosis. They cannot differentiate and proceed to remyelinate um, axons. So this is actually at that stage that we got interested in Araxars and the, the, the this is thanks to original observation of Jen Jeff Hong from, um, uh, from Robin Franklin's lab, who found that those um, activated OPCs in debilinating lesions um, express the retinoid X receptors gamma. Um, yet, there is nothing much known about the role of Araxars and the um, developmental oligodendrogenesis. And, and this is the question that we were asking about the Araxar gamma. So I will show you some preliminary data, but before getting there, a, a short introduction to retinoids and to give you some perspective actually what, what they do. Because the retinoids, they have a big potential to control development of different cells and it's been shown also for oligodendrocytes at some stage with the, with the um, uh, in, in vitro. Um, and retinoids define different types of vitamin A classes. The best known is vitamin A. This is the one that is classically involved in control of development. And so this concerns especially all transretinoids. 
there are a couple of other types of retinoids that are present in, in other species, not really much in human. And those retinoids, they act through um, nuclear hormone receptors. In particular, um, as all the vitamins, they cannot be synthesized de novo, so they acquired nutrition and through a series of enzymatic reactions in target cells, they are transformed into all trans retinoic acid, which is an active form and can bind retinoic acid receptors. There are three different isotypes, which in the form of heterodimers with retinoid X receptors, which are in the heart of our interest today, they will form a transcription unit to control gene expression. This is a Interesting, <coughs> interesting system where uh, retinoid receptors act as an interface between the environment um, and transcriptional programs to adapt cell to environmental conditions. And this is also the role of RXRs, yet for RXRs, what was believed the only ligand is 9-cis retinoic acid, but it's never been actually detected in human or in rodents. And this is through a long-term um, work that we found one of such receptors. I'll just show you in a second. Uh, but this receptor might be particularly important for control of RXR functions with some other nuclear hormone receptors, like the uh, liver X receptor or proliferator activated receptors, <coughs> but also RXR homodimers. Um, so basically to, to um, cut the, the, the story shorter, we found a 9 cis dehydroretinoic acid, a molecule that is present in human and in rodents. It, it binds to RXR. Um, we show this through the crystal structure, one of the techniques, but also it induces the transcriptional activity of RXRs in a similar manner than other types of RXR synthetic ligands. The important thing is that this molecule, the, uh, this type of retinoic acid, cannot be synthesized efficiently from conventional, traditional vitamin A, which are all transretinoids, which pushed us actually to look for the precursors, and we found new types of carotenoids and dehydroretinoids in human and in rodents, which define a new class of vitamin A, which we call vitamin A5X, because it can unlike the other one, activate RXR transcriptional activities. And we found already that this is particularly relevant for controlling the stress ad adaptation, learning and memory, and perhaps, this is hypothesis, also neurodevelopment and neuroprotection. And this is where, um, where the interest in, in uh, OPC's development kicks in. Uh, so I will come back to the um, uh, Franklin's observations, which, um, which came actually from studies of demyelinating or remyelination at different stages of remyelination. They found spe specifically at 14 days after a lesion, um, a very strong upregulation of RXR gamma, which was hitting the roof. And uh, they decided it's something that might be important. This reflected actually an, an increased number of cells expressing RxR gamma. These cells were OPCs, activated OPCs. They found very similar type of observations in lesions from patients, showing that there is a big increase in presence of RxR gamma in the nuclei, specifically in the, um, in the active lesions, whereas in inactive regions, the, this expression was completely gone, suggesting some fun functional relation with the capacity to remyelinate. And uh, here is where we contributed to this work with studies of uh, RxR gamma knockout mice with, with Jeff. Um, this was possible to show that in absence of RxR gamma, there is a strong reduction of um, mature or maturing uh, oligodendrocytes after lesion of spinal cord, so clearly suggesting that RxR gamma facilitates uh, OPC differentiation during remyelination in mouse. So with Antonio Baltozaro and in collaboration with um, Laura Calza in Bologna University, we asked the question about the developmental functions of RxR gamma, 
And for that, we used in the first place the in vitro um, model where we were studying the um, um, neuros, neurosphere, so neural stem cell derived um, OPCs. Uh, this is the, the experimental protocol. Um, and this was to find basically that um, after addition of, of differentiating factor like thyroid hormone, we get a very strong increase of expression of MBP, which is a marker of differentiated oligodendrocytes. And you can appreciate the strong expression of MBP in white type, which was not really the case for the knockout, which is in black in here, and, and uh, compared with the image. And this increase of um, mature uh, oligodendrocytes was on expense of reduction of their of the pool of, of OPC progenitors uh, identified with the NG2. And you can appreciate this here. Whereas in knockout condition, uh, in knockout cultures, uh, OPCs, they kept proliferating, actually. So we ask now about the mechanisms. And for that, we basically uh, carried out the transcriptomic analysis at 24 hours after either thyroid hormone addition of the vehicle. And what we found, just looking at the, at the most strongly uh, altered uh, gene um, expression patterns, is that um, the, the, in RxR gamma knockout condition, thyroid hormone re induces much smaller changes of gene transcription. So it's basically cut by 50%, all the upregulated and downregulated genes. And um, this was reflecting pretty much the fact that already in the basal conditions, there is a very strong upregulation of a number of genes in RxR gamma knockout, uh, and with some already changes in the downregulated, um, that could have been divided um, into different functional groups. So I save you the, the heat maps, but uh, in here with the string analysis, you can see that there are some genes that were related to immune response, uh, extracellular matrix, and the uh, and sonic hedgehog pathway. Uh, whereas in downregulated genes, as expected, there were less markers of the uh, um, differentiation or maturation of oligodendrocytes. Um, after T3 additions, after induction of, of um, um, uh, differentiation, a number of genes were induced in Y types, but not much in RxR gamma knockout cells. And this is why it's reflected by a decreased number of, um, of downregulated genes actually in RxR gamma uh, in here when comparing to Y type. But what was striking was that the groups, the, the, the types, functional annotations actually did not change much. And what attracted our attention was, was the Sony hedgehog pathway that, that came up again uh, with quite a number of, of different genes. So we asked whether the Sony hedgehog or perhaps other uh, functional groups might be direct targets of RxR gamma. So for that purpose, we've performed the CHIPSIC analysis, identified or annotated around 3,000 genes to specific binding sites but actually, there was not much overlap with the up or down-regulated genes and the potential targets, direct targets of RxR gamma. But what was striking that among 10 of such genes for the up-regulated group, six were part of the sonic hedgehog pathway. Uh, among them, some of the upstream regulators of sonic hedgehog and three downstream from sonic hedgehog. <coughs> suggesting that the whole pathway may be a direct target of RxR regulations. So to understand the functional relevance of such changes, we basically decided to block the Sony Hedgehog signaling either at the level of SMO with the cyclopamine or the GLE, which is the transcriptional effectors, effector of Sony Hedgehog signaling. And what we found um, was a rescue, a rescue of phenotype in a sense that um, if you can appreciate in here the, the in conditions of inducing uh, factor, thyroid hormone, whenever we added um, 
um, we added cyclop the GANT, which is the uh, uh, glee uh, inhibitor or uh, cyclopamine, we're getting increase of uh, a number of differentiated oligodendrocytes uh, detected by MBP positive staining. And this is something that you can see in here, something that you don't really see much actually in the, in, in the, in the knockouts after T3 uh, addition. Um, and this was on expense of a reduction of the pool of actively, um, um, of active uh, OPCs. And what I don't show, that their proliferation went down as well, actually, suggesting that they differentiate. Um, not only differentiation was rescued, but, but also their maturation, uh, which was as evaluated using the um, analysis of the surface of the MBP positive uh, areas. So they went up together when the antagonists of Sony Hedgehog were applied, and also their complexity. So this were the Scholl analysis. They were also rescued. Um, for the wild type conditions, it was rather the opposite, in fact. There, was ra there were rather um, uh, deficient effects. So, we ask the, 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 the next question about the specificity of RxR gamma in those regulations, because if you remember, there are three different isotypes. And uh, we used the pharmacological approach basically to find that if in RxR gamma knockout conditions, the black bars, we add the uh, BMS, uh, we get a reduction of a number of uh, OPCs. And this is not pretty much correlated with the increase of their differentiation. Um, however, if in presence of, uh, of T3, uh, we get reduction of the, um, of the number of OPCs, but simultaneous uh, rescue of the uh, differentiation. And we can boost the differentiation of wild-type um, OPCs as well suggesting that the other remaining RxRs, they also contribute to, uh, to differentiation of those cells. So do we have still some time? I should finish. So, um, so the last two slides then. Um, so we don't know much how does it work actually in vivo. And for that purpose, we've developed a cell tracing, a cell fate tracing um, a tool, which is an animal model expressing the EGFP with the Cre uh, what, that were knocked in in the untranslated, three prime untranslated region of the RxR gamma, and we cross them with the, another reporter mouse that will express tomato only if the Cre is, a, is, is present. So basically, we scanned the, the brain, and what was surprising is that in the forebrain brain, we did not much find actually much of any oligodendrocytes expressing uh, actively RxR gamma or showing signs of a past expression of RxR gamma, which would be tomato positive. And there were very small numbers, so around 0.2% um, of oligodendrocytes in general were expressing actively in the adult RxR gamma. But 5% of such cells in the cerebellum were showing signs of a past expression of RxR gamma. So these are the only two positive ones. We don't know what they are. We think there might be uh, quiescent um, OPCs, something that is ongoing in the lab. So just as the conclusions we, we, sh we showed, what I've been showing you is that RxR gamma is positive modulator of developmental oligodendrogenesis, and at least this is the case in vitro, uh, that the Sony Hedgehog pathway down regulation is sufficient to rescue the uh, differentiation block that we observe in RxR gamma null mice, and that RxR gamma is partially functional, functionally redundant with RxR alpha and beta in such functions, in such regulations. Um, what is important is that the control of OPC differentiation by RxR is ligand dependent, which opens the way towards the pharmacological uh, approaches. And this is supporting previous data from Franklin's lab, who was also showing beneficial effects of, of such ligands. Um, and the, the RxR gamma control, finally, of the development um, of oligodendrocytes might be suggested by in vivo analysis of the cell fate. So um, 
um, the future perspectives is the dissection of the Araxor dependent programs of OPC differentiation, involvement of vitamin A5 in, in such processes. Um, understanding, of course, actually its relevance for 2PMS. So um, this is not relevant, so I will come straight away to the thank you and acknowledgements slide. In, in the first place, we wanted to acknowledge the RCEP for its funding and support. Um, this work was carried out in collaboration with the team of Laura Calza. Uh, Antonio, who was a happy founder of, uh, of uh, Mushroom, he finds quite a few other interesting things in this project. Um, Quentin uh, is involved in the, in the sulfate analysis, analysis and um, thank you for your attention. We'll be glad to answer your questions. Thank, thank you for this talk. Um, I would like to know if, if we have any ideas uh, of the dynamic of the putative uh, ligands for RxR gamma during um, embryo, embryo development or uh, during adult life. No. Okay. Because if, <laughs> okay. if you suggest that RxR gamma is important, then well, we can assume that some ligands would have their concentration varying depending on physiological conditions. Yes, I agree. Um, it's, there are technical hurdles actually about this, so we had to use quite a bit of material to quantify this and to go into pieces of embryonic brain. Uh, it was a little bit challenging, so we developed new tools for that, uh, which are based on click chemistry to to reduce the, uh, the quantity of material that could be used to analyze retinoids in perhaps single cell level. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, Anik, a question. Just one, one more question. Uh, about uh, the upregulated genes, are all uh, glide genes upregulated or is there any difference? regarding Li1, 2, and 3. So, sorry. The question was whether the, um, the genes that are upregulated... In, in the Seneca drug signaling? Yes. Uh, what about Gly1, 2, and 3? Are they all upregulated or not? Oh, um, yes. Actually, the, the, this was a short list concerning genes that are upregulated four times or more but the actual list of upregulated, significantly upregulated genes in Sony hedgehog pathway seems to be, yes, much bigger. And uh, there are perhaps some exceptions, but there were few. Yes. Or at least associated with Sony hedgehog, because it's not ever clear actually whether they are directly regulated by Li1 or no. So our next speaker and last speaker of this session uh, is Delphine Meffre uh, from the Faculté des Sciences uh, Fondamentales et Médicales uh, de Saint-Père, and she will be discussing the role of alpha secretors ATM10 in remyelination. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. Um, so first of all, I would like to thank uh, the organizer for inviting me and for giving me the opportunity to present my work. So today, I'm going to present uh, some recent data from the team um, on a study entitled the alpha secretase ADAM10 in myelination and remyelination of the central nervous system. So this work has been done uh, in the team of Professor Charbel Massad and more precisely in the group of uh, Professor Mernas Jafarian Terani. So as you know, uh, myelin is crucial for nerve conduction and when uh, myelin and oligonodrocytes are affecting, when there is a demyelination, it causes uh, severe symptoms 
And um, these symptoms have been described in um, demyelinating disease, uh, such as multiple sclerosis. And nowadays, there's no speci specific treatment for these demyelinating lesions. And that's why in the team, we focus our uh, work on therapeutic strategies that uh, could promote remyelination through the enhancement of endogenous uh, repair processes. So in this context, we are particularly interested in the uh, alpha secretase ADAM10, which is a family member of metalloproteases that can cleave uh, among a lot of substrates, APP, the amyloid precursor protein, and this cleavage leads to the release of SAPP-alpha, which is a very well-described uh, neuroprotective and neurotrophic uh, protein. So we are particularly interest interested in ADAM10, as it is the most uh, important alpha secretase in the brain. And uh, it has been shown that the no total knockout of ADAM10 is lethal at E9 and cause uh, severe um, CNS defects. And also that the neuronal ADAM10 is involved in uh, neural precursor cell migration and in uh, cortex formation. Besides, besides its role as a transmembrane uh, enzyme, it has also been shown that the cytoplasmic domain of ADAM10 could be cleaved and that uh, this cleavage release an intracellular domain, ICD, that can reach the nucleus of the cells. So our main question in the team is to understand the role of ADAM10 in myelination and in remyelination. So I will divide my presentation in four uh, axes or four um, questions. Where is, express, uh, where is ADAM10 expressed in the CNS? What is the role of ADAM10 during um, myelin, normal myelination and during repair? And how its effects are mediated? So first of all, I will start with the, the mapping of ADAM10 in the CNS. And since previous studies uh, on the ADAM10 distribution were only performed at the mRNA level, by uh, hybridization in situ, and furthermore at uh, perinatal stages, our first aim was to um, um, explore the distribution of the ADAM10 protein and, uh, in adult uh, stage. So uh, we have shown that by uh, immunohistochemistry uh, uh, that ADAM10 has a very large expression in the brain. It's expressed in the hippocampus, in the piriform uh, cortex with a very uh, strong uh, expression and in the internal capsule. In the, in the hi hippocampus, as we can see here, there is a very intense labeling in the pyramidal layer as it is a layer containing a lot of neuronal cell bodies. We have also shown a strong uh, labeling in the cortex and also an intense, uh, inter an intense uh, expression of ADAM10 in uh, thalamic and hypothalamic nuclei. Uh, furthermore, I will not present the, this data here, but we have also shown that ADAM10 has a large expression in the cerebellum and in the spinal cord. To go further, we have also investigated the uh, cellular expression of ADAM10. So for that, we have used uh, primary cell culture. If I can't finish, you can see the poster of Aida. <laughs> she will present also this data. Uh, and more in details, actually. Uh, so we have performed primary cell cultures of neurons and of uh, glial cells, and we have, um, we have described the expression of ADAM10 in, uh, particularly, uh, with a particularly strong expression in the cell body of neurons and oligodendrocytes. We have also shown the expression of uh, ADAM10 in neurons and oligodendrocytes in vivo. Um, so we have a strong uh, in, in labeling in the cell body in aggregates, highlighting its vesicular transport in the cell. And we have also a strong labeling in the nucleus, as our uh, antibody can target the intracellular part of ADAM10. We have also shown that uh, ADAM10 is expressed in astrocytes and in microglial cells, even if it's uh, with uh, less intensity. After the mapping of ADAM10 in the CNS, 
we wanted to investigate the role of ADAM10 in uh, myelin formation and myelin maintenance. So for that purpose, we have, we have uh, generated a specific knockout of ADAM10 that we named COOL A10 for cool, uh, knockout in oligonodocyte of ADAM10. So to generate this uh, COOL A10 strain, we have, um, we have bred together the ADAM10 flux strain mice with the plp cree ERT2 mice. So this COOL A10 strain is a conditional knockout for ADAM10, which is specific for oligodendrocytes and which allow a spatiotemporal uh, spatio control of the invalidation of ADAM10 by the use of tamoxifen. So this model allows us to uh, study a specific time point, which can be crucial for the myelination, uh, um, to, meaning at the beginning of the myelination or during the uh, myelin maintenance. So our first, first question was to investigate uh, the role of ADAM10 in myelin formation. And for that, we have administrated the tamoxifen at birth uh, to the pups. But uh, so for uh, time constraint, I will not present this data. And I will more focus on our second protocol that we established to understand the role of uh, ADAM10 in myelin maintenance. So for that, we have uh, administrated the tamoxifen to adult mice by intraperitoneal injection. So in this model, in adult mice, we have first, um, we have first investigated uh, the behavior, uh, behavior of these mice by the open field test. And we have shown that uh, with this test, in knockout mice, there is a decrease in the mean speed during the exploration, a decrease in knockout mice one month after tamoxifen injection compared to the control litermates. This decrease in the speed of the mice is maintained it, maintain, it maintained uh, over time with still an impairment uh, at nine months after tamoxifen injection. We have shown that this, uh, a decrease in the uh, mean speed in control and in knockout, but uh, I want to insist on the fact that this uh, decrease in the mean speed is always stronger in knockout mice. We have also uh, investigated, um, uh, counted the, the number of rearing events during this exploration, and we have shown that in knockout mice, there, are, there is a decrease in the, um, in the behavior of this, uh, this, be this uh, total number of uh, rearing events. As you can see here, with a decrease at three uh, months after tamoxifen injection and over time. So, this data showed that there is a persistent uh, decrease in motor exploration after ADAM10 uh, deficiency induced in adult. To go further, we have also uh, investigated the, the ultrastructure of the myelin by mi microsco uh, electron microscopy in the cerebellum of our mice. And we have shown here that one month after um, tamoxifen injection, there was no difference uh, in the percentage of myelinated uh, axons. However, by the measure of the G ratio, which is the inner to outer perimeter of the myelinated axons, we have shown a slight but significant decrease in this G ratio, indicating uh, uh, an increase in the myelin thickness. And we have also plotted this G ratio across axonal diameter, and we have shown that this, this decrease in the G ratio was affecting uh, all the axons across all calibers. So this data points to the fact that there is a slight decrease in G ratio, so an increase in this myelin thickness, and we have some preliminary, pre, preliminary data in the lab showing that uh, this could be due to uh, uh, myelin decompaction. So our third question was to investigate the role of ADAM10 in uh, myelin repair. And for that, we have used, we have used uh, an ex vivo uh, model of demyelination, so organotypic slices uh, for, of uh, cerebellum uh, obtained from wild-type mice that we have demyelinated by lysolecithin, and after that, we have treated the slices with a pharmacological compound that can modulate the ADAM10 activity. So we have used etazolate, which is uh, um, an alpha-secretase 
an alpha secretase activator. And we have also used uh, GI2540-23X, I will call this compound GI, which is uh, an inhibitor of ADAM10. We have performed immunohistochemistry to label uh, axons in red and myelin in green. And we have shown that uh, after uh, lysolecithin induced demyelination, there is a mag uh, disorganization in the mag staining and a decrease in the percentage of myelinated axon that we have counted. And as you can see, there is uh, an increase in the percentage of myelinated axons when we treat the slices with etazolate, the activator of ADAM10. Furthermore, we have treated the slices uh, with GI, so etazolate, etazolate together with GI, and we have shown in this case that uh, the effect of etazolate was no longer significant. Moreover, we have also counted the number of short internodes. Uh, it has been described that the, during remyelination, there is an increase in the number of short internodes. And we have shown that with etazolate treatment, there is a, a significant, significant increase in the number of short internodes, and that this effect is counteract with GI. So our results show that ADAM10 is involved in ex vivo remyelination. To investigate also the role of etazolate, or the effect of etazolate after demyelination in vivo, we have uh, used the um, cuprison model. So we have treated, uh, we have treated our mice, wild type mice, with cuprison during five weeks, and we have injected the, uh, the etazolate during the last two weeks of the intoxication. We have shown by electron microscopy here in the corpus callosum that there was a significant decrease in the percentage of myelinated axon after uh, cuprison intoxication, and that this decrease was uh, counteract with the treatment of, uh, with etazolate. Furthermore, we have also shown that the G ratio was affected by the cuprison and that etazolate was able to counteract this effect. And finally, we have also counted the number of uh, oversized mitochondria. It can be a hallmark of uh, axonal suffering. And we have shown that etazolate was uh, also able to counteract the effect of uh, uh, cuprizone on the, this uh, number of huge mitochondria. So we have shown that etazolate is also able to protect myelin sheath against, against uh, in vivo demyelination. In the same uh, model, meaning cuprizone model uh, intoxication, we have also uh, investigated the, um, the amount of myelin uh, protein, here the MBP, myelin-based protein, by Western blood analysis. And we have shown that after cuprizone intoxication, there is a decrease in the level of uh, MBP, uh, both in brain and cerebellum and that this decrease was counteract with uh, uh, etazolate treatment, as you can see with this uh, arrow, uh, blue arrow. So etazolate is able to restore MBP level, and we have also um, um, explored, uh, evaluated the, the behavior of our mice by, uh, we have described, the the, we have investigated the locomotion by a test, uh, walking ladder test uh, here, and we have shown that uh, after a cuprison intoxication, there is a motor impairment. As you can see here with the um, black square, there is an increase in the time spent to cross the ladder after intoxication. And we have shown a modest but significant um, effect of etazolate treatment, as you can see here. The, the mice uh, spent less time to cross the ladder after uh, uh, etazolate treatment. So we have also shown that uh, this treatment with this uh, activator of ADAM10 is able to enhance functional recovery. Our third aim, uh, no, <laughs> our last aim, uh, is to understand the action mechanism of ADAM10. So, uh, to make some hypotheses to understand how this uh, ADAM10 uh, is beneficial on myelin and oligonodocytes. 
And the first question was to investigate the role of adamantane in myelin gene expression. So for that, we have used uh, 158 uh, oligodendroglo oligodendroglial cell line, and we have uh, invalidated uh, ADAM10 by siRNA, and we have performed RTQPCR. We have shown that uh, after invalidation of ADAM10, there is a decrease in the, uh, in, uh, in the PLP mRNA level, and also a strong decrease, it's not significant, but a strong, strong decrease in CNPA's mRNA level. So at least in vitro, ADAM10 invalidation decreased myelin gene expression. Furthermore, we have also investigated the role of ADAM10 uh, in oligodendroglial maturation. And for that, we have uh, performed OPC primary cultures uh, obtained from PLP EGFP mice. Uh, allowing the visualization of the, the, the oligodendrocytes and uh, allowing the counting of the branching, so the, the maturation, the morphological maturation of the oligodendrocytes. We have shown that uh, the treatment with etazolate was able to decrease the percentage of simple ramified cells with a concomitant increase in the more ramified cells. And we have also shown that uh, this effect was counteract with GI, the uh, inhibitor of ADAM10. To the opposite, and in line with that, we have also uh, performed OPC primary culture with our cool 18 mice invalidated for uh, ADAM10. And we have shown that uh, there was uh, a significant decrease here in whites uh, in the percentage of more ramified cells with a concomitant increase in simple ramified cells. So this data show that oligodendroglial ADAM10 uh, is involved in uh, um, the maturation of oligodendrocytes. And uh, last but not least, we have uh, investigated our main hypothesis, meaning that ADAM10 could be beneficial because she leads to the release of the neuroprotective SIPP alpha. So for that, we have used the uh, uh, organotypic slices demyelinated by lisolecithin, so uh, obtained from wild-type mice. And after demyelination, we have uh, directly um, treated the slices with SAPP alpha in the culture medium. And we have shown that uh, this treatment uh, with SAPP alpha was able to uh, restore the uh, decrease in the, uh, myelinated, the percentage of myelinated axons. So this data point to the fact that ADAM10 activation can be mimicked by an SAPP alpha treatment, and so that ADAM10 could be beneficial on uh, myelin by the release of SAPP alpha. So to conclude, we have shown first uh, that the oligodendroglial ADAM10 invalidation leads to an impairment in the spontaneous exploratory behavior of the mice with an increase in the myelin thickness and a decrease in the myelin gene expression. And to the opposite, with the ADAM10 activation with etazolate, we have shown in vivo and ex vivo remyelination, together with a locomotor recovery, and uh, also that etazolate was able to uh, promote uh, oligonondroglial maturation. And recently, the, uh, the, uh, uh, um, uh, a paper was published by Zhu and colleague, and uh, in line with the, our study, they showed that the overexpression of ADAM10 in the corpus callosum was able to reduce the cuprizone-induced demyelination. So altogether, uh, this data uh, highlight ADAM10 as a therapeutic target for myelin protection and myelin repair. So to finish, I just want to thank uh, the team three, and especially uh, Merna Jafarian Terani and of course Dr. Aida Padia Ferrer, who have generated the cool attend during her thesis. I also want to thank Anne Simon and all the, the students who have participated in this uh, study. And uh, I'm very grateful to our financial support, uh, Arcet Foundation, of course, and FGC and IDEX uh, Emergence. Thank you for your attention. Can you show back the Cuprison slide? There is something which I did not catch very well on the G ratio. Yeah, 
I know <laughs> the question, I think. For the et isolator for the cool A10, yeah, here this we are. one. Yeah. So what you show is that the cupri zone plus vehicle, you have a lower G ratio, while when you put your et isolator, you have a higher G ratio, which means that with the cupri zone, you have a thicker myelin, while when you put et isolator, you have a thinner myelin. Yeah. I don't know if I have the slide here. Yeah, yeah, it was an unexpected uh, result. But That's in fact... That's the reverse to what you told us. That no, but uh, in fact, what we, we, we go further for this analysis, and actually what happened in our hand with this cuprison model is that the uh, cuprison was affected more the thin, ax uh, the small axons with thin myelin. Um, so it leads to a bias in the G ratio. Uh, if I extrapolate, it was like there was only the big, ratio, the big uh, axons with big uh, myelin, so that's why the uh, G ratio was decreased in our study. I have some, I have more uh, data if you want, I can show you after, but yes, it was because we have affected more the, le the small uh, and the thin myelin. Thank you, thank you for the talk. I'm hearing. I was wondering, uh, the effects of the, the drug, the etazolate, seems to be very impressive. Um, because you have the conditional knockout. Uh, yeah. Did you verify that all the effects are through ADAN10 and not other secreted, other protein being killed? I can't hear you well. I'm sorry. sorry. Uh, do you, you mean if use we the test the etazolate with the cool ATEN mice? The conditional knockout mice, yeah. So you, if you get rid of ADAN10, and you put the drug? Yeah, not, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, we want to do that in the project, yeah. We want to take some organotypic slices and to see if with etazolate we can have an effect on remediation. But for the moment, we, we don't have performed this experiment yet. Okay, thank you. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all the speakers uh, for their very nice uh, sharing data and uh, also for the audience for their questions. So we can move on for, to the next yeah. session. Thank you. Um, so it's time to, to start the, the third session on short oral presentation. So first I would like to thank the uh, CMS members who, um, um, who were asked to select among the more than 30, I think, more than 30 abstracts that we received, uh, excellent abstracts. Uh, we selected six uh, of them, which will be presented very shortly today. And of course, I invite you to, uh, to discuss further with the authors during the poster session afterwards. So uh, of course, this will be a very dense session uh, with short abstracts with five minute presentation and about three minute discussion. So quick questions and quick answers. And um, the first uh, presenter, the first speaker will be Marion Lévy. So um, maybe it was not a good idea for me to sit here. I will. <laughs> I thought there was a screen here, so there is not. Um, so I will sit. Okay. And I will, yes, thank you. And I will ask you to be strict on time. Yes. Otherwise, I will stand up. <laughs> okay, so, uh, hello everyone. First of all, I would like to thank the ASEP for giving me the opportunity to uh, speak about my project, which was about the influence of the aged environment on the behavior of grafted human iPSC derived oligodendrocytes. So why do we study aging in multiple sclerosis? That first of all, the number of our elderly MS patients is increasing. And it has been shown that aging patients are more likely to get the progressive form of MS, as well as more inactive plaques. So this leads to a decrease of remyelination efficiency, limited lesion repair capacity, and there is still no efficient treatment yet. So what do we know about remyelination and aging? So preclinical study uh, has shown that in vitro, OPCs 
lose their capacity for differentiation with aging, and an increased stiffness of the aged environment is sufficient to cause an age-related loss of function of OPCs. In vivo, remyelination occurs more, more slowly in all rats to, compared to young one following demyelination, and there is a decrease in the ability of macrophages within lesions to clear myelin debris. All these studies have been made in rodent, but there are differences between rodent cells and human cells, such as, for instance, that human progenitor proliferate at a higher rate and for a longer period of time than rodent cells, and that human OPCs require more time to begin myelination. That is why the use of grafted human OPCs in rodent may provide a more appropriate means to study human myelination in aging. Therefore, my project is to assess whether age-related changes in the tissue environment may modify the survival, the proliferation, and the differentiation abilities of grafted human oligodendrobial cells. To this aim, I generated human iPSC-derived oligodendrocytes that were transfected with transcription factor of oligodendrocytes that at, I grafted in the demyelinated dorsal funiculus of mice. The mice I use are either a young group or an age group, and they are RAC2 mice in order not to reject the cells. After 8 to 12 weeks, I perform immunohistochemistry. So my first result uh, describes the location of the cells. I'm sorry, I don't think we can really see it, but uh, here in red, you can see the human cells. And uh, what we can see is that there is no differences uh, in the lesion dorsal funiculus and in the non-lesion gray matter regarding the density. However, when we look at the migration of the cells longitudinally, we observe first an increase of the distance made by the cells at 12 weeks post graft, but this is altered in the aged group. Then we looked at the proliferation and the cell death uh, state of the cells, the human cells, and although there are quite some variability, we didn't see any significant change uh, regarding these two states uh, when we compare the two groups. However, when we look at the effect of the age environment on the human cell differentiation, we observe in the lesion dorsal funiculus an increase uh, of the percentage of uh, uh, differentiated cells at 12 weeks post graft, and this is again impaired in the aged environment. Then uh, we wanted to assess the myelination made by our human cells, and to do so, we used CNP MEGFP RAG to mice. Those are mice that express GFP in the CNPA cells, so this allows us to uh, see here the red ring myelin that is connected with a human cells here in white and doesn't express GFP, meaning that the myelin is made specifically by our human cells. So to conclude, uh, we showed that uh, uh, our cells are able to migrate over the entire spinal cord in all groups. However, those cells uh, extent of migration is altered in the aged RAC2 a group compared to using young ones. Furthermore, the ability of human cells to differentiate in the aged animal at 12 weeks post growth seems to be impaired, and this suggests that the, their maturation is slowed down in the aged environment. Finally, our human cells are able to remyelinate in the aged environment, and quantification will tell us whether this is decreased, this remyelination is decreased in the aged environment compared to the young one. Of course, this raised other questions like, for instance, what is the fate of the human cells that we saw in the gray matter? What is their role? Is it for myelination or for trophic support? I would like to thank my whole team, especially uh, Anne Baron that supervised this project, and Jeremy Chazot and Beatrice Garcia that helped me a lot. Uh, of course, Arcep for uh, supporting this project and you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes. Um, questions? One or two quick questions. So I will have 
One, do you have any hypothesis regarding the, 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 the loss of uh, migration capacity of the graft cells in older animals? Is it, I mean, could it be something around uh, extracellular matrix or, or what, what, what are your hypotheses? Yeah, so actually uh, one of the results I showed uh, in the introduction was a work uh, performed by uh, Robin Franklin and he showed that actually the stiffness of the tissue is higher in the unaged uh, animal. And so uh, we suppose that because of that, maybe the cells cannot migrate well uh, and are kind of stuck. And, uh, and also, also, also the extracellular matrix uh, might uh, play a, a role in all of this. In view of uh, what we've just heard from um, from Anna Williams. Um, in your opinion, what type of oligodendrocyte are you uh, generating from your IPS? So actually the... the because you take only one type of IPS cells. Yes. You induce them to become oligodendrocyte. So are, are they from the which type, you know? Uh, actually, it's from healthy patients, the lines that I grafted. So, in theory, it should be like a, um, a standard oligodendrocytes. Um, but uh, we did try with uh, also other um, uh, cells in another model, in a previous work made by uh, Sabah Mozafari. And uh, for this, it was from uh, RRMS. And uh, I don't know, we didn't see really differences regarding also um, uh, differentiation, but I cannot say uh, why type exactly. Uh, for, for in my project, I would say that it's a, uh, it's a standard uh, oligodendrocytes. Thank you, Marion. Thank so you. we have to uh, switch now to the next presentation. <laughs> By Victoria, yeah, okay. So please, I take this opportunity to thank Emmanuel very much for all the work she did for the preparation of this meeting. <laughs> okay, please. So hello everyone. Uh, first, I want to thank the organizing committee for giving me this opportunity uh, to present my PhD project about uh, methylene intake modulating neuroinflammatory and neurodegenerative processes in preclinical model of multiple sclerosis. Okay. So my project began in collaboration with uh, Russell Jones Lab, who found that uh, when T cells are activated, the methylene pathway is up, up regulated. And uh, when the, they put T cells in culture and differentiate them into T17 lymphocytes, they found that when you put less methionin in the media, there is a reduction of the L17 production. And when we put back methionin, we rescue this production of L17. And uh, when they look at the gene expression on those, uh, on those T cells, they found a reduced uh, expression of BATF and the L17. And they did also chip sequencing to look at the methylation mark on instone, and they found a reduction of the H3, K4, ME3 per Mrs. mark of methylation on IL-17 and BATF, which are key uh, signature of uh, TH17 lymphocytes uh, thought to be uh, pathogenic in uh, multiple sclerosis. It has been shown that the methylation uh, processes can be different between uh, males and females, and uh, also that the uh, methylation restriction can have beneficial effects but through sex-specific mechanisms. So we propose that uh, reduced activity of the methylation cycles can improve neuroinflammation but through sex-specific mechanisms that affect the generation of pathogenic T17 lymphocytes. So to do this first, uh, sorry for the, for the graph, I don't know why, uh, we use the active AAE uh, model uh, with black cis mice, so we give to the mice a control diet or a methionine restriction diet two weeks before the MOG injection uh, and the toxin purchases, and we uh, assess the clinical uh, symptoms. 
So we can see that the methanol restriction diet uh, delays the onset of EAE. And uh, when we look at the concentration of serum neurofilament uh, light chain, we can see that the elevation that we see during the peak of EAE is reduced with the methylene restriction diet. Again, sorry for the graph, I don't know why. And uh, when we look at the mechanisms that can be implicated, I will just show the uh, gut microbiota data for a matter of time. So before the diet, we can see that the composition of the gut microbiome is uh, similar between the groups. So this is showing the beta diversity. So uh, it's, uh, it's based on the principal component analysis. So when the two points are separated, it means that the gut microbiome composition is different. And when we look at our three weeks on the diet, just before the MOG injection, we can see that the diet induces modification in the composition of the gut microbiome that differs according to biological sex. And then at the present traumatic stage of ITVAE, one week after the MOG injection, we can see that the diet and the biological sex, as well as inflammation, induce uh, changes in the composition of the gut microbiome. And then at the peak stage of uh, active EAE, the diet still influences the composition of the gut microbiota, and we can see uh, no differences uh, during the chronic stage of uh, EAE. So in the second step, we use uh, a transgenic uh, EAE model. So they develop a spontaneous EAE. And uh, this model in is uh, interesting because we can assess the effect of the metadunin in a chronic, um, in a, during a chronic uh, like, uh, time. And uh, it mimics what we can see in humans. So the females are more susceptible to develop symptoms compared to the males. So when we give, uh, to th 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 so this is what we see when we give uh, to the mice a controlled diet in black, and when we give uh, when we give them a methanol restriction diet, we can see that there is a reduction in the EAE prevalence, and we wanted to see if uh, when we supplement the methanol in the diet we can uh, increase the EAE prevalence, where we can see that this is associated with a plateau effect on the disease incidence. And then uh, also with the SNFL concentration, we can see that during the chronic phase of the spontaneous EAE, there is a reduction of this, uh, of this SNFL concentration. And in the females on the supplementation, we can see that there is an elevation of this SNFL concentration. And sorry again for the graph, I don't know. And uh, when we look at the gut microbiome, we can see that before the diet, so the, the composition of the gut microbiome is similar between groups. And then after three weeks of methylene intake, there will be the uh, present traumatic stage of the spontaneous CAE. The diet uh, induces a modification in the composition of the gut microbiome that differs according to biological sex. And then during the chronic stage of spontaneous CAE, the methylene intake and biological sex independently uh, influence the composition of the gut uh, microbiome. So I would like to thank uh, all the people involved uh, in this project and uh, you for listening, and if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Questions? Yes, questions here. Thank, thank you for your presentation. So if I understood well, um, Depending on the methionine intake that we have, we, we will influence our gut a microbiota, and this will influence uh, T cell. Uh, that. Do you have an idea of the bacteria that is involved in that methionine team? Or you have no idea? Uh, I didn't hear very well. Do you have an idea of the bacteria in the, micro, in the, um, in the microbiota that, that would be involved in that methionine thing? Uh, yes, so we, I didn't show it, but we have uh, we we found Acamansia to be elevated in the methionine control diet, and uh, what we want to do is uh, to do a fecal transplantation uh, experiment to to see w which bacteria would be uh, the most implicated. Yeah. Other question. In the same line, this bacteria I don't think is specific for uh, multiple sclerosis or was identified in other pathologies. Don't, I mean, am I right? Or? Uh, yeah. 
Uh, yeah, it has been shown in uh, multiple sclerosis, but sometimes it has been shown to be elevated and sometimes decreased. And it's not, I don't think it's clear if it has like pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory effect. I would say more pro-inflammatory uh, because it, it has been shown to be elevated in MS, but uh, it's not very sure. Okay. Thank you. Um, we have, we would have time for one more question. No? Okay. If not, thank you very much. Yeah. I guess you are Benoit. <laughs> okay, so first of all, I would like to thank the RCEP Foundation for giving me the opportunity to present our work, which is about the generation and the characterization of regulatory plasma cells for the treatment of multiple sclerosis. So as you may know, B cells play a complex role in MS development. On one side, B cells have pathogenic functions because of their capacity to produce autoantibodies, because of their capacity to present antigen to T cells, and also because these cells are able to secrete pro-inflammatory cytokines. And on the other side, B cells also have protective function in MS, mainly because of the fact that the cells are able to produce anti-inflammatory cytokines, especially the immunosuppressive IL-10. And it is well recognized nowadays that the use of regulatory B cells for the treatment of MS may be a valuable strategy. However, there is some limitations, especially because uh, there is a lack of markers to identify natural regulatory B cells, and also because, again, there is a lack of signals to uniformly induce IL-10 expression in B cells. And to overcome this second limitation, we perform a high throughput screening of more than 40,000 chemical compounds to identify strong IL-10 inducers in B cells. And to make a very long story short, we identified one chemical compound, so N6, which is a very potent IL-10 inducer in mouse B cells because it was able to give rise to about 75% of IL-10 expressing B cells, whereas the DMSO vehicle control was able to give rise to only 25% of IL-10 expressing cells. And it is also very important to note that in parallel, we also identified some chemical compounds that were specifically active on human B cells. But here we only focus on our work with mice. So the next step was to set up some cell culture conditions to expand our B-regs. And we identified three different conditions, which just gave rise to different level of health and expression on B-cells. So one condition where we have no detectable IL-10 expression, one quite impressive conditions where we were able to reach about 95% of IL-10 expressing B-cells with the use of CPG and our molecule N6. And then you have one intermediate condition where we were able to get around 60% of IL-10 expressing cells with CPG and this DMSO vehicle control. So the next step was to test the efficacy of these cells, so in a mouse model of multiple sclerosis, so the EAE model, first in a prophylactic setting. So what we did, we just injected the cells one day before immunization with mock peptide. And here is a control, so in black, so which is a classical EAE curve. And it's quite easy to see that the cells generated with IL-4, BAF, or CPG and DMSO were totally ineffective at protecting the mice from EAE development. However, when we injected our cells generated with CPG and N6, those mice were almost fully protected from EAE development. Of course, we wanted to test these cells in a more challenging settings, so that's why we also tested these cells in semi and therapeutic settings. So again, in prophylactic setting, so these cells were almost fully protective. In a semi-therapeutic settings, when injected the cells at day 10, so just before the disease onset, again, the mice were almost fully protective, protected. Sorry. And what was quite striking is that a single administration of the cells so at day 17, close to the peak of the disease, was able to cure the mice within a few days very quickly. 
So demonstrating the powerful approach of our cells in driving EA remission. And to understand a bit more the mechanisms underlying this therapeutic effect, so we used regulatory B cells, which were deficient for key molecules, such as IFN, rendering these cells totally ineffective at uh, protecting the mice from EA development. However, when we tested MHC class two deficient B cells, so the cells were still protective suggesting that the therapeutic effect was independent from T cell. I mean, the activity of our cells was independent from T cell. Then we wanted to determine where our cells were going once injecting into the mice. So by using congenic markers, so we were able to track our cells. And very briefly, the cells were barely detectable in lymphoid organs, whereas the cells were easily found in the CNS of the mice, including the spinal cord and the brain. And interestingly, when looking at the phenotype of the cells, it seems that they became plasma cells since they are a B220 low expression and high level of CD138 expression. And even more interestingly, these cells continue to express IL-10 once infiltrating the CNS of the mice. And this is making quite a nice parallel to what was described in the brain of MS patients where they have shown that some IL-10 expressing plasma cells were found in active lesions, but unfortunately in very low numbers. I need to... Mm -hmm. So then we just uh, identified the target cells of our uh, therapeutic regulatory B cells to make it short, no effect at the level of T cells, and our therapy was able to downregulate some key inflammatory markers at the level of CNS-associated macrophages and macroglial cells. And we confirm that at the protein level by flow cytometry. I will ask you to conclude now, yeah. Okay, so this is the last slide. Yeah. So just to sum up what I presented to you, so we identified one chemical compound, which is a strong IL-10 inducer in B cells, which allowed us to generate an almost pure population of IL-10 expressing B cells with a stable IL-10 expression in vitro and in vivo migrating and persisting in the CNS of the mice with a plasma cell-like phenotype, having a stable IL-10 expression, able to drive EA remission because of targeting pathogenic macroglial cells and CNS-associated macrophages. And last slide is for Adam. Just okay. Up. okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank two, two, two quick questions. <clears throat> thank you for this very interesting no, presentation. Can can you say something about the specificity of this B-cell T2 transfer and also so how much, how many cells did you transfer to CDFA? It's CDFX? quite a lot of cells that we injected. It's 10 million cells for one mouse, but we need to titrate them, of course. But for the other question, the specificity of the cells, it seems that it's totally antigen independent because we are starting from polyclonal B-cells and it's MHC class two independent. So this therapeutic effect. But soon I will tell you more because we'll try to use some antigen-specific cells, such as n glycosyme specific B cells, to check if there is some therapeutic effect or not. Two short questions. Yeah. Is the N6 compound mm -hmm. specific for B cell, for inducing IL-10 in B cells or other cell types? No. It's also working on myeloid cells and T cells. And second question, do your B regs, IL-10 producing B regs, mm -hmm. penetrate the brain or spinal cord called parenchyma? or do they stay in the meninges or We don't know yet because phase? what we have done is just flow cytometry for the moment. We tried to just determine where are the cells by immunofluorescence, but we are not able to find the cells. You have a congenic marker though. Yeah, but we don't have the good antibodies yet. <laughs> okay, so I think we will stop here. Thank you very much. <laughs> and now Sita. Hello everyone, my name is Tita Shah. I'm a PhD student uh, in Nantes at the CR de TI, uh, under the supervision of Professor David Laplo, working on the Outcomes Project, which is using transcriptomics to unravel mechanisms behind a poor outcome in multiple sclerosis. So what we are working on is a categorization of MS in uh, aggressive or non-aggressive forms. 
so for, for this categorization, basically our non-aggressive MS patients are those who after um, their first inflammatory event and after two years will have uh, not presented any new flare lesions or relapses and will either have not needed any treatment or will have responded very well to first-line treatments. Now, on the other hand, what we consider to be aggressive MS is uh, for the patients who will have, during these two years, presented new flare lesions and relapses, and unfortunately will have had to have been switched to stronger second-line treatments. Currently, we cannot really uh, predict in which direction uh, the disease will evolve, so this is why we found that there is a real need for uh, predictive biomarkers at disease onset, uh, onset to uh, better anticipate how to treat patients. So the outcomes project was designed with this, <coughs> with this goal in mind. Uh, so for this uh, project, I uh, did a transcriptomic analysis using blood samples from CIS patients as well as a pool of healthy volunteers from which I isolated PBMCs and uh, performed single cell RNA sequencing, or more specifically, site sequencing. Uh, from this data set of PBMCs, I decided to uh, focus on T cells because these are really the main lymphocytes that infiltrate MS lesions in the brain. So here you can see on this, uh, on this UMAP representation, uh, the cells that are clustered. And I plotted gene expression to be able to annotate these clusters and help identify which populations uh, we were looking at. Now, I then looked at a distribution of these clusters uh, within our different groups. So if we compare, for example, all of our MS samples to our healthy volunteers, with uh, the volunteers being in the center and the MS patients on the outer rings, we can see for CD8 T cells, we only have one population that is increased in MS, and these are CD8 naive cells. But if we look at CD4 cells, we can see uh, populations of effector memory CD4 cells that are increased in MS. So this was uh, interesting because while naive cells are not as implicated uh, in the disease as memory or uh, effector memory cells, we do find that in general, it would appear that in per the periphery, the disease appears to be driven more by CD4 T cells. Now, we then looked at comparing solely aggressive MS patients to non-aggressive MS patients. And in this case, we have the non-aggressive in the middle and the aggressive on the outer ring. And here, we found no difference in uh, our CD4 T cell cluster distributions. However, we found uh, two clusters that are increased in CD8 T cells in the aggressive uh, MS patients, and these are NK T cells and effector memory NK-like CD8 T cells. Uh, so here, when we look at the severity of the disease, it would appear to be more driven by CD8 uh, effector memory T cells in periphery. Now, I focus more specifically on this cluster six, uh, and wanted to characterize uh, these cells. So looking at the different genes that are expressed by these cells, we can see that they are CD8 T cells that present uh, effector memory markers, as well as cytotoxic markers and NK markers, but without being NK cells or NK T cells because they do not express CD56. This was actually super exciting for our team because it just so happens that independently of this study, we also have a postdoc who has been working on a population of CD8 NK-like T cells. Uh, this is Emilie Dugas, who is here and has a poster if you want to see. And she has found that these cells are increased in MS uh, patients compared to healthy controls, uh, especially during relapse. And they, are, uh, they do have a clonal expansion, and they even infiltrate the central nervous system. So when I compared the markers expressed by the cells that she's working on to the ones that I found in my cluster six, uh, they're virtually the same markers. So this could mean that this population is present uh, throughout uh, most stages of the disease. Now, this is just transcriptomic data. So I still have to verify uh, this data at the protein level. So uh, I'm going to perform a flow cytometry experiment on a validation cohort of uh, CIS samples. 
uh, again sorted into aggressive and non-aggressive MS patients. And just to take home messages are that uh, uh, while it would appear that generally uh, the disease is more driven by CD4 memory T cells, we do find that aggressive MS would, is rather driven by a subset of CD8 plus cytotoxic effector memory cells that do resemble NK cells. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? Did you try to, I mean, so your findings suggest that you will be able to predict, you might be able to predict the, the, uh, the evolution of the, of, the, of the disease. That would so, be the aim. Yes, that's the objective. Did you try now to validate your, your, this first data uh, a posteriori on, on, on patients where you have a longitudinal uh, follow-up? I mean, I guess you have in your in your bank, uh, the, the, the samples to, to do it. So um, this study was performed on CIS samples, and we have information for at least up to two years. But some of these patients, we also have uh, some samples after a few years once they became uh, RRMS patients. And so those are uh, patients that we can also include in the validation cohort. So that would be very interesting to see, yes. Thank you. Other questions? This is your last word. <laughs> okay, no, thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, Youssef? So good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Yusuf El Touri. I'm a chemist in Strasbourg. And uh, today I will talk to you about a paper that we recently published. And it's about a new method to discriminate um, neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorder from relapsing remitting MS. And for that, we use a machine learning algorithm on some serum samples. So as you know, NMOSD and uh, relapsing remitting MS may share various clinical and radiological features. And the animal diagnosis relies mainly on the detection of the alpha-purine-4 antibody in the serum. However, in 20% of NMOSD patients, there are no alpha-purine antibodies in the serum, and some other patients are positive for another antibody, the anti-MOG antibody. What's important also is that the disability in NMOSD is a direct consequence of the relapse. Therefore, it is important to have a rapid and unambiguous diagnosis for those patients. So to tackle this problem, we decided to use a machine learning algorithm on uh, SARA samples from the patients. And we recorded the infrared spectra of those uh, SARA samples. So infrared spectroscopy studies the vibrations of molecules upon the interaction with infrared light. So it's a label-free technique. It's very sensitive, non-destructive, and requires only 2.5 microliters of sample. So when we record the spectrum, we see signals from proteins, urea, all of the molecules that are in the serum sample. So basically, this spectrum draws a holistic portrait of the sample, or if you want, a barcode of the sample. So in the cohort, we had 80 samples from healthy controls, 60 of animal patients, 60 from relapsing remitting patients, and 35 samples from CIDP patients. So we decided to use a random forest uh, classifier. So this um, random forest is consistent of 100 trees. So every decision tree looks at the sample and decides where to classify the sample. And by the end of the day, the 100 trees take a vote. And the voting, the majority vote, means we have a classification for this sample. So what we did, we took our data set, we split it into two subsets. First, we have a training set that we will present to the machine to learn on it. After the learning process is finished, we will present it with a validation set that was unknown, and we will ask it to guess what is the classification of the data that we have inside this validation set. 
So here we have the spectra and the second derivatives of all of the SERA samples. And here we have uh, the table where we have the confusion matrix of the model. So we can see that we have two uh, samples from the healthy controls that were misclassified as NMOSD. We have one, for example, of NMO that was misclassified as antigoctoral and so on. We can see also that we have a very high sensitivity and a very high specificity. When we look at the validation set, we have a perfect specification here. So we have 100% sensitivity and 100% specificity for those data sets. However, when we tried to classify the NMOSD patients according to their serial status, we failed. And we can see that we have a very high confusion We see that we have a very high confusion here. And uh, we can see also that we have, when we have the validation set, the specificity, specificity and the sensitivity are very low. So to conclude, I can, uh, could show you today that when we couple infrared spectroscopy to a random forest classifier, we can have an excellent distinction of relapsing remitting patients and animal patients. And this is, can be a fast and reliable and a cost-effective diagnostic tool that one could use um, in the clinic. And for that, we are working on developing a Java application that will allow the medical staff to use an infrared spectrometer to get uh, an easy diagnosis. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. You were quick, Thank you. <laughs> despite the technical problems. Any questions? Yes. So thanks a lot for presenting this data. So just a very quick question. Would you be able to differentiate anti-MOC from anti equo point four patients? I maybe didn't get the point. Among themselves? Yes, among themselves. No, we couldn't. Yeah, okay, so it could be, it re at least be related somehow to antibody-driven mechanisms that you see, or? From a medical point of view, I don't know, yeah. but we know that uh, we have, in both cases, antibodies, mm -hmm. so if one is low and the other one is high, the signature in the spectrum will fall on the same frequency. So this is maybe why we couldn't distinguish them. Okay, a very naive question, sorry about that, but... I've heard about uh, Raman spectroscopy for monitoring a um, number of s serum samples. What is the difference between the Raman uh, technology and what you propose? So what we propose is a direct interaction between infrared light, so it's fully non-invasive. We get a vibration spectrum. Raman is very complementary, but we start by using uh, visible light. So we use a laser that we have to shine on the sample. So there might be a little bit of destruction of the sample okay. with the Raman, but it's also very sensitive okay. technique. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, one more question. Yes. Yes, sure. So if I may, and if there is the time, uh, another question. How can, can you judge from your assessment also how close different diseases are? So are M MS and CIDP closer than, for example, a MOC or Equiporin and MS? You know, can you say anything about the relatedness of a disease mechanism? No, I cannot say anything about uh, the disease mechanism itself. What we look at is just uh, the serum sample and the biomolecules that are present in the sample. Well, that's clear, but just about the relatedness, you know, for example, that if you, if that's clear, that's for example, that's Okay, again, thank you very much for your presentation. And the last presentation, Mathilde. So let's move on epidemiology before lunch. And good morning. Thanks to the Asset Foundation for giving me the opportunity to present my postdoctoral fellowship on the association. 
uh, between education level and MS disability. So, um, some previous studies have analyzed the link between socioeconomic uh, status and MS disability uh, in different countries and uh, using either individual or contextual uh, uh, socioeconomic indicators. And all of these studies concluded that lower socioeconomic status was associated with higher risk of disability progression. So these studies may suffer from uh, reverse causation because um, socioeconomic uh, status indicators were measured after MS clinical onset. And one of the advantages of education level is that these indicators are stable over the lifespan and most of the time are reached uh, before MS onset. So the objective of this work was to study um, the association between education level and disability progression among MS patients. We included all um, patients from 18 selected offset centers with MS clinical onset uh, between 1960 and 2014. Uh, patients should be 25 years or older at MS onset and uh, patients with missing education level were excluded from the study. Education level was defined using a four category variable ranging from um, a low that coded for middle school or less to very high for master degree or doctoral degree. In the primary analysis, the time before reaching a six month confirmed and sentence uh, EDSS a score of four and six from MS clinical onset were studied. And in a secondary analysis, we focused on a binary outcome, namely the number of patients reaching DSS-4 within five years from uh, MS clinical onset. The time to event uh, outcomes were studied using Cox proportional hazard models, uh, adjusted for age at MS onset, MS onset period, and MS expert center, and stratified by MS phenotype and sex. And for binary outcome, we used uh, logistic regression models. Overall, 11,586 MS patients were included. It should be noted that 58% of patients were excluded due to missing uh, education level. Nevertheless, the two groups, so available versus missing, were not so different. 86% of patients had a relapsing onset MS with a sex ratio of around three and a mean age at onset of 35. And 14% 14, 14 of patients had a primary progressive MS with a sex ratio of 1 to 2 and a mean age of 44. Regarding patients with relapsing onset MS, higher was the level of education, lower was the risk of disability progression. And this was observed for both time to DSS-4 and to DSS-6, and among women and men. Regarding primary progressive MS, we found a reduction of 20% of the hazard of reaching DSS-4 for patients with high to very high level of education in comparison to patients uh, with um, a low to medium level of education, and for both women and men. And regarding DSS score of 6, a uh, reduction of 28% was observed for women, and result was not statistically significant uh, for men. When we stratified by MS period, we showed that in relapsing onset MS, the social gradient became stronger over time. And regarding primary progressive MS, results were not statistically significant. So the first part of our work show results in accordance with uh, previous studies using different methods. Youth of education level gives the opportunity to capture the level of knowledge, uh, the ability to communicate the, with health services and to receive health messages. And also uh, people with lower education level could have lower capaci capacity to um, obtain process and understand uh, health information and health information needed to make um, appropriate health decisions. One big limitation of this work was the high proportion of uh, missing data in level of education. And another limitation was the unmeasured confounders, such as uh, lifestyles and comorbidity, 
that could impact the link between education level and disability progression. And as perspective, the work will focus on the impact of education level on therapeutic practices. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for this presentation. Uh, questions? Yes, Anna. Um, I think this is interesting. But, uh, you're looking at the education level as being a, um, a cause of then poor health care. But I wondered whether actually the, your myelin um, might be perhaps genetically determined and that your, your white matter might make you vulnerable to then getting um, uh, diseases such as MS or in fact it's been suggested with vascular dementia for okay. example that it may not be what you hit in life but you may have a genetic factor that then makes you less likely to be educated and more likely to have yeah. MS. What do you think about that? Okay, I understood, and uh, what I think about that, it's a little bit difficult for me <laughs> because I can, I'm just, I'm just an epidemiologist and I don't know exactly, but I think I never think about that before. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think and um, make some bibliography about that. Thanks. Thank you, Paul. Uh, may I oppose to your comment? by seeing that the education is uh, always 20 years before you begin MS. So it would be the consequence. Oh, so what you mean is that the myelin would be defectuous if you have a poor education, but not that the uh, poor education is because the myelin. Roland. So very simple question. We define four levels of education and afterwards you merge them. Why is that? Uh, or do you have really a, a stepwise uh, uh, progress? I'm only merged that for the PPMS population because of um, some issues in the uh, analytical process. Uh, I, uh, pre uh, the data presents some um, uh, problem with the, uh, one of the uh, statistical assumptions, the proportional uh, hazard assumption in the Cox model. That is why I need to merge that to, to do something. Okay, maybe if I may, just one quick question. In terms of co confounders that you mentioned at the end, uh, will you try to get, you know, kind of rid of them? Mm. Uh, I'm thinking of, for example, smoking or other yeah. easy, easy defined. So I am waiting for the next um, uh, grant, uh, and I um, propose to work on about the modifiable factors uh, from the um, offset PhD uh, cohort and to uh, use uh, smoking, also obesity, uh, comorbidity, and all of that to understand uh, the, me the mediator factors on this link. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. So, the... <laughs> I just want to thank very much all the presenters, all the speakers on this session, because it was a, a very difficult exercise uh, to be very quick and, uh, and, and, and detailed anyway. So I just invite you to go and discuss further with them on the poster session. And I'm glad to announce that there will be a prize uh, tonight at the end of the meeting, a prize for the best short oral presentation. Okay, so we'll, of course, we'll, we'll see later on. So please stay until the end to know the, the results. Okay, so um, now it's time for the lunch break and poster session. We will get back together at, at 2.30.
T'as l'habitude Oh bah... Oui, hein <rire>
Et pourquoi je ne l'ai plus ici dans la session d'après. En fait, il doit prendre des choses. So good afternoon, everybody. So please take your seats. I think it's time to continue. Okay, now, so again, welcome to the first afternoon session. This is now the session on immunology. And uh, I think one of the interesting things in MS is really to then in the end combine neurobiology and immunology and let's see how far we come with uh, yeah, respect to that goal today. So and it's now my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker today. Um, it is Dorn Merkler from Geneva. He is an immunologist and neuropathologist, so has both, both expertise in human pathology, in experimental pathology, and in experimental virology and immunology. And so, Dorn, we're very much looking forward to your presentation, how you combine the neurobiological and immunological aspects of MS. The floor is yours. 
Thanks a lot of raising the expectation so much. <laughs> I, I thank, first of all, the organizer of having me here. It's really a great pleasure to be here and also to see really the different angles of the, uh, how, how MS, also research in MS is done here. Um, maybe let me just start saying I think uh, we are all clear that in last 30 years, a lot of experimental but also clinical studies have provided compelling uh, insights into the pathophysiology of MS lesion formation. And the current view is that as different players of the adaptive immune system mostly, uh, comprising of different subsets of T cells and B cells that are eventually recruited to the central nervous system and then will uh, precipitate a lesion what we will end up in the classical morphology or a classical picture of a demyelinating lesions, as we can see in multiple sclerosis. But let me start from the immunological point uh, of view and also to introduce the other speaker from this session. Uh, what is actually needed to activate T cells, uh, in this case, autoactive T cells um, uh, in MS? So uh, what we all learn from students' courses, T cells, naive T cells, need to uh, recognize the cognate antigen first in the secondary lymphoid organs, and they need to do this in a, uh, by receiving several uh, stimuli, also co-stimulation sig uh, signals in addition to TCR stimulation, and also this in a microenvironment which uh, is pro-inflammatory uh, by, made it by several cytokines. And only in these conditions, autoactive T cells or T cells in general are able to breach the uh, peripheral um, tolerance mechanism in place. Now, we have also learned in the last decades that this activation is tightly controlled uh, by uh, numerous uh, co-stimulatory and co-inhibitory molecules. Many of these have been mostly studied also in the context of tumor immunology con context, the most famous one, PD-1 or CTLA-4, that are all here in place to check that the immune system is only activated when it's needed that promote or inhibit T cell activation and proliferation and for sure also uh, maintain immune homeostasis. And one of these um, molecules, which is also investigated by one of the next, of the next speaker, is the BNT lymphocyte retinator, BTLA, which is structurally related to PD-1 and uh, CTLA-4 uh, and is actually um, uh, inhibitory receptor, which is expressed on a wide range of uh, hematopoietic uh, cells, including uh, T and B cells. And here, again, as for the other uh, uh, inhibitory receptor, it has been also described mostly in tumor infl uh, infl uh, infiltrating lymphocytes and have also been associated with impaired uh, tumor uh, immune response in this context. Not only in this context, but also in other uh, co contexts like uh, infection, sepsis, this expression of these uh, molecules, BTLA, is associated with the severity um, of the sepsis. And of course, also in the context of MS, um, a little bit less is known in autoimmune disease conditions, but there are some reports here who described that there is a, a reduced expression in MS and, and uh, systemic lupus erythematosus also in autoimmune disease condition. And I think the next speaker will hear a little bit explain, or hopefully according to the abstract, what could be the implication of this um, BTLA in the forming encephalogenic potential of T cells in autoimmune disease condition. Now, given that such T cells at a given moment are activated, they expand from secondary lymphoid organs, and then they will re uh, circulate to reach the target organ. Uh, here they also, before they enter the target organs, they have to go through different uh, steps of, um, before they can enter it. And in case of the CNS, uh, they will eventually protect the central nervous system from infection, or in general, they are involved in C, uh, CNS immune surveillance. And in case of uh, MS, they will probably uh, um, launch the, 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 the lesion in the CNS. Now, in particular for the central nervous system, you all know that these immune cells, let's take T cells, they have to pass or to go through uh, particular barriers, the blood brain barrier or the blood C uh, CSF barrier, which is uh, composed of uh, several layers of cells, so including uh, endothelial cells connected with tight junction, surrounded by uh, pericytes and basal membrane, 
and for sure also the end feed of astrocytes that all form together uh, this BBB. And of course, this tightly controls the access of immune cells in the central nervous system. And here, again, astrocytes are probably very important in controlling the tightness of the blood-brain barrier uh, permeability. And there are different factors which are um, secreted by the astrocytes that are involved in disruption uh, of this blood-brain barrier, like VEGF, NO, glutamate, etc., or in the contrary, can help to maintain or restore the integrity of the, this blood-brain barrier. And here, there is a signaling pathway, which has been also described recently, not signaling pathway, which has been described also uh, that shape or regulates associate morphology under inflammatory condition. Notch signaling is classically dis, um, described or in, in angiogenesis, uh, causing endothelial cell to adopt the stalk, uh, uh, the stalk cell fate. Uh, and it would be interesting to see, uh, I think, in this second presentation, what this notch pathway uh, is doing in modulating the BBB uh, permeability. So I would like also to, um, let's say, um, remind you what happens with such a T cell response. Classically, T cells, when they encounter the antigen in context of infection, for instance, they will expand and they will then contract and give rise eventually to so what we refer to so-called memory T cells. And here we have learned in recent years, and here I'm mostly focusing on CD8 T cells, which uh, have been implicated also in MS pathogenesis. They can be distinguished in, uh, based on the pattern and migratory behavior in uh, central memory T cells that are residing mostly in secondary lymphoid organs, or effective memory T cells that is what we actually measure in the blood mostly, uh, that can uh, also access transiently the peripheral tissue, uh, patrolling it transiently and come back. And then there is a third subgroup which has uh, gained attention in the uh, last uh, years, which is referred to so-called resident memory T cells. And here I would like also to emphasize the rest of my talk a little bit on this part, which we also focused on investigating it. What could be this the role uh, in CNS inflammation and potentially also in multiple sclerosis? And these resident memory T cells, they are generated classically at different border organs, including the central nervous system, and they persist and reside at places of previous transient infection. They are not circulating, so they are in disequilibrium. Once they are in this peripheral organ, they show a self-renewing potential, and they can transform in rapidly in effector uh, cells when needed in protective immunity. But the question is, what could these cells play a role in a multiple sclerosis. Here there have been several studies, and this also emphasizes um, yeah, the need to study also autopsies and to see what is really going on in the central nervous system, not only in the circulation, um, that such cells that uh, show prototypic marker um, in such lesions that are characterized by sustained expression of CD69 and in part CD103, what is suggested by this finding is that at a given point, these inflammatory processes can be compartmentalized in the central nervous system, meaning, again, disconnected to what's going on in circulation. They have been described morphologically on the, uh, on the immune phenotype to, to occur also um, in yeah, multiple sclerosis of white matter lesions as uh, in this study here. This is not only restricted to MS, but to other chronic inflammatory diseases, also a recent study on Roland Libros group have investigated in model and also in human autoimmune encephalitis that such cells with a TRM phenotype can be found in such uh, inflammatory processes that attack in this case probably uh, neurons. Also in MS it has been described that such TRM in the CSF or TRM-like cells one have to say can be found in early stages of multiple sclerosis in twin studies in which um, such cells with such a phenotype could be found to have an activated phenotype and correlated with the early onset of uh, patients in multiple sclerosis. So we have also investigated a little bit the presence of this TRM in uh, MS and uh, other inflammatory diseases. So we, what we did here at the beginning is we wondered on the ask why this TRM, the relative presentation of this TRM is um, uh, set or can be, let's say, analyzed based on the lesion stage uh, you find in MS uh, 
biopsies or autopsies. So in what we noted here, just to look at this pie chart, at the yellow part of it, that at the beginning of such or early stages of MS lesions, we can find already uh, cells with a TRM phenotype. But what was more striking to see is that this even more accumulated relatively to other uh, T cell um, uh, in chronic active lesions. So these lesions which were, have been introduced this morning already with this active rim or even more uh, uh, seen more frequently in progressive MS state. So suggesting that maybe these cells becomes even more important in a situation where the uh, disease progresses and become less accessible for immunomodulatory treatment that target the circulating pool. Just as a side remark, we found also TRM in NMO or uh, neuromyelitis optica spectrum disease um, conditions. We know that this is mostly aquaporin uh, for associated disease. We believe that this TRM here could or might play a role in opening the blood brain barrier that these antibodies could have access to the CNS. Strikingly different, the situation in ADEM, a monophasic disease, acute disease, there we can only barely or rarely see this TRM, suggesting that depending on the chronicity of the disease and the disease type, this, the role of this TRM can be different. We wondered also in a model system a little bit whether we can see what is, could be the role of um, TRM in driving or triggering a compartmentalized immune response in the central nervous system. And without going into detail of the model, uh, what we have done here is a model that allows us open establishment of TRM to reactivate the cells by re-expression of the cognate antigen in glial cells of the central nervous system. So what we are doing here is we infect mice with an attenuated virus. The virus is cleared within one week in a clinical silent manner. This is the LCMV variant. Uh, and this re results in um, TRM in the CNS, establishment of brain TRM, the animals are healthy, they don't have any problems. What we did then, we treated the animals with tamoxifen that induced the uh, re-expression, cognate re-expression of the antigen in glial cells, in astrocytes in this case, which without any further inflammatory stimuli. And what we already noted there is when we looked at these um, cells, which are specific for the cognate antigen, we found that these cells locally expanded in the CNS, uh, open tamoxifen treatment in the transgenic condition. And this was furthermore accompanied by the notion that these cells started to drop uh, locomotor performance, so they started to get sick when they harbored brain TRM. What was important to note here is also that this inflammation and disease precipitation could be completely disconnected from the circulating pool of CD8 T cells. So when we depleted the circulating pool in animals that harbored uh, TRM and treated them with tamoxifen, these animals developed disease irrespectively of whether they had circulating uh, CD8 T cells or not. So only the activation of TRM in the CNS was, was sufficient to precipitate disease. And furthermore, we could also uh, repeat this, so we could uh, treat them with tamoxifen, await them that they recover, and even then did the second treatment with tamoxifen induce relapses. So this model could illustrate that in a certain condition, once, this T once the TRMs are established, they can actually propagate the inflammatory response in the CNS that are not anymore relying on the circulating pool of effector memory T cells, at least of CD8 T cells. So by this, I would like just to sum up what we think that this TRM, they are established during life uh, in different border organs, post potentially after viral infection, and the uh, classical role is actually to protect the peripheral organs, and they do this in a very efficient manner. So they can uh, create what we refer to an autonomic, autonomous cytotoxic barrier to actually what they are supposed to do to reinfection. What we also have seen in previous studies is that when these TRM are created in the CNS and they reside in particular niches in a certain critical period of life, or maybe this is the time to stop here, then they can also create what we refer to a fertile field. What, what does it mean is that this TRM can sustainably express chemokines, including CCL5, that uh, are, are uh, able to attract autoactive T cells uh, into the CNS and which, which then also um, form lesions. So it will help, or in the model at least, it showed that such connection between 
previous viral infection and precipitation of autoimmune lesions at the sites of previous infection. And what we also uh, could investigate here in the model uh, is that actually these T cells can also locally be activated and become very rapidly a factor in the model uh, against astrocytes, but also against neurons and presumably also against oligodendrocytes. We think that this is a potential mechanism, or one can discuss uh, that this is a mechanism that uh, such inflammatory process can be uh, driven at a given point uh, dis to become disconnected from the circulation. For us, and I think also for the field, what I think is now very important to understand, and pro potentially also for MS treatment, is, uh, is to understand what are actually the cues that allows this TRM to be established and to be maintained in these niches in the CNS. And actually, what would be also interesting to see whether this TRM, which are difficult pharmacologically to target, how this could be used to potentially uh, interfere with compartmentalized inflammatory responses of the central nervous system. So with this, I would like just to thank the people, oh, twice the same person, there should be another person here, this is an error, sorry for that. <laughs> <laughs> it is Elena Vincenti, this is the uh, postdoc which did uh, uh, the, the, the most study of, um, in, in the animal work which I presented and all, all my collaborators, and I thank you for your attention and looking forward for your questions. CCL5 by tissue resident memory cells. It's interesting to note that many neurons express the receptor, CCR5, and those neurons are involved in memory. There was a, a paper in Nature last week on this topic. I was wondering whether the accumulation of tissue resident memory T cell could impair somehow cognition in mice. Um, this is a very, very, very good uh, question, and I think there is um, Robin Klein, uh, she saw, had a study in Nature Neuroscience, I think, three years ago. It was indirect evidence, but if one reads between the lines, she's, she suggests that this TRM could help to activate, let's say, or chronically activate also uh, surrounding cells, including uh, microglia phagocytes, that uh, could uh, let's say, impact the integrity of neurons. If it, that memory, you mean, you don't mean immunological memory, you mean memory, <laughs> so cognitive, uh, cognitive uh, memory. So that this uh, TRM somehow, uh, or this, this was, let's say, my interpretation, she did not put it so far, uh, so far but when one could read or could interpret between the lines that this TRM could actually chronically activate uh, microglia, and then that will strip off the synapses uh, of the, of the neurons which uh, w went along with uh, cognitive decline. Doran, uh, how would you explain that uh, on, on your cells you have CD69 that is normally an early T cell activation antigen? Yeah, this is a, this is a, it belongs to the, this is a phenomenon which all TRM share. This is something which is constitutively expressed by the by TRM and belongs actually to the core signature. This TRM don't see the antigen when the steady state. This, but they do express CD69. Open their also open reactivation of the TRM, also open um, re-expression of the coconut antigen. They even increase the CD69 expression. But this is uh, something which belongs to the core signature described. Um, of these cells and is also going along with the down regulation of S1P1 R1, which uh, prevents the aggress of the cells in the CNS or in the target organ or in the secondary lymphoid organ. Okay. And uh, do you find other uh, uh, T cell activation antigens like CD25, uh, transferrin receptor, uh, things like that? Also in the steady state, not, okay. not to my knowledge, but uh, open, open reactivation, you can of course see that. Thank you. 
maybe if you allow a question yeah. from my side, if you reactivate these TRMs uh, in the tissue, are they then able to recruit CD4s and monocytes from the periphery, or is yeah. it a microglia issue no, no, then? No, no, this is, uh, as I could not show this, I mean, it's absolutely essential that they recruit CD4 T cells, and they do this in our model mostly from the peripheral, and I think in your model as well. Um, and these T cells, CD4 T cells, they are very important for the TRM because once they are reactivated, somehow this TRM, they provide also a niche that helps to differentiate these uh, CD8 T cells to become very good effector uh, T cells to kill the target cells. So without this CD4 re recruitment, these cells can be reactivated, but they are not as good in killing. So they, there's an interplay. I did not show this, I just showed it in the last uh, image as a summary, but I. Uh, one role of TRM in, the, let's say, in protective immunity is to alert the tissue, but also to help to recruit circulating cells, including CD4 T cells, but also other monocytes, drive cells into the tissue. Are they an important population in the meninges? Probably really relating to the issue in the morning. Also, in our model, we can find TRM associated to the meninges. I did not uh, in the model, you know, that we don't have the sec uh, tertiary structure, we did not observe this, I would say there are some um, open activation, you find them as well there, right? I would not say there's, this is a special niche now for the TRM. We see it rather in the perivascular space, in the parenchyma itself, mm -hmm. but I, maybe there are some few there. Mm -hmm. So further urgent questions? So. If this is not the case, then thanks a lot again, Doran, and we continue. We continue with the next speaker and the next presentation, which is Renaud de Souren from Toulouse, and he's, uh, as announced by Doran, going to talk about signaling modulation by uh, the checkpoint BTLA. So very much looking forward to your presentation. Uh, hi, everybody. It's a pleasure to be invited to this Congress. Uh, I have to say that I'm a little bit impressed because I'm not coming directly from the field of uh, MS, coming from the field of T cell development and signaling. So I would like first to apologize for all the potential mistakes that we say and for maybe some uh, over simplistic overview of uh, this pathology. Uh, I would like also to thank, of course, our, our SEP for inviting me and Doron for, uh, for the kind introduction about BTLA, which must have been hard because there's nothing, there's not much known about this uh, molecule. So, um, sorry. So, as you know, um, um, one very key step in the initiation of uh, multiple sclerosis is the recognition of the peptides that are derived from a myelin-associated glycoprotein and which are recognized by the T cell receptor which can uh, trigger signal, TCR signals, which lead to cytokine release, uh, novel inflammation in the central nervous system, and to ultimately neurological damage. So in addition uh, of being controlled by the T cell receptor, the uh, ability uh, of T cell to self-react is also dependent on uh, inhibitory receptors which are uh, uh, called immune checkpoints, and which have the ability to negatively regulate TCR signals and therefore to dampen uh, the inflammatory response induced by T cells. So immune checkpoints are very important in the context of uh, autoimmunity because first they enhance the threshold of self-reactivity, and second they reduce the magnitude of inflammatory uh, responses. And the role of immune checkpoints in um, uh, CNS inflammatory disease is revealed in the context of therapy based on antagonist antibody, which aim to block those receptors in the context of cancer to promote uh, better tumor control. So whereas uh, um, using the use of those antibody restore um, um, 
efficient TCR signal and inflammatory response and better tumor control. They also induce immune-related adverse events, uh, which include a sign of higher susceptibility to multiple sclerosis. So this observation raised the idea that one potential um, therapeutic uh, in the context of autoimmune disease, but in MS also, would be to stimulate those inhibitory receptors to uh, decrease uh, self-reactive responses. So to stimulate the signaling of those receptors, we need to know uh, how the signaling works for those many receptors. And there's a lot of, uh, uh, of, uh, of things that are unknown there. And one very puzzling observation is that many immune checkpoints are uh, upregulated very, very early after activation. And in fact, despite those uh, receptor, inhibitory receptor, they're so uh, very frequently referred as activation markers. Okay. Uh, so one question that rises from this observation is why T cell remain able to promote an effective immune response despite the high expression level of those inhibitory receptors. How come these cells can continue to differentiate into effector cells and promote uh, inflammation in context of, of those pathologies? So we made the hypothesis that maybe there are some possible regu regulatory mechanisms in T cells that prevent those receptors from being operative. And maybe those mechanisms also are important in the susceptibility to MS. So to address this question, we focus on two uh, immune checkpoints, the well-known receptor uh, PD-1, and a closely related receptor to PD-1, which is BTLA. Uh, and those two receptors were shown to be important uh, in CNS autoimmunity in mouse model of uh, multiple sclerosis. So PD-1, and BTLA uh, operate by recruiting those two tyrosine phosphatases. PD-1 recruits this phosphatase called SHIP2, uh, and BTLA recruits this phosphatase called SHIP1. And those two phosphatases negatively regulate signal triggered by the TCR and by co costimulatory molecule. And those regulation, sorry, decrease the encephalogenic response of T cells in the context of, uh, of uh, mouse model of MS. So we worked for many years on a signaling protein that we contributed to characterize, which we named TEMIS. And TEMIS promotes TCR signal by blocking the function, uh, the catalytic function of those uh, two uh, phosphatases. In fact, TEMIS operates by promoting the oxidation of the catalytic system of, uh, of uh, SHIP1 and SHIP2. And TEMIS has a very strong effect on SHIP1 and a relatively mild effect on SHIP2. So the hypothesis we have is could TEMIS simply operate as a break or as a repressor of those two uh, immune checkpoints? And does this mechanism is important in the susceptibility to, uh, to a CNS autoimmunity? So add to address this question, uh, we uh, generate mouse, two mouse models, one uh, that is deficient for TEMIS exclusively in peripheral T cell because TEMIS is very important for T cell development and we didn't want to have an interference of the effect on T-cell development, and one model where TEMIS is overexpressed in the T-cell lineage. And after, we start by a very simple in vitro experiment where we took naive CD4 T-cells from Y-type knockout and transgenic mice that we stimulate with anti-TCR antibody in the presence of either anti-BTLA agonist antibody to stimulate the, the inhibitory receptor or pdl one ligand. And since we showed before that TEMIS is highly expressed in TH1 cell as opposed to other effector subsets, we also polarized those cells in TH1 condition and analyzed the production of interferon gamma and TBET, a uh, major transcription factor of TH1. So we stimulate initially the cells in suboptimal condition, meaning we use very low dose of BTLA agonist antibody antibodies because we wanted to reveal a uh, um, you know, potential exacerbatory effect in the absence of TEMIS. So you see in wild type, you see basically no effect when you add agonist antibody for the BTLA. And when we look in the no TEMIS knockout, we found a very strong ability of BTLA to repress the production of interferon gamma. And we observe the same when we look at uh, Tibet expression. Then this was not due to an effect on BTLA expression. BTLA expression was perfectly fine. Uh, now we overexpress TEMIS and we use supraoptimal condition by increasing the amount of BTLA agonist antibody. 
And we found, so you see in the wild type, you have this nice inhibition of interferon gamma production in Th1 cells, and in transgenic, you lose the ability of BTLA to, to repress uh, interferon gamma production. This was not specific of CD40 cells, because when you look in CD8, you see the same effect when you delete Temis, you become able to repress interferon gamma production as compared to what you observe in the wild type. Now we looked at PD-1 inhibition, and what we found is that apparently the effect of TEMIS is specific of BTLA, because when you repress uh, the production of interferon gamma in CD8 T cell by engaging PD-1, the absence of TEMIS doesn't seem to modify the ability of PD-1 to, to repress T cell activation. And this is the same when you look in the context of the overexpression of TEMIS, you see that the overexpression doesn't prevent PD-1 to repress T cell activity. So all of this suggests that TEMIS is able to block BTLA, VTLA, and specifically BTLA. And we tried to look at the mechanism by which it operates, and we looked whether, uh, as shown in thymocyte, TEMIS was able to enhance the, the oxidation of the catalytic cysteine, and it's what we found. When you look, when you treat cells with uh, uh, H2O2, which induce the oxidation of, of uh, SHIP1, you see that you can induce this oxidation, which represents, in fact, the inhibition of the, of, the, of the phosphatase, and you don't induce this oxidation in the, in the knockout. So then we wanted to see whether all this mechanism was important in the, in the susceptibility to a central nervous system immunity. So we use our model, and, and the model, the well-known model of uh, experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis to mimic our uh, mouse model of MS. And we treat Temis uh, wild type and knockout mice with the encephalitogenic peptide uh, mug. And we analyzed the, the clinical score. And what we found is that uh, in the Temis deficient mice, we have a reduced susceptibility to a uh, clinical severity of EAE. This is associated with a reduced incidence on topatology. And to more directly address whether Temis was important to control the encephalitogenic potential of T cells, we crossed the TEMIS wild type and knockout mice with the transgenic mice expressing the 2D2 TCR, which specifically recognized the MOG peptide. And we uh, injected those uh, naive uh, cells into black six mice, and we immunized with a, with a MOG peptide. Again, in this context, we found that in the absence of TEMIS, we have a reduced uh, encephalitis uh, disease that developed with a reduced incidence, suggesting that TEMIS is uh, uh, promoting stimulating the encephalitogenic potential of, of uh, 2D2 uh, expressing uh, CD4 T cells. We look at the production of cytokine and recapitulating a little bit what we found in, in, uh, in vitro, we found uh, we stimulate the cells with MUG, uh, we re-stimulate the cells after inducing the, the EA, and we found a decrease of interferon gamma production in the absence of TEMIS, which seems to be relatively specific because we observe only a very mild decrease of GMCSF and no effect on the IL-17 production. So there seems uh, um, that TEMIS promotes some kind of type 1 neuroinflammatory response, and this is also confirmed when you look at the expression of uh, Tibet and Rohr gamma T, where we see in the absence of TEMIS a decrease of uh, Tibet expression in CD4 T cell expressing the 2D2 TCR, but no effect on the uh, Rohr gamma T. So altogether, this suggests and it, uh, that TEMIS promote this TH1, type 1 encephalitogenic response, presumably by blocking this inhibitory receptor, which is important uh, to control the pathology. And this is an ongoing project, you see, because we are now crossing these, those TEMIS T knockout mice with BTLA knockout mice to see whether the absence of BTLA can restore uh, the effect of TEMIS on CNS uh, autoimmunity. So finally, we wanted to try to put ourselves in a, in a kind of a therapeutic context. And, sorry again. Okay. okay. And we uh, analyzed whether we could use an anti-BTLA agonist antibody to have a therapeutic effect in this and to, to reduce the disease in those uh, mouse model. And when we ask the question whether the absence of TEMIS or its overexpression could uh, modulate, sorry, can modulate the efficiency, the therapeutic efficiency of those uh, treatments. So we used again this uh, EAE mouse model, 
and we induce the disease uh, in the presence, in the absence, or in the presence of those agonist anti-BTLA antibody, and you see that the use of those antibody reduce the, the, the severity of the, of the disease. So then we ask the question, what happened in the absence of TEMIS? So uh, what we see uh, expectedly is that the disease is reduced when you take out TEMIS, that's what I showed you before. But surprisingly, we were expecting to have a very high potential of uh, inhibitory response of BTLA, and we see that adding this antibody doesn't have any effect on the, the severity of the disease. So one hypothesis, hypothesis to explain that is that the anti-BTLA agonist antibody has no effect because in the absence of TEMIS, maybe BTLA is already at the maximum of its inhibitory potentiality because, the, because the TEMIS was uh, taken up from the, from the loop. So now we ask whether when we overexpress TEMIS, can we block the effect of those uh, anti-BTLA agonist antibody? And do we reduce treatment efficiency? And in fact, in this case, that's what we observe when you treat with the antibody in the wild type group, you have a reduced uh, disease severity, and when you do the same uh, in the context where TEMIS is overexpressed, you see that the antibody doesn't uh, reduce uh, the efficiency of treatment. So all together, and to conclude, um, I think one of the very important findings of this study is that the, the ability of immune checkpoint to, to repress T cell activation, and this goes beyond the a spectrum of, uh, of um, autoimmune pathology, but goes also in cancer, is not only dependent on the expression level of the receptor or of the presence of ligand, it's also dependent on the signaling threshold of those receptors, which is dependent on intracellular protein. I, I think there's a potentiality for entire study to, uh, for many receptors to, to look at that more closely. Uh, this study showed, therefore, that Temis promote uh, type 1 neuroinflammatory responses by blocking the signaling function of this receptor uh, BTLA. That the use of anti-BTLA agonist antibody can have therapeutic effect in those uh, mouse models of MS, and that the expression of TEMIS uh, and the expression level of, of TEMIS can influence the therapeutic effect of uh, BTLA agonist antibody. And this can be, of course, interesting and would be nice to uh, uh, now um, have a more uh, um, translation research to look whether this could apply to, to human T cells. So I just would like to uh, thank uh, the people of the lab, mostly uh, the three persons that work on this project, Suzanne, Melik, Suzyang, that is not on this picture, and Aurélie Vadel. And also thank a lot uh, Abdel Adi uh, Saudi and Rémi uh, in our institute with, uh, with, uh, who helped us with the uh, EA model. And I would like to, to thank, of course, ARCEP, which were which was very generous with us uh, during the past year and, and uh, funded uh, those research. Thank you. So thanks a lot, Renaud, for sharing this fascinating set of data. So I'm sure there are questions from the audience. Congratulations. Uh, is TEMIS constitutive in T cells? Constitutively expressed? Yes. It, it, it is to different levels. So it's, uh, it depends on the cell type. It's uh, very high in thymocytes, very low in Treg, high in Th1, as I show you, more expressed in CD8, in CD4. And I think um, this is very typical of molecules that regulate TCR signal. You know, you have all this molecules that are absolutely required to transmit the signal, and you have a bunch of molecules that are tuning the signal and up and down. And those molecules are generally a variable level of expression in subset because they're tuning the response in, in those subset depending on the immune context. Okay, and you showed us that TEMIS is, uh, is active on CHIP1, uh, uh, that is regulating uh, BTLA uh, function. Mm -hmm and not on, on SHIP2, uh, under uh, PD-1. Uh, do we know uh, other immune checkpoints uh, regulated by SHIP-1? Uh, yes, there's a few. Uh, there's, uh, I can cite the name, there's layer one or ILT2 also. There's a few, but there's also many immune checkpoints that work independently of those phosphatases, like uh, uh, team 3 LAC3, so there are many different 
Initially, it was, they were all considered to work on the similar mechanism based on the immuno ET motif, you know, which is the counterpart of uh, mm -hmm. ETAM. But now it appear, appear to be way more complex than that. So there's three or four immune checkpoints, including PD-1 and BTLA that work so, on And that will be my last question. So who is regulating PD-1? Sorry? Who is regulating PD-1? So you showed us that Temis is acting on BTLA. Yeah. And uh, is there the same uh, mechanism nothing for is known. Nothing is known so far. What is known is that there's an extracellular process upon T cell activation. I think it was a science paper uh, by one of the students of Anjou that showed that some molecule, uh, I forget which is B71, binds to PD1 to prevent PD1 to interact with PD1 mm -hmm. at various steps. I think there must be some inhibitory mechanism, you know, early or, or in specific context that prevent those receptors from operating. For PD-1, it's an extracellular mechanism, and it's not known whether there's a similar uh, mechanism as uh, the one we described for BTLA. Okay, there's a question in the back. Um, hello. Um, since you said that Temis is involved in the regulation uh, of TCR signaling and that uh, the signaling is involved in uh, T cell differentiation state and especially in TFH, uh, have you looked at the uh, frequency of TFH and also uh, immune cells related to T cells as uh, B cells, as example, in your mice with uh, Temis debated? No, so to TFH, I think it would be very interesting, particularly that BTLA is very highly expressed in TFH. There's a paper that just came out with the conditional BTLA knockout mice that showed that it's very important in TFH. We haven't looked in the, in the TEMIS model. We did one experiment, but it was not, uh, I think it would, be, it would be need to require to push it a little bit. Uh, B cells, we haven't looked. TEMIS is very, very restricted to the T cell lineage. So there's a TEMIS 2. Uh, expressed in B cells, but uh, nothing as much has been done there. So yeah, we could but, have uh, an indirect effect, but we haven't looked at that. Since uh, since uh, T cells may be important in B cell amplification, yeah, yeah. It could, there could be an indirect there effect. effect of T or of through B. Or yeah. Or no, we haven't looked at that very closely. So I think there could be more questions, but for the sake of time, I think we okay. finish. And thanks ag Thank again you. a lot for your presentation and for the discussion okay. and yes thank you, thank you. I'm doing then is a for you next I'm not sure how to and last it. speaker of our immunology uh, session uh, i'm calling condice chapuy from bordeaux she's going to use the same presentation no? <laughs> and uh, uh, Condice is going to talk um, about notch signaling at the glia limitans and uh, telling us whether this drives astrocyte reactivity during neuroinflammation. So welcome here and uh, we look very much looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. So first uh, I would like to thank the organization for the invitation. So um, I'm going to talk about Delta Lake 4 and how it can act at the glia limitans in uh, neuroinflammation. So very briefly, multiple sclerosis is an autoimmune disease that's going to attack the myelin sheets of neurons. And um, this disease and this attack is due to the infiltration of plasmatic proteins and uh, inflammatory cells into the parenchyma. And um, this infiltrate to come from the periphery into the parenchyma, they need to cross what we call the uh, neurovascular unit. So they come from the periphery and they're gonna have to cross this structure here just to enter the parenchyma and act um, on the neurons. So this neurovascular unit, uh, it's a very complex structure. So you have uh, two barriers. The first one is the endothelial barriers, barrier, sorry, uh, with associated parasites. So this is what we call uh, the blood-brain barrier. And um, in MS, uh, this barrier is permeable. And uh, therefore, the inflammatory T cell and cells are going to enter the perivascular space here. And then a secondary barrier is going to um, um, impact the trafficking of uh, 
uh, inflammatory cells. And this secondary barrier is composed of astrocytic enfit here. So this is a topic of uh, my group. So astrocytes are very, very abundant glial cells into the central, central nervous system. So in a normal individual, healthy individual, uh, they are usually quiescent, but uh, if a stress happens, so it, it can be a cytokinic stress, for example, these astrocytes are going to undergo um, um, changes. But it can be uh, morphological changes, so you can have hyperplasia of the stroma and the production of cytoplasmic uh, processes, but it's also a change in the secretum, so molecular changes. So these molecular changes, um, they can be very different depending on the population of astrocytes. So we are um, usually talking about a graded continuum of intensity in the, the changes that impact astrocytes. And uh, therefore, uh, we can't talk about one population of astrocytes that are reactive. We're going to talk about different um, population of astrocytes um, that can be either harmful during MS or protective. So in the lab, we are capable of reproducing this uh, reactivity very artificially. So we are culturing uh, primary human astrocytes, and we're treating these cells with IL-1 beta, which is a cytokine that is uh, pro-inflammatory. And as you can see, we can obtain uh, uh, astrocytic reactivity. So you have this hyperplasia of the stroma and uh, processes that are produced. So on these uh, cells and control cells, we realized the uh, RNA sequencing. And um, we observed that several genes were modulated, but one was very highly uh, upregulated, and it's delta like 4 in reactive astrocytes. So we verified um, by qPCR that we got the same results in the same culture, but also at the protein level. And so you can see that we have an upregulation of uh, delta like 4 uh, when we are inducing reactivity in uh, primary human astrocytes. So delta like 4 it's uh, one of the ligands of the notch pathway. So the notch pathway, uh, very simply, <laughs> it's, uh, so you have a ligand, delta, that's going to um, interact with its receptor notch. And uh, this interaction is going to lead to uh, cleavage. So you have a first cleavage of the extracellular domain of the receptor, and then a secondary cleavage that is going to release the intracellular domain of notch 1, or notch. And this is this uh, intracellular domain that is um, a reflection of the activation of the pathway. So NYCD is capable of translocating into the nucleus, and it's going to regulate uh, target genes such as S and A, for example. So what I want you to remember is that NYCD, but also S and A, are a reflection of the activity of the notch pathway for the rest of the talk. So our first objective was to confirm that we have um, the same expression of DLL4 in vivo. So to do so, uh, we induce uh, EAE in black cis mice, so adult black cis mice, and uh, we score the mice, uh, so you know that the score is going from 0 to 5, depending on the degree of paralysis um, that we observe in the animals. And so on these animals, when they reached uh, the plateau of the disease, we harvested the neurovascular unit. So uh, then we realized PCR and we measured the expression of DL4. And you can see that uh, in the neurovascular unit isolated from the, the animals that are induced by EAE, we have a, an increased expression of DL4 when compared to the group treated with the placebo. And uh, we also have uh, an upregulation of A, uh, which is um, uh, a reflection of the activity of the notch pathway. So when we looked at uh, spinal cord sections from these animals, we observed that we have a co-localization of a marker of astrocytic reactivity, GFAP, and the DLL4. So we have expression by reactive astrocytes of DLL4 uh, in a model of MS. We also uh, have some uh, samples from MS patients, so it's um, cortical lesions, active lesions. And you can see that you have a co-localization of the expression of DL4 and GFAP as well uh, on these uh, human samples. So it seems like we have this upregulation up of DL4 in vivo as well. 
So then we wanted to know what the role of this DLL4 um, in pathology. So to respond to this question, we developed a model of uh, a mouse model. So we crossed glass cream mice with uh, DLL4 flux flux mice so that we can knock down the expression of DLL4 specifically in astrocytes. And we induced uh, EAE in these animals. So here in uh, black, you have the control group. And in red, you have the um, delta like for knockout uh, mice. And so you can observe that during the onset of the disease, so uh, between day 12 and day 23, uh, you have um, a, a delay in the appearance of the symptoms. So it seems like we have less uh, severity of the uh, disease during this phase. Um, but uh, when we're reaching the plateau, you can observe that there's no uh, real statistical differences between the two groups. So it seems like uh, knocking down DL4 in astrocytes has an effect on pathology during the onset of the disease. So this has led to um, a decreased permeability of the blood brain barrier, so we have less extravasation of plasmatic protein in the group lacking expression of the LL4 in astrocytes. We also have less infiltration of uh, TCD4 uh, cells, and of course we have less demyelination, uh, which makes sense because they are less paralyzed. So based on these results, we then when wanted to understand um, how knocking down the LL4 in astrocytes can impact the cells within the neurovascular unit. So to, do, to respond to this question, we harvested the spinal cord of um, our animals, so control animals, flux flux mice, and the DLL4 ACKO mice, and uh, we did uh, an RNA sequencing on these samples. And what we observed is that in the knockout group, so when we are lacking expression of DLL4 in the astrocytes, we are basically knocking down all the genes that are implicated in uh, astrocytic reactivity. So you have Imantin is downregulated, you have LCN2, uh, all these genes that are very important for uh, astrogliosis. This is something that we verified uh, by immunostaining. So we, we have a decreased expression of uh, GFAB here, but we also have a uh, decreased expression of Imantin and LCN2. So it seems like knocking down the L4 in astrocytes decreased the reactivity uh, of astrocytes itself. So then we wanted to understand uh, what is the molecular pathway uh, that uh, drive this uh, phenomenon. So to respond to this question, we return to the in vivo model. So we use primary human astrocytes. Uh, you have three different conditions, a negative control, case and astrocytes, then a positive control, so it's astrocytes that are um, uh, treated with IL-1 beta, sorry. And then you have the test condition in which we are knocking down the L4 uh, by using siRNA. So as you can see, we have a good um, efficacy of the siRNA in our cell culture. So you remember that NYCD, so the um, intracellular domain of the notch uh, receptor is a reflection of the activity of the notch pathway. So this is the first thing that we did. We uh, looked at its expression in cell culture. And uh, you can see that when we're treating cells with iron beta, so we are inducing reactivity, we have an upregulation of NYCD. But then if we are knocking down a DLL4, we are decreasing the, acti the, the activity of the pathway. So what we think is happening is that uh, neighbors astrocytes are gonna interact with each other. So one astrocyte is expressing DLL4, the other one is expressing notch one, and when they interact with each other, it's gonna activate the notch pathway. So to verify that, we first uh, look um, at the effect of the downregulation of DLL4 on astrocytic reactivity in, vi in vitro. So we looked at different uh, markers. So we looked at the cliff caspas 3 You can see that there's a downregulation of this uh, factor, but we also looked at um, the uh, phosphorylation of STAT3. And we have a knockdown, um, a decreased expression of the phosphostat STAT3 in our model. So it's quite interesting because the uh, JAK STAT pathway is very, very uh, important in astrocytic reactivity. It has been well published in the last uh, 10 years. And so we focused on this um, specific pathway, JAK STAT. 
So the question was, what is the link between Notch and Jackstat uh, in our model? So Jackstat pathway is basically uh, working this way. Cytokines are gonna interact with the Jack receptor. It's gonna phosphorylate Jack, and then this phosphorylation is gonna induce the phosphorylation of the stat factor. And what we know, because of the literature and data from the lab, is that IL-6 is one of the um, cytokines that interact with the Jack stat pathway. So we focused on this IL-6 cytokine. We looked at this, at its expression in our in vitro model, and we uh, showed that there's a down regulation of IL-6 when we're knocking down DLL4 in uh, astrocytes that are reactive. So to confirm that IL-6 is the link between the Notch pathway and the Jack stat pathway, we used the tocilizumab. So tocilizumab is an inhibitor of um, uh, the IL-6 receptor, and so basically it's uh, um, impossible for the IL-6 to uh, go on the receptor jack. And so by treating the cells with the tocilizumab, you can observe that we are decreasing the uh, phosphorylation of stat free. So it seems like when we're knocking down the LL4, we're decreasing the expression of IL-6 in astrocytes, and therefore we're decreasing the phosphorylation of stat free, uh, leading to less astrocytic reactivity. So all these experiments, they don't really um, respond to the question if there's a direct link between Notch and IL-6. So to respond to this question, we uh, realized uh, chromatin immunoprecipitation. So we used um, an antibody against NYCD and a primus against the human IL-6 gene. So we did the pull down with the NYCD antibody. And as you can see, when we're doing the pull down with N NYCD, we're pulling down uh, IL-6. So that means that NYCD is acting as a transcription factor to regulate the expression of IL-6 um, in the nucleus of astrocytes. So it's great. We have something going on with the reactivity, but how can that explain what we observed uh, in pathology? So the opening of the blood-brain barriers, the infiltration of T lymphocytes, and the demyelination that is decreased. So to respond to this question, uh, we basically relied on a paper that uh, uh, we published when I was, in a, postdoctoral, uh, was a postdoctoral fellow, uh, showing that um, astrocytes are capable of uh, producing pro factors, TIMP and VGFA, when they're reactive. And so we wondered if these uh, molecules uh, are um, downregulated when we are knocking down uh, DLL4 in astrocytes. And it is the case. So when we are knocking down DLL4 in astrocytes, so it's uh, an in vitro model, uh, you can see that there's a decreased expression of TIMP and VGFA. So there's less pro factors that are produced and so less effect on uh, the blood-brain barrier. This is something that we also observed in vivo. So this is in the model of uh, mice lacking expression of DLL4 in astrocytes. You can see that there's a decreased, well, it's not really clear, but um, decreased expression of VGFA uh, by reactive astrocytes, and it's also valid for uh, timidin phosphorylase. So to conclude on this project, um, this is what we think is happening. So during MS, uh, we're going to have astrocytic reactivity that is going to increase the expression of DLL4 by astrocytes. Uh, astrocytes that are neighbors, they're going to interact with each other. And it's going to um, activate the notch pathway. The notch pathway, NYCD, is going to upregulate the expression of IL-6, the secretion of IL-6 by astrocytes. And this secretion of IL-6 is going to um, increase the activity of the JAK-STAT pathway, leading to more astrogliosis um, in MS. And so this astrogliosis is going to uh, lead to the production of probability factors that are going to contribute to blood-brain barrier opening. And so this is this sort of very vicious circle that can be very harmful during the pathology um, because it's going to maintain a very high uh, astrogliosis within the CNS. And, uh, okay, that's not the picture. <laughs> there was a picture, but it's okay. So, yeah, I would like to thank my team, and uh, especially Pierre Mora and uh, Margot Lenné, two PhD students that are 
currently working uh, on this project. Thank you. So thanks a lot, Condice, for sharing this great data and for really pro providing a link between neuroinflammation and yeah. neurobiology in this session. So I'm glad about that. <laughs> and I'm sure there are questions from the audience. And I have to come here to see well where there are any arms up. So maybe if I may, I start with one question. So you presented quite a number of pathways that are regulated in your DLL4 deficient astrocytes and then mm -hmm. the, in the experimental models. And in the end, at least your in vivo, let's say phenotype comes back to endothelial cell, increased endothelial cell permeability and ad adhesiveness. Uh, do you think VGF is, let's say, the only soluble factors? Do you have more in mind? Do you think there could be alternative mechanisms? So what is your view on astrocyte endothelial cell interaction in you know, what you yeah. learned from your model? So we are currently, because we, when we're doing staining, we also see that DLL4 is highly expressed in endothelium, uh, at the endothelium, so at the blood-brain barrier. Mm -hmm. So we knock down DLL4 as well in um, uh, endothelial cells because we wanted to see if we have kind of the same um, physiopathology in the mice. And so we're currently doing that. It's not as clear. It seems like it's DLL4, the DLL4 notch pathway in adult mice. It's not as um, important as it is during development, mm -hmm. but we have uh, small effects. And it seems like when we're knocking down DLL4 at the, at the endothelium, we have the same, um, the same kind of um, course of the disease mm -hmm. in the knockout animals. Um, then concerning the secretion of uh, propagative factors, so we just studied these two um, molecules, but I'm sure because we are basically modulating astrogliosis, mm -hmm. we're modulating so many pathways that I'm pretty sure that a lot of uh, factors are uh, uh, <laughs> present difference between the two groups. So we just focused on that because we, I knew the I knew this, this specific factors, but I'm sure mm -hmm. I'm sure there's a lot more just to study. <laughs> Can you also now? Ah, I see a question back there. Do you have the microphone already or I just bring it up? I have it already, so I, I jump up. Yeah, very nice talk. I was uh, wondering if, uh, because um, Delta-4 is, uh, is a ligand, mm -hmm. uh, you just uh, focus on the activity between astrocytes and astrocytes, in the, the signal in between two, two populations of astrocytes. What about uh, uh, signal into neurons or signal into microglia? Or so, so this is the point. Uh, the notch pathway is everywhere. So there's definitely interactions um, with other cells. So the point is you need to have a direct contact between cells. So we tried to look at pericytes. Nothing is happening because they're not in direct contact with astrocytes. But for sure, there's definitely interactions with the lymphocytes. And lymphocytes are expressing uh, notch 1 and notch 4. So there's definitely a role, I think, of astrocytes to... Um, uh, I'm not very uh, familiar with immunology, so <laughs> I don't want to say something bad, but uh, I think that it can change the profile of the inflammatory infiltration within the perivascular space because they're going to interact here. And so the notch pathway can be activated uh, in, this, uh, in this area between the lymphocytes and the astrocytes. Concerning the neurons, I don't know. I, I didn't look. I didn't look at that. So did you look at the, um, the expression of HES5, uh, for instance, as a readout of notch in other cells? Not really, no. Thank you. So further questions? It's maybe not related much to the MS, but um, as you were using GLAST mm -hmm. to target the uh, DLL4, you've been also targeting the neurogenic niche. Would you have an idea whether this could affect the cell? So, yeah, this is a question that we region? have. And so we are currently uh, using another promoter. We have the LH1L1 as well, and we want to redo the experiment of the EAE model, just to see if we have exactly the same result, because we're, you're right, the GLAST is not a like, specific promoter for, uh, 
for astrocytes. So yeah, we are doing that just to be sure of what we're saying. Further questions from the audience? So if this is not the case, then thanks again for your presentation and discussion. <laughs> and if I see it right, we now come straight to the next session, which is on clinical research, and I'm very happy to hand over the microphone. <laughs> Thank you. So we are now moving to the last uh, scientific session about uh, clinical research with uh, very different topics. The first topic will be on genetic presented by Pierre-Antoine Gouraud from Nantes about the impact of genetic variation in MS and related diseases. Thank you very much. Um, I can move it over. So it's a great pleasure um, to talk to you a little bit about, about MS genetics and how this may uh, be very important and may be insightful for um, MS in general, and in particular, um, immunological research. Uh, so in case you haven't looked at the um, abstract, I think um, I'm going to use that as an introduction. It's very clear that over the past 15 years, uh, we've made really a giant leap forward. We've, we've discovered um, many, many polymorphism, many genomic variants that are associated with MS susceptibility, and that's telling a lot about our, our understanding of um, the genetic architecture of not only multiple sclerosis, but also many other uh, multifactorial uh, disease. However, and that's probably one of the um, uh, take home uh, that I'd like you, you to give to you uh, in this talk, in a way, we're still probably even within the um, MS genetic consortium. We even, we're too much thinking about genetics uh, the same way we think about medical genetics. Uh, it means as a Mendelian uh, medical genetics, and, and probably too much has been expected, in particular regarding uh, clinical utility. So what we're gonna do today um, is talk a little bit about MS genetics, uh, obviously the MHC region and the well-known um, HLA contribution to MS susceptibility, but I'll tell you also how uh, we discovered over um, more than 200 genomic regions uh, with frequent variants that are associated with MS. I'm not sure what I broke. Nothing. Okay. So uh, the first, I think, the first thing I'd like to, to say about MS genetics, and uh, most of the of the results, um, most of the production that, and, and the idea has actually uh, been achieved at the worldwide level by the International Multiple Sclerosis Genetic Consortium and uh, together with a, a great deal of people in Nantes University, uh, we actually are representing France within uh, this MS Genetic Consortium and a lot has, uh, has happened and you can have a look on uh, imsgc.net, that's a website for uh, the worldwide uh, consortium. To give you an overview uh, of what we know about MS susceptibility genetics, uh, it's actually very simple to describe as a two, uh, a two timeline. The first one is actually talking about the number of genomic region that we have discovered. It, it all started in 1972 with the first description of the association within the MHC uh, region. That's actually quite a lot of time. And starting in 2007 with the uh, beginning of the genome-wide association era, we've discovered one additional um, genomic region, and then more and more, up to 232, which is kind of the, um, the number of uh, variants that we are now using to describe um, association with MS genetics. But that's actually not that accurate. It's not just about the number of genomic regions. It's about also how complex are the descriptions within a single um, MHC, a single region, and the MHC is a very good example of that. We started uh, using serology techniques, and with the progress of molecular techniques and no sequencing, actually the way we describe uh, the genetic association between one region, the one we've known for over 40 years, um, and, and MS is actually uh, going also in an exponential way, but in an exponential way, not regarding the number, but regarding the complexity of the, of the description. And, and I'll, I'll show you an example uh, taken from our, one of our last papers. 
Uh, so basically what we do in, in the uh, International MS Genetic Consortium is um, organizing at the worldwide level how we uh, do association studies um, in, uh, at, at a very large scale. So that encompass the publication of our last paper in science in 2019 with this genomic map with 233 uh, variant. Um, and in these GWAS, we basically compare uh, over almost 50,000 MS uh, cases to 68,000 controls, trying to see if frequent variants are actually more frequent in MS, um, in MS patients compared to, uh, to controls. And in a way, statistical association, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's great. Uh, we know for sure there's more, but we, it doesn't tell so much about the, the, the pathology. Um, and we also look at how some biologically meaningful pathways can actually show that there are actually biological relevance in this association. And that's uh, also what we did uh, in 2018 together with that paper, using pathways uh, to revisit uh, how meaningful are these different associations. So, uh, in terms of um, how we do uh, this um, um, genome-wide association study, it's really about a large-scale comparison. And so, we do need uh, to recruit and take a DNA sample from many, many, uh, many, many uh, MS patients. But it's also very important to have good controls. Um, and the fact that we have gone over 200 uh, MS-associated region is actually 200 um, autosomal susceptibility variants, and we've released all the list of all these variants, and eventually the ones that are less um, significant uh, but associated to, with MS. There's one um, MS variant that is in the chromosome X, and up to 32 independent associations are used in the extended MHC to describe how the MHC region is actually associated in terms of susceptibility. And again, uh, in this paper, um, I put here the, uh, the link to uh, bioarchive, but there's the full list of these, uh, of these markers are actually present. Many of these, um, of, of these uh, polymorphism may be relevant in one of the genes that uh, uh, are studied in any of your um, experiments. But what I'd like to do is actually take a little step back and think about um, that we've known the HLA association since 1972. Most of the authors here are actually retired uh, or, um, or not uh, on, on Earth anymore. And we haven't really uh, understood really much better how HLA is actually really acting. And the way we describe now uh, the HLA association um, is actually very complex. That's taken from one of our Nature Genetics publication. And I thought that was very striking, that's very, really striking that uh, we use that very complex table to describe how the MHC region as a whole is associated with uh, MS. So there is the HLA-DRB1501, very well-known um, HLA uh, association allele. And we're using, we're using the association not only as an additive effect, meaning that you have twice the risk when you have two of these HLA alleles, but we are also able to uh, introduce a correction for homozygosity that is actually uh, also statistically relevant. Every single of these HLA alleles is also um, embedding other, um, other polymorphism. This is true for functionally relevant uh, HLA molecule in the class two region, but also in, in, uh, for SNPs marker, but down the list here, you have many other HLA alleles that are relevant to, uh, uh, to the HLA associations to, uh, to, with MS. So I think, in a way, we've maybe gone a little too far in, in terms of the way we describe uh, the complexity, and still we're using the Mendelian genetics trying to find uh, dominant or recessive effect and trying to correct, to re correct them, having a statistically meaningful uh, approach. So that's one direction. The other direction I'd like to uh, mention is also how we know that uh, since we're going to do this genetics uh, in a very large population level, it's probably very important to, at some point, to go back to the individual level, and we've done that in, in uh, many ways, using a polygenic resource. Basically, a polygenic resource is, an, is, a, is a score, is a number that summarizes at the individual level how much of these known MS uh, 
of, of, of how many of these known variants that are associated to, uh, with MS is actually found uh, in one individual. So in a way, on, on the one hand, we're doing uh, association studies in tens of thousands of patients, but we should not forget also to, uh, to go back to, to these patients and say, well, at the end of the day, we do definitely have patients that accumulate almost all the known variants that uh, we've discovered so far, and, on, and we also have patients that basically have very few and less than in general population of these genetic variants. Let me show you a, a couple of examples of the types of um, analysis uh, we can do. Um, so here, uh, one of the ideas was to look uh, at these uh, genetic risk scores within the families. So we compare the affected uh, uh, siblings that on average have the same scores, and all the unaffected siblings, obviously they have an elevated score because they are uh, uh, siblings from, from MS-associated patients, uh, but they, they have an intermediate score compared to, uh, to LC controls. Uh, here again, it's the same as in general population. It's absolutely useless. It has no clinical utility to predict who's going to have MS, even within uh, the, the restricted genetic environment of, uh, of a family. Uh, another uh, very interesting finding that uh, we had using these polygenic risk scores is actually when you go back at the individual level, you can also test uh, subgroups of uh, relevant or meaningful uh, MS. And the, the first uh, of these groups would be, uh, do we have the same genetic, uh, on average, do we have the same genetic load for people that are going to have a progressive form of MS and, and the one that are going to uh, have or a primary progressive form of MS compared to the relapsing remitting one? And I think it's very striking to see that we have no difference in terms of susceptibility between these two very different presentations of the disease. And that may apply to many other subgroups that uh, would, be, uh, would be relevant. Um, another very important uh, observation is uh, how much of the genetic uh, susceptibility in African American uh, can be actually looked at uh, for, for um, MS patient. And, and we, don't, we usually don't study that so much in, in, in France or in Europe for many cultural reasons. But the, the genetic ancestral background is very important. Uh, for uh, studying MS genetics. That's actually what we usually study first when we want to do uh, a comparison in terms of genetic background. Uh, on this uh, left side here, we basically uh, project a very interesting patient with NMO onto a reference map of genetic ancestry. Um, so the NMO patients are actually the one here in uh, kind of uh, deep, deep green. And so you can see how much of their genome is close to African, uh, European, and, and East Asian. So we definitely see differences uh, even uh, within the uh, European population. If you take an example in African American in, in the US, for example, on average, the genome is, is between 20, is, is 19, 21 percent white. Uh, and yet they're African American. So, th so the genome is really um, a mix between different ancestral contribution. We don't want to mistake that with uh, associations. So in here, uh, we actually apply these scores and uh, or genetics to the uh, an, uh, NMO, and we do here with much less uh, uh, striking uh, sample size than what we do in, in MS. Uh, we, uh, together with uh, great colleagues, we actually uh, start to find uh, associations uh, at the genome-wide level between NMO and, uh, uh, and these are uh, polymorphisms that are specific to, uh, to NMO in, in the light of, uh, of MS. Um, so I mostly talked about uh, frequent variants. I didn't want to talk uh, too much about rare variants because there's very little evidence. And, and in genetics, I think, we're, and particularly that's something we've tried not to do in uh, IMSGC, we've published, or, people, or groups have published false positives has to correct them. So there's still very little evidence for uh, a great contribution of a rare variant to uh, multiple sclerosis. Uh, there's probably a few evidence that we are confirming uh, currently. Um, so I think that's, that's probably uh, not um, probably the most interesting here. What's probably coming up, um, and um, I'd like to show you how together with uh, OFSEP we uh, do hope to contribute uh, to that, is really how we're going to think about genetic of not only susceptibility, what we've been doing for the past 30 years, 
but genetics of uh, MS progression. And uh, I think the offset, the uh, French cohort, is an absolutely fantastic resource uh, really to study how genetic factors uh, can uh, change the way um, MS can progress. Uh, I think what's very important here is, is to start not to think about um, severity or progression as the same thing as susceptibility. It's probably uh, once, you're, once you have MS, you probably have internally a very different environment, if we can speak so. So probably different um, genetic contribution will, will be seen, and that's what we start to, uh, to see as the first hit for association with uh, progression. Um, almost as a conclusion, I'll, I'd like to, uh, to uh, take you through a few of the MS genetics uh, projects that we have revived uh, at the national uh, level. Some of them are a pilot project, that's the case for um, introducing genetics into the uh, OFCEP and in particular the OFCEP uh, eye definition cohort for about 2,400, 2,700 uh, patients. So we'll be able to introduce genetic ancestry, HLA, um, all the 232 MS variants into uh, these samples, no matter the type of analysis that is possible. Uh, I've shown you a few of the preliminary results we have uh, in the collaboration with Nomadness, that's the um, genetic study of, uh, of NMO, and we're doing the same uh, also uh, with RIS and CIS and uh, so there's really a possibility um, to study genetic component of many of the subgroups of, um, of MS. Uh, so there's also many other collaboration uh, that uh, we, can, we can do based on what we already have uh, as, uh, as a biobank. Uh, we've been uh, working with the Italian to uh, still use the family data to define how much of the heritability uh, can we find in, in MS, that's basically mathematical modeling of, of the trios. Uh, we are starting uh, a great collaboration with Decode Genetics in Iceland, uh, where we are about to sequence 900 trios, so about uh, a little over 2,000 samples. We're gonna fully sequence uh, the trios of MS patients. Um, one of the things here is potentially uh, the ability to find rare variants that have been observed in the Icelandic population. I've talked a little bit about CIS. There's also great resources uh, from previous collaboration with Toulouse um, in um, about 2,000 uh, patients. Many of them have been treated with uh, natalizumab. Um, and there's also a lot of um, theoretical consideration and mathematical modeling that help us to understand how a multifactorial disease is not a multi-Mendelian uh, Mendelian disease. Uh, uh, we also trying to reopen um, a recruitment protocol to be able to uh, collect more of the um, SEP families, so that's the SEP family uh, project right there, together with great colleagues um, in Montpellier, in Bordeaux, and uh, Dr. Céline Noap uh, in Paris. We're trying to have an open protocol to restart the collection of many of these uh, uh, very interesting families that have been collecting in the past. Maybe some of them, maybe some of them in, in your centers uh, that we will be able to, re, uh, to recontact uh, to update their, their data. All of this is uh, possible be, uh, because we have two uh, interesting frameworks uh, uh, where we do um, um, MS genetics is the International uh, MS Genetic Consortium uh, that we meet every uh, uh, once uh, once every month, uh, something like uh, around 10 p.m. to accommodate everyone uh, times. And uh, there's also this Rev Gensep that we have uh, restarted uh, also uh, after uh, Bertrand Fontaine, and and all the uh, all the data has been secured as well as the samples and uh, all, all the administrative work. And we are also starting a new progression GWAS uh, together with a GSK company. Uh, where we're genotyping probably close to uh, 3,000 samples that we haven't uh, genotyped before from the Regev set and, and uh, um, upgraded with the information from, uh, from OFSEP. So uh, I'll be happy to take uh, any questions. And before that, I'd like to uh, thank, obviously, the people that have been um, uh, collecting DNA over, uh, over the past years, uh, many of the uh, historical contributors to uh, RefGen SEP, the uh, biobank that uh, we are working now uh, with in Nantes, and the two research teams um, with David Laplau and, and Gilles Blanchot uh, that we are working with in terms of uh, bioinformatics. And you can see here a snapshot of the samples. 
and all the consents that are now securely uh, stored in notes. And with that, I'll thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Appreciation, Roland. Very thoughtful uh, talk. Thank you very much for reviving the MS genetics in France. Uh, fantastic. Two quick questions. The first one, you said that susceptibility and progression might be completely different. Nevertheless, intuitively, we would think that people with a high genetic load would have earlier onset of disease, maybe uh, faster progression. So what are the data on that? And the second question, on the NMO spectrum disorder, GWAS, there was one uh, hit at a significant level, it was on chromosome six, I guess. Was it in the HLA? So I'll take the second one first. It's not on the HLA. Um, we haven't been able to reproduce pre um, previous finding in terms of association with, uh, with NMO. Um, there was a, a, a great poster from uh, Irene Charles and, and Nicolas Vance uh, uh, presented. Uh, I think that that's really one of the challenge and, and we've learned from the past. Um, Small candidate association studies, small GWAS, they're not, they're not powerful enough. Uh, there's a lot of flows. Uh, so we've been extremely uh, careful and, and together with uh, Romain Marigny as well. We've been very keen on confirming and extending the, uh, the sample to make sure that we have the best control and the best cases not to be mistaken. Um, there's probably a few hits that uh, we still have to, to confirm uh, and probably pay a specific attention to, uh, to the HLA region. Now let's go back to the first question that is actually the, the, the most difficult. That, that, that's clearly um, the idea we all had, uh, in particular when we started testing the, the first MSGBs, so basically the score that are telling you, you this individual has all of the, the 30 um, MS variant that we found so far, uh, and, and, and we've been really following the individual when all the knowledge in terms of genetics have been improved. So we've based, uh, we started with about 20 markers and then 30, 50, 110, and now we have 200. So what's very striking is actually the one that were the top genetic carrier of, of risk in the 30 SNP or 30 region based score are not the one that are the highest loaded uh, in, when you look at 100 and even 200. Um, that's interesting. That that's mean that we don't understand variability the way we should uh, understand it. So I think that's that's the first uh, the first idea. Um, one of the thing um, we, we've tested many times. Uh, we we've, we really saw that if you're a female, if you're HLA homozygous, well, you probably don't need as many of the other SNPs. You can that you can call that a balancing risk effect, something like that. Uh, well, we don't see that. It's, it's a great idea, but we don't see that in, in, in the data, and we've been testing that uh, again and again. Um, so uh, that said, um, there's a little bit of association uh, with uh, uh, age of onset. It's, not, it's, not, it's nothing that can be clinically useful. Um, a little bit of association with oligo, the presence of uh, oligoclonal bands. Um, and, and that's pretty much, that, that's it. Um, I think it's, it's it's a useful tool um, um, to try to, to see how much of the genetic can explain subgroup of substratum of, of, of MS. Uh, we probably better think about rare subgroup of MS rather than massive groups. One of the examples that we've tested unsuccessfully uh, was trying to compare, we have kind of had this feeling that some of the patients have large lesion in, on their brain MRI, other ones have small disseminated lesions there's no genetic contribution to that. But that's something we see, so we're tem tempted to uh, explain that. So how the genetic of susceptibility translate into the genetic of progression? It's very, it's very tempting for all the autoimmune disease. Say, man, if you have a lot of these genes, you should probably have a, a disease that's going quicker because it started maybe earlier. Um, I, I think it's, 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 really, it's really a wrong way to think about genetics. It, it's really about you have a potential um, and you have a potential to declare the disease and you're encountering EBV, you're smoking, different light exposure, you know, and 
then your potential from the genes will re reveal not. And I think it's exactly the same that happened once you have the disease. So you have a totally different uh, inflammation state. Uh, probably other genes or maybe other variants in the same genes that we know from uh, susceptibility will have a key role. There has been a lot uh, to think about that in, uh, in, in HLA. And another way to think about that, and that will be my uh, probably very too long answer to that question, is if you stop start looking just at MS, what I think is very striking is that, uh, and I'm mostly coming from the um, HLA uh, 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 expertise, so the, the, the most uh, important uh, HLA haplotype for MS uh, with the DRB1, uh, the B1501 uh, alleles is actually one that would be protective for rheumatoid arthritis. And the other way around, one of the most uh, associated HLA haplotype with rheumatoid arthritis is an HLA 2 b 44 dr 4 That's the one that is very protective in MS. It's so protective that we split that into two components in this uh, way too complicated model that, that, that we have here. So I think it's, it's, there's still a lot to think about. Um, and clearly, it's not a one gene or one variant uh, issue, it's probably, which probably question the way we do uh, experiments at the bench. Thank you for your quick answer. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we have time for a short question and a short answer. Well, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot for your great presentation and I, a very short question, I hope. Um, and uh, probably a super naive question, you know, not knowing well about the MHC organization uh, genetically at all. Um, um, is it known whether, it's, whether the MHC HLA association is more related to the highly pleomorphic regions that really are relevant for antigen presentation or to, let's say, associated genes like whatever, TNF, or mm -hmm. and is it known whether it's more class one or class two? So in MS, it's more of a class two, um, but there's no clear uh, explanation of the, the associations uh, between the different alleles or sets of uh, alleles. Um, and, and we don't know very well because the, the number of alleles, when, you, when you're talking about polymorphic in, in, in HLA, we're talking about thousands of alleles. Uh, so that's extremely complicated to find comparison. Many people have tried uh, to look at the uh, pe peptide uh, presenting the grooves and et cetera. It doesn't work in MS. Uh, and it has been different in, in rheumatoid arthritis, but also with competing stories. Thank you very much. We're now moving to the next uh, presentation by uh, Mariam. <laughs> by Mariam Trosravi from Paris about the impact of early life uh, microbiota on the susceptibility to MS in uh, the adult. Okay, how it works, yeah, okay. Yeah, but it's very bad. Oh, okay, <laughs> think. Okay, hello everyone. Um, my name is Mariam Fosravi. I'm working as a postdoc in uh, microenvironment and, and immunity team uh, with the supervision of uh, Gerard Ibert at Anesthetu Pasteur. Today I'm going to speak about the effect of early uh, life microbiota on susceptibility of multiple sclerosis. In fact, my presentation is categorized categorized in immunology uh, talk, it, and it's not really clinical research, uh, just uh, to know. And thank you uh, that not uh, take a picture from the slide because uh, uh, this research is not published yet. As I have to keep you awake for 20 minutes, I start my work with a question. One question, what is the fastest things in the world? Is the cheetah, airplane, the speed of light, the tap measure coming back? Not at all. This is the fastest things in the world. 
when the baby attack the food. <laughs> and opening this hand will challenge your power. Today, I'm going to speak about the weaning period, the time that the baby start to eating solid food and the, in, and the importance of this period on the susceptibility of multiple sclerosis in adulthood. In fact, after birth, our intestine will colonize by huge number of uh, microbiota that uh, they play crucial and important role in regulating and developing our immune system. In fact, it means that uh, this microbiota built our immune system. And during weaning, when the body, especially the intestine, will expose to huge number of new antigen and new microbe, uh, we will have a strong immune response that we call it immune reaction that in fact uh, uh, we, we call it winning reaction, sorry. That winning reaction is really essential for in ontogeny of uh, our immune system after birth. For winning reaction, we have a time uh, window period that uh, it's really important from, for example, for, uh, for mice, it's a start from day 14, between day 14 uh, until day 28. Uh, and for human start around uh, four, six months, and it takes time around um, uh, one year. And it couldn't happen before because it's uh, controlled by the milk factor, or also it couldn't happen after this period. Um, we, if uh, we stop weaning reaction, if you look at this uh, flash, we, here we have sucking milk, here we have weaning, and here uh, we have um, uh, adulthood. If we stop weaning reaction by the factor that these days are commonly used in industrial world, like antibiotic, like high fat diet, like, um, high, um, like uh, excessive hygiene, or no fiber diet, we will inhibit winning reaction that it lead to pathological imprinting that is translate to high susceptibility to um, in, um, pathology, uh, pathological inflammation and disorder in adulthood. While if we have a good winning reaction by eating a good food like high fiber diet, we will have a healthy imprinting that is translated to low susceptibility to pathological uh, inflammation in adulthood. So winning reaction, in fact, educate our immune system and lead pathological um, imprinting or uh, healthy imprinting later in life. As you can see here, um, we showed that if we um, um, treated the mice with antibiotic during winning reaction, during a winning reaction, these mice show um, pathological imprinting, and during colitis, they lose a lot of weight and they express more um, um, inflammatory cytokine in the in the, in the intestine like TNF-alpha and interferon gamma. And also, if we look at this data from germ-free mice, you can see that the germ-free mice, they show pathological imprinting during um, colitis and treatment with DSS. But if we colonize um, um, these germ-free mice during winning reaction with the good microbiota, these mice show healthy imprinted uh, phenotype. Also, we showed that uh, during winning reaction, uh, the regulatory T cell will be induced by bacteria, vitamin A, and short chain fatty acid. And in fact, these GRAs can carry the memory from winning uh, period to adulthood, in pathological imprinted one or healthy imprinted one. As you know that uh, regulatory T cells or T eggs are um, uh, suppressor immune cells that they can inhibit the response of uh, Th1, Th17 or um, inflammatory 
um, immune response. Also, they have, uh, they play more important role in uh, pathogenesis of uh, multiple sclerosis, and they can suppress or decrease the uh, level of inflammation, and, um, um, and also uh, many papers show that during uh, multiple sclerosis, or EAE, we have high level of TH17, Compared to the high level, of, compared to the level of uh, TRX, it means that um, we have more inflammation in the, uh, we have more systemic inflammation uh, and less suppressive uh, immune cells. If we look at the risk factor of uh, multiple sclerosis we can see that microbiota play an important role and they, they could um, um, regulate our immune response through um, T cells. So um, according to this information, that microbiota are important for winning reaction and winning reaction important for induction of TREG and pathological imprinting or healthy imprinting. And also, um, the importance of uh, um, um, multiple sclerosis, uh, that is inflammatory disorder, uh, that uh, can control by gut microbiota, and uh, the importance of regulatory T cells in this <coughs> disorder. Um, we are trying to find the effect of the quality of uh, winning reaction and its effect on susceptibility to uh, multiple sclerosis um, in adulthood. In fact, we uh, define um, six uh, objectives for this project. Uh, the first one, we want to know that if we inhibit uh, winning reaction by antibiotic and no fiber diet, uh, we could um, change the susceptibility of uh, EAE in adulthood or not. And second, we, will, uh, we want to check that this time point, the winning reaction, is important for susceptibility of multiple sclerosis or not. And third, uh, we, will, uh, we, uh, will in, um, we will investigate the role of uh, regulatory T cells in this phenotype. And also, we would like to know how TREG can carry this phenotype, this uh, uh, imprinting, from uh, winning to adulthood. And um, at the end, we would like to know the um, microbial and the dietary factor that can induce healthy imprinting, or uh, also we would like to know how we can revert pathological imprinting to healthy imprinting uh, <coughs> in adulthood. As we don't have access to the CNS and gut of the patient, we use the EAE model that uh, I'm sure all of uh, you know uh, um, this model very well. Um, for this, we um, treated mice with antibiotic and no fiber diet during winning reaction. It means between two weeks of uh, um, old um, until four weeks of, um, sorry, two weeks of age until four weeks of age. And then at the end of winning, we co-house the mice to have, um, um, uh, to have the same microbiota in all the group. And then at the eighth week of age, we uh, induce EAE in the mice and we try to um, uh, scoring EAE daily. As you can see here, the mice that are uh, treated with antibiotic and no fiber diet during winning, uh, they show higher symptom. They show higher symptom of EAE, while the one, um, the healthy imprinting mice that they uh, um, treated with the normal food or sometimes high fiber diet food and normal water, they showed uh, less um, symptom of EAE. And at the end, when uh, the, um, they are recovered the pathologically imprinted group is still a bit um, paralyzed. And also, if we look at the graph of weight, the uh, healthy imprinted mice uh, lose the weight during the peak of EAE, and then they could gain uh, the original weight, while the 
Um, pathological imprinted mice that were treated with antibiotic and no fiber diet, they lose a lot of weight and they cannot gain uh, their original weight. Um, this is for the female mice. We repeated the experiment in the male mice, but as you can see here, we couldn't see any difference uh, between two groups in the male. So uh, it seems that uh, disruption of microbiota during winning reaction um, can affect susceptibility of EAE uh, in the female and uh, not in the male. To verify the time window uh, that um, I said it's really important and it's controlled by milk factors, um, we, uh, we treated the mice, the normal mice, with antibiotic and no fiber diet after winning reaction. It means the four to six weeks of age. And as you can see here, um, um, they show a higher symptom of um, um, EAE, but at the end that they are able to be recovered, partially recovered but they lose the weight um, like the pathological imprinted one. So uh, it seems that microbiota after weaning does not alter pathological imprinting to, to EAE. Also, we treated the mice uh, at six to eight weeks of age, and um, right after we uh, induced EAE in these mice, but as you can see here, they show the really low, low level of um, EAE sim symptom that it could um, uh, confirm the other study that they show that the administration of antibody to, uh, antibiotic to the mice before the induction of EAE uh, protect mice from uh, developing uh, severe EAE. For next step to understand the um, systemic inflammation, uh, we took a blood at uh, day 11 when uh, we couldn't see any difference between two groups. And also at the end of the experiment that we, uh, <clears throat> when we could see a difference and the symptom um, um, and the mice are recovered partially. And we uh, check around the 25 cytokine by bioplex. But as you can see here, the, um, at day 11, in the female mice, the um, pathological imprinted mice with antibiotic and no fiber diet, they express less anti-inflammatory cytokine like IL-10, TNFR2, while they express more, um, more inflammatory cytokine like <coughs> IL-17 and TNF-alpha. We couldn't see any difference between two groups at day uh, 50 at the late time point. We repeat the, the same for the male, but we couldn't see any difference um, between the male. In the next step to check the toxicity, the cytotoxicity uh, of uh, T cells, we culture uh, mug specific T cells from um, nine different organ, and uh, we re and we re stimulated them with uh, mug uh, in vitro. And after two and three days, um, we collect the supernatant and check uh, the four important cytokine for MS: IL-17, TNF, interferon gamma, and GMCSF. And as it was surprised, <coughs> we Surprisingly, we understood that the um, um, T cells from pathological imprinted mice, they show a higher level of uh, IL-17, uh, TNF-alpha, interferon gamma, and GMCSF compared to the normal, as, uh, as well as uh, CNS in the CNS. But in other organ, we couldn't see any difference between the group. I put the colon here just for, for the example. Then uh, we check uh, in all of the organ um, the phenotype of regulatory T cells and conventional T cells. And we found that um, in terms of the percentage, we couldn't see any difference between two groups. But the T-Rex from, um, um, from healthy 
imprinted group, they show um, higher level of uh, suppressive marker like PD-1, BLIM, TNFR2, NRP1, and they proliferate more by the <coughs> um, expression of KI-17. And uh, interestingly, uh, the conventional T cells from uh, healthy imprinted mice was less um, uh, effective because they express anti-inflammatory factor like PD-1, BLIMP, uh, and they express more. So we can conclude that the T-Rex from um, the small intestine of um, uh, pathological imprinted mice that were treated with antibiotic and no fiber diet are less uh, suppressive while the um, conventional T cells are uh, more um, effective. Then we check the suppressive uh, phenotype of uh, TREG by suppressive assay. We culture them uh, in vitro TREGs uh, and um, conventional T cells. And as you can see here, the um, TREGs from uh, pathologically imprinted mice, they are not able to um, control the proliferation of conventional T cells. To be sure that this phenotype that we observe is due to, uh, uh, is due to um, TREGs, uh, we uh, depleted TREG during a winning reaction. It means from um, day 14 to 28. We treated them with anti-CD25 uh, uh, and also TNFR2. And uh, at the eighth week of age, we did, uh, we induced EAE. As you can see here, these two groups, the one uh, are the one that we deplete uh, TRX uh, uh, during winning, they show really high level of um, EAE, and also they show high level of mortality while the mice that were treated um, with high fiber diet and they are healthy imprinted mice, they show low level of um, uh, EAE symptom compared to the pathological one and also um, TREG depleted one. We're really interested to know uh, uh, whether these mice are different before any challenge uh, in adulthood or not. We uh, check and we, uh, we observe that um, the, the level of TREG in uh, healthy imprinted mice are more, than, um, are more than pathological one, and they express more PD-1, Roregamati, and NRP, which means they are more suppressive. And also when we do suppressive assay for them, um, we understand, we, we, we found that this um, pathological, this healthy imprinted TREG can control the proliferation of um, uh, <coughs> conventional T cells. Until now, um, we finished these uh, three objectives. Uh, I had many results besides, but I couldn't show here, it was too much. Um, in the next step, we are really um, would like to know how TRX can carry um, from winning reaction to adulthood. We did some RNA sequencing. Uh, we are trying to analyze the data. Um, and uh, also, we are trying to do epigenetic modification and also ATAC stack. Um, Thank you very much uh, from Arsep and um, Pastor. Thank you for uh, your attention. Thank you very much. Do you have questions yet? Maybe you can allude a little bit. Why is the difference between male and female? Is pathological imprinting less important for male and for female? I cannot hear. Could you please speak louder? So the pathological imprinting of T-Rex in the early life mm -hmm. is only uh, occurring for female, not yes. for male. So what is your explanation for that? Uh, I don't know really. We try to check the hormones because uh, our team are working in win winning reaction and in all of aspects. In fact, uh, the female uh, works better than the male and we couldn't see... Uh, um, the different
difference between the, uh, the main. We did, um, we checked for the hormone, that said maybe it's because of the hormone that they are different. But um, I really, I don't uh, have any answer for this question. We don't know why. For the attrition? Yes, yeah. Uh, hello. hello. Uh, for the for the mice that um, didn't win normally, have you tried to uh, give them high fiber diet to see if giving high fiber diet would uh, make them better when they have MS? Um, in fact, it's not possible when we are when we say that uh, some mice are uh, pathological imprinting. We have to treat them with antibiotic. Okay and no fiber diet okay oh. if we don't if we give them high fiber diet uh, it's not possible with antibiotic but um, we did an experiment and um, during um, winning uh, reaction we inject uh, short chain fatty acid to this group uh, that it uh, can revert the um, uh, imprinting. It means that it can revert pathological imprinting to healthy imprinting partially. Okay. And do you know if in literature it has been, there are people that um, have seen a link between um, children that didn't uh, really take uh, breast milk, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, milk, a bottle milk mm -hmm. and MS. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you know if uh, in literature there's a, there's a study on uh, breast milk or bottle mil milk and MS? Um, not really, but um, uh, I think um, the factor that is in the real milk, the mother's milk, that uh, can um, build a bit of microbiota, short chain fatty acid, or transfer something from mom to the uh, babies. Okay. So it's the thing it that I know. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. We will move to the <laughs> last presentation by uh, Emmanuel Leray from uh, Rennes about uh, the consequences of social inequalities and the disability progression in MS. I think I need some help. <laughs> Thanks, Emmanuel. You're welcome. <laughs> So good afternoon, um, so I'm very pleased to be here and uh, I will uh, give a talk on a topic that is uh, totally different from the previous one. Uh, so um, I would like to uh, thank the RCEP Scientific Committee uh, for the invitation to talk about this topic which is not so common uh, for the time being. So the question is, do social inequalities exist in disability progression among patients with MS? Uh, so let's start with a few words of background. So health inequalities are defined as systematic differences in health between different socioeconomic groups within a society. The term inequality implies that there is a difference which is unfair, harmful, and avoidable. In the literature, many studies have shown that people with lower incomes and less education tend to have worse outcome with a number of conditions, such as cancer, cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, and so on, as well as higher all-cause mortality. So what about MS? Is there any impact of socioeconomic status on disability progression? So before looking at the literature specific to MS, I would like to spend some time on how we can measure socioeconomic status. So socioeconomic position is a broad term that refers to the social and economic factors 
that will influence what positions individual or groups of people hold in the structure of the society. So it can be measured through a, diff a number of different indicators, such as education, housing tenure and conditions, income, occupation-based measures, or neighborhood deprivation. So I will give more details on all of these indicators because I assume that what it measures will influence how we can interpret the results of the studies. So these markers are generally correlated, but it's, it's important to remember that they will also measure different things and they will uh, capture different uh, characteristics. So regarding education, it captures the formal education an individual receives. So it means that probably when we use level of education in epidemiological studies, we will measure the impact of skills to access and critically evaluate information. And here, information regarding health or care. If we want to use indicators related to house, and especially whether individuals own their own house or rent it, as well as size and condition of the house, it will provide an indicator of wealth. So the individual savings of uh, people. And it's important to remember that wealth is different to income. Income is the amount of money an individual receives on a regular basis, and especially coming from uh, the occupation. So income will give the regular um, the measure of material resources an individual can use in the everyday life. So if we want to uh, look at uh, indicator coming from occupation, it will give a measure, an overview of the person's place in the society, and especially regarding the social standing, income and intellect. And for sure there are links between education, occupation-based measure, and income. And finally, the last uh, um, group or category of indicators is really are related to the neighborhood deprivation. What does it mean? It means that we will not use individual indicators, but we will use census in the general population, and we'll, we will build some uh, index, composite index, using different characteristics from the, from the census. And we will measure this indicator in very small place, in very small area, and most of the time we will use the area of residence of the patient. So it's important to remember that with this kind of indicator, we don't access individual deprivation of people, but the deprivation of the place where they are living. So now, if we look at some results regarding socioeconomic position and disability progression. The first uh, study I used, you will see that the literature is very limited. This study was uh, performed in France from the team uh, of uh, Gilles Defer and Florian uh, Calosser, it was her PhD. And what they, what they have done is that they use offset data uh, of Western France, and they use as an indicator of SCP the EDI, which is the European Deprivation Index. So it's exactly the, the last case that I explained. So in this index, we will measure on a specific area the percentage of people uh, renting a house or owning a house, having a car, the number of people in the household, uh, it's, if it's overcrowded, things like that. So when they look at the EDI of the place of residence of patients with MS, they found a social gradient because you can see that if, when they measured the time to reach EDSS4 and EDSS6, there was a gradient between the five groups. And in green, it's uh, the first quintile of EDI and it corresponds to patients living in most favored area. So you can see on, this, um, on these curves, that people living in most favored area took longer to attain EDSS4 or EDSS6. 
And the difference is quite important between um, the most favored and the most deprived because you can see that it represents several years in the time to reach EDSS4 or EDSS6. There was another study conducted at the same time um, in Vancouver, in Canada, from the team of uh, Ellen Tremlett. And they also use uh, ecological or contextual indicator, but not a composite one, only income. So it means that they, will, uh, they, they measure the time to reach EDSS 4 and 6 according to the average income of the place of residence of the patient. So here again, it's not individual um, socioeconomic position. And what they, what they found is that when income increases, the risk of disability progression decreases with hazard ratio less than one. And when they looked at the different uh, categories defined by quintile, they found sim uh, similar results. Another study which is not yet published, but that was uh, presented earlier in the day by Mathilde Lefort, uh, is a study set this time using level of education. So this is one of the single study using individual information regarding socioeconomic position. And as she mentioned uh, this morning, uh, they also found that higher was the level of education, lower was the risk of disability progression. And this was also observed for outcome 4 and EDSS 4 and EDSS 6, and both in men and women. And here again, you can see that the gap, the difference between groups is important because the risk was reduced by 20 to 50 percent depending on the category of level of education. So for all of these studies regarding disability progression, they, several um, differences were found, and each time it corresponds to several years or reduction of several percent uh, in the risk. Uh, and I would like now to uh, mention two, uh, two studies regarding not exactly disability progression, but mortality in MS. And these two studies were presented today uh, with a poster, the first one from Florian Calosa and the second one from uh, Sarah Wilson, and uh, two of them work with uh, Gilles Defer in, uh, in Caen. Uh, so the, the first study uh, was uh, performed during the postdoctoral fellowship uh, from Florian in Canada, so using uh, data from uh, British Columbia multiple sclerosis. Uh, database. So they also used, as in their first uh, study, the average household income of the area of residence. And what they found, as you can see on the curve, is that um, when the income of the area of residence increase, so in red, the time, the survival time of people, of patients will increase compared to the red curve. And for the last uh, study on, uh, for, I mean, for the second poster, um, they also focus on survival, but what is called net survival. So it means that the comparison is done between patients with MS and the general population. And what we want to measure is the difference between people having MS and the general population in, uh, in France. And here again, you can see that the curves were very different depending on the socioeconomic position. We, and here again, people who live in most favored place have longer survival than people living in most deprived area. So the answer to the first question is yes, it seems that there are social inequalities in disability progression in patients with MS and especially lower socioeconomic position is associated with faster disability progression. One thing to remember is that in this kind of study, it's important to, um, to remember that there may be a, a mistake between cause and consequences. What I mean is that there is a risk of reverse causation because we know that patients with the worst multiple sclerosis are also likely to have the lowest socioeconomic position but this due to MS, especially if they have to leave their work, their, increase, their income will decrease, and so they will have socioeconomic position which is lower. But this is consequences of MS, while here what we want to measure is the link between socioeconomic position 
and MS. So for this kind of um, uh, objective or question, you have to use the socioeconomic position measure at the time of diagnosis or even before to be sure that it will not be influenced by MS. So how can we explain that there are so big differences according to socioeconomic position in disability progression? Probably we can uh, uh, highlight some uh, hypotheses. We can um, propose different uh, mechanism. Um, I suppose that there may be barriers to enter the healthcare system for patients with lower socioeconomic position. It means that they will uh, have delayed diagnosis, they will have less exam, less monitoring, and this can concern MS, but also their health outside of MS. So you may know that the burden of comorbidities in MS is more and more questioned, and maybe one of the reasons for social inequalities in MS uh, raise about comorbidities. And we can also think that uh, this barrier to enter the healthcare system can apply on curative, but also on preventive care. And for instance, we don't know exactly um, the access to cancer screening or cardiovascular monitoring, things like this. So here again, it's, it may be a, a, an explanation for social inequalities. Another uh, hypothesis uh, concerns detrimental behavior. It has been shown in the literature in the world uh, that, except, I mean, outside of MS, that diet, exercise, smoking, all these kind of lifestyle, lifestyle factors are detrimental in patients, in people having lower socioeconomic position. So here again, it can impact the overall health of people and also uh, MS uh, health and MS progression. Um, and then we can also uh, put forward some other hypotheses, for instance, related to continuity of care or compliance and the concept of health literacy. Um, here again, outside of MS, it has been uh, shown in the literature that people with low uh, education tend to be uh, less compliant, tend to have less visit uh, to uh, general practitioners. Um, and the concept of health literacy means that um, it's, it measures the, the level of knowledge uh, regarding health and care. And it is, um, it's not uh, black or white, but what has been shown in the literature is that uh, with the level of education which increase, there is also an increase of the ability to understand and to use healthcare information, as well as communication, as to communicate with healthcare providers. And finally, we can also assume that um, there is a link, uh, there is a, some mechanism linked to social environment or social support. I didn't uh, speak about race and ethnicity, and you may know that there are many studies that have, be, that have shown that uh, depending on the race of a patient with MS, the disability progression may be different, and especially um, African uh, patients have faster rates of uh, disability. Um, we can also assume, even if it's really uh, difficult to measure, that family and social network, matrimonial status, friends, all the things that we, um, uh, that we have in our everyday life, in our living environment, can also influence our health and also our um, way to enter the healthcare system and our representation on health. So for the time being, we don't know which, which hypothesis is, um, is checked in, uh, in MS. And probably it's uh, part of this uh, hypothesis, and we can also assume that this, there, are, there are interaction between all of this mechanism. And it's also important to remember that, especially in a disease like MS, which is uh, chronic and we, which uh, lasts several decades, 
um, all the social, social inequalities have to be uh, measured in a life course approach. What does it mean? It means that uh, maybe early life uh, events can influence education and occupation. And here for MS, the age at, mean age at onset is around 30 years. So we can assume that level of education is most of the time, uh, I mean, education is finished for, for the patient. Uh, but we can also assume that maybe education received from the, from the parents of the patients or from the past generation can also influence uh, especially representation on health and the healthcare system. So what, do, what to do with this knowledge? I think it's really important for neurologists and MS care teams to, um, uh, to get awareness about the risk of social inequalities in, uh, in MS. And especially, I would suggest to systematically collect socioeconomic position of individuals with MS as a prognostic factor for MS, even if we don't know exactly the mechanism. And it also means that it should probably be needed to direct resources towards people at greater risk of disability. So it means work on modifi modifiable risk factors, diagnose and treat comorbidities, monitor disease activity and use the most appropriate DMT, and also maybe reinforce or target patient education or other strategy to support uh, especially some uh, groups of, uh, of patients. So to conclude, I would like to focus on the concept of equity rather than equality. What does it mean? Uh, in fact, equity acknowledges the fact that different individuals need different support to, raise, uh, to reach the same uh, results. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Emmanuel, for this uh, very interesting presentation. I, I have a question. Uh, in the literature about cognition in MS, it is well known that uh, the level of education impacts the rate of cognitive impairment, mm. and the reason for that is what we call the brain reserve. Do you think that uh, it could be an explanation of the impact of um, the social uh, situation, the low education and low reserve could explain that these people had uh, a nervous system more uh, susceptible to disability and uh, the disease process? Yes, maybe. In fact, it's really complicated to understand what is the cause and what is the, cons the consequences. And um, for sure, there is something related to brain reserve. Uh, but what we can observe here is that uh, there are differences in uh, time to reach motor disability as it is measured by EDSS. So it means that, I mean, it seems that there are some differences according to level of education, not only on cognitive function, but also on overall disability and especially motor disability. But it, it's not so easy to understand if it's level of education which provide lower brain reserve, and then it will impact the disability of MS, or if it's the disability of MS that will uh, lead to cognitive dysfunction. Or, or education is a proxy of brain reserve, and it has also been shown that uh, brain reserve had consequences on EDSS, on dis motor disability, and, that, and also that there is spinal cord reserve, so it is central nervous mm. system reserve. Is there any is there other question? No question? You have convinced everyone. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, we have to conclude this uh, very nice uh, meeting, and uh, it is uh, time to give uh, prizes. So we have two prizes, the first one for oral uh, communication and uh, prices, uh, prize for um, poster. Pierre-Olivier? Okay. 
so uh, regarding short oral presentations that we had this morning, uh, the jury was composed of the members of the, um, of the scientific committee of ARCEP who attended the meeting. And uh, we, we were glad to have very, very nice presentations. Um, as usual, the choice was difficult. But uh, the, the winner is Sita Shah from Nantes. presented uh, her results regarding the use of uh, single cell RNA sequencing as a, as a mean to predict or to try to predict the, the progression of the disease. So, I have nothing to <laughs> offer you. <laughs> Maybe you have a few words to say. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for uh, letting me speak here. It was an honor and uh, very interesting talks. And thank you to my team who supported me through uh, all this. And uh, yeah. Just remind that you are that you are working in Nantes. Yes. 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 Okay. Uh, I'm very glad to to have a good. Uh, Good thing to say for the special uh, prize uh, uh, for the poster because we have two prizes this year. The first one, uh, the winner, the first winner is Erwan Baudron from Caen. And the second one is uh, Mary Mangi from Rennes. We have the priority. C'est bien, ça c'est une bonne chose. Thank you very much, uh, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, it is a, a, a real great pleasure to win this, uh, this prize. It, uh, it was a lot of work for three years now. Um, I just will uh, defend my thesis in a few months. So it is very, very uh, a, a, good, uh, a good sign for me. Thank you. And, and again, we must uh, thank all the, the reviewers, the referees, who evaluated the, the, the posters. And I must say, it was a very tough job. So, because there were so many very excellent posters. So thank you and uh, congratulations to everybody, of course, in particular to all you three. And uh, again, thank you to the organizers, to Emmanuel, uh, Virginie, Okay, we hope to see you next year, of course. Okay, have a good spread. Thank you.